Section 21 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 21. Josephine, Part 4. During all these excursions, Josephine manifested the utmost kindness and benevolence to every one who applied to her with a tale of distress. Her sensitive nature never permitted her to turn a deaf ear to misfortune or suffering, nor refuse her generous sympathy to the poor. While partaking of a casual repast, by the way, she was sure to offer a portion of it to the passer-by, however beggarly, often adding bounteous alms. Blessings were invoked upon her head wherever she went, and with just reason, for Josephine was a friend to the friendless, a mother to the orphans, and a benefactress to the unfortunate. For some time after the coronation the emperor and empress remained at St. Cloud. While there, Josephine usually rose at nine o'clock, spent an hour in making a toilette, enjoyed a walk or some other recreation, and breakfasted at eleven o'clock, when she was occasionally joined by the emperor, though he never remained above ten minutes at table, considering it lost time. She afterwards received petitioners, to all of whom she gave ready assistance. Retiring to her own apartments, the remainder of the morning was spent with the ladies of her suite, all of whom were engaged in embroidering, while one of their number read aloud from some entertaining and instructive author. Works of fiction were never permitted to be circulated in the palace, as Napoleon was strictly and severely opposed to that class of literature. He sometimes suddenly appeared in their midst, talking gaily and freely with the ladies of honor, and occasionally joining in a game of cards, but his stay was always short. He was often present when the evening toilet of the empress was in preparation, overturning her boxes in his impatience, tossing about the most costly jewels as if of no value, and frightening her attendants by his irritable criticisms. He did not scruple to destroy an elegant dress if it happened not to strike his fancy, obliging her to assume another, a needless interference inasmuch as she was always apparelled with exquisite taste. He dined with her at six o'clock, in company with their invited guests, who learned to appease their appetite before being seated at the lavishly supplied table, from which they were obliged to rise before the tempting viands had been scarcely tasted. The emperor remained but a few moments, and the empress and guests necessarily followed him. Thus the utmost amiability was essential to Josephine, to endure these petty tyrannies with an unruffled mien. An important and happy event called her to Munich at the close of the year. The marriage of Eugene with the princess of Bavaria, was magnificently celebrated there. It gave both the emperor and empress the utmost satisfaction, not only for politic reasons, but because their mutual attachment gave promise of domestic peace. All that Josephine had desired was now accomplished. Her fears and anxiety as to the emperor's idea of divorce were forgotten after the birth of a son to Hortense, now Queen of Holland. As the young Napoleon advanced to years of interesting childhood, he so won upon his uncle's affections that Bonaparte determined to make him heir to his immense dominions. Josephine's future peace depended upon his life. As though to mock the hope centered in the young prince, death marked him an early victim. He died in 1807, while Napoleon was engaged in the brilliant campaign of Austerlitz. Upon hearing the tidings, he repeatedly exclaimed, "'To whom shall I leave all this?' The event afflicted Josephine with a double grief. She not only mourned the loss of a favorite, but trembled under the stroke that threatened her own happiness. She knew perfectly well that the powerful conqueror would not hesitate to sacrifice her if she impeded his limitless designs, though he loved her with all the devotion of which his selfish nature was capable. Nearly a year passed before Napoleon made known to her his unalterable decision, but that year was full of inexpressible torture to Josephine. A private passage determined by a small door connected their apartments. At this the emperor was accustomed to knock when he desired an interview. These occasions, when the subject of divorce was discussed, became so painful to Josephine that the usual summons caused violent palpitation of the heart, trembling, and faintness. She could scarcely support herself, while hesitating at the door to gather strength and courage for interviews that inflicted almost unendurable anguish. The final decision was made known to her May 30th by Napoleon himself, after ordering the attendants to withdraw. Of this, she says, I watched in the changing expression of his countenance that struggle which was in his soul. 
At length his features settled into a stern resolve. I saw that my hour was come. His whole frame trembled. He approached, and I felt a shuddering horror come over me. He took my hand, placed it upon his heart, gazed upon me for a moment, then pronounced these fearful words. Josephine, my excellent Josephine, thou knowest if I have loved thee. To thee, to thee alone, do I owe the only moments of happiness which I have enjoyed in this world. Josephine, my destiny overmasters my will. My dearest affections must be silent before the interests of France. Say no more, I had still the strength to reply. I was prepared for this, but the blow is not the less mortal. More I could not utter. I became unconscious of everything, and on returning to my senses found I had been carried to my chamber. From this time to the 16th of December she was obliged to appear at the fetes and public rejoicings, incident to the anniversary of the coronation, with a smiling countenance and cheerful demeanour, while beneath it all her heart was breaking. Her decision was not formally announced to the public till the 16th of December, when the Council of State was summoned to appear at the Tuileries. Napoleon's family, who secretly exulted at the event, were also gathered at the Grand Saloon. A chair, in front of which stood a table with writing apparatus of gold, was placed in the centre of the apartment. At a little distance stood Eugene with compressed lips and his arms folded over a heart swelling with resentment. Josephine entered with her usual grace pale but calm, leaning on the arm of Hortense, who conducted her to the central chair and stationed herself behind it, weeping bitterly. The Empress sat composedly, with her head leaning on her hand, the tears coursing silently down her deathly pale cheek, listening to the reading of the act that was to separate her forever from the man for whom she would have laid down her life. Napoleon, in vain, endeavoured to suppress the emotion that betrayed itself in the violent workings of his countenance. It was the wrenching of a strong affection from a soul that was else all chaos and darkness. It was the obliteration of a guiding star that had led him to the topmost pinnacle of greatness, and without whose steady radiance he must blindly overstep his narrow foothold and plunge from the dizzy height. A solemn stillness rested upon the assemblage when the reading of the act ceased. Even the Bonaparte family were touched with Josephine's uncomplaining sorrow. She pressed her handkerchief to her eyes for an instant, then rising, took the oath of acceptance in a tremulous voice, resumed her seat, and taking the pen, signed the document. The dreaded ceremony finished, she immediately retired, accompanied by Hortense and Eugene, who fell senseless as he reached the antechamber. The silent witnessing of his mother's suffering was too much for him to endure. For her sake, and in compliance with her entreaties, he had restrained his burning resentment. Josephine burst into an uncontrollable paroxysm of tears when she reached her private apartments, sobbing and groaning with an anguish heart-rending to behold. Carriages were in waiting to convey her to Malmaison. While preparations were making for her departure, Napoleon came to bid her a final farewell. As he approached, she threw herself in his arms, and clinging to him with a tenderness that conveyed more than words, the intensity and faithfulness of a love which nothing could tear from her heart. Overcome by her emotions, she fainted and was placed upon a couch, over which Napoleon hung with unconcealed anxiety and pain, tenderly stroking her cold face, and himself applying restoratives. Returning consciousness brought her more frantic grief when she perceived the Emperor was no longer near her for he had hastily left the apartment, fearing another scene. She seized the hand of an officer who still remained, and in accents of wild sorrow entreated him to tell the emperor not to forget her. No one could restrain tears of sympathy for the beloved empress, so unjustly thrust from the affections of an adored husband. She was accompanied to Malmaison by persons of distinction, who continued to pay court to her, knowing they thus best secured the royal favour, though many followed her from pure love and sympathy. She still retained the title of empress, and received an ample revenue to support the expenses and incident to her rank. Malmaison was elegantly furnished and embellished with many costly articles sent her by Napoleon's orders. She here held her court, which was frequented by the savants of Paris as well as the gay and beautiful. Thus Malmaison once more became the scene of fêtes, balls, and splendid entertainments. These gaieties could not divert Josephine from her one greatest sorrow. 
every object in that lovely retreat, where their earliest days of happiness had been spent, reminded her of what she had in vain tried to forget. Her tears flowed afresh at the sight of the haunts they had frequented together. The flowers that had given her so much delight now only recalled painful associations. The rooms which had been exclusively Napoleon's she would permit no one but herself to enter, retaining every article precisely as he had left it. The maps he had studied, the books with leaves turned down, his apparel just where he had flung it in some impatient mood. Everything remained undisturbed and sacred to her own eyes, already inflamed and almost sightless with continual weeping. What agonizing remembrances of happiness she must have endured in this silent, deserted apartment! What abandonment to grief where every object recalled the loved face and voice of one lost to her forever, and where no curious eyes checked her tears! It was well for her health and repose that she finally determined to forsake Malmaison and retire to the Chateau of Navarre, a palace that had lain nearly in ruins since the devastation of the Revolution, but which was charmingly situated in the midst of the forest of Evreux. It had originally been celebrated for its spacious park, elegant gardens, lakes, fountains, and all that could render it an envied possession. The occupation of restoring its original beauty of giving employment to the poor peasantry in the neighborhood, as well as escaping the heartless attentions of courtiers and the wearisome gaieties of court, was a beneficial, wise change. Josephine was accompanied thither by her most intimate, valuable friends, and a few young ladies whose guardian she became. She was never forsaken, however, by the world, who testified the sincerity of its admiration by visits to this out-of-the-way home of the loved empress, her mornings were passed in company with the ladies of her suite, engaged in some useful work, and listening at the same time to one who read aloud. The afternoons were occupied in rides, walks, or visits to the poor, who were constant objects of charity. The evenings were passed in the saloons in lively conversation, occasional games at cards, or listening to the music of the harp and piano in adjoining apartments, where the young people engaged in dances or noisy games which, however they much disturbed the quiet of the saloons, Josephine would never allow to be checked, for she loved to see all around her cheerful and happy, even while her own heart was too sad for her face to brighten with a single smile. The news of the Emperor's marriage with the beautiful Maria Louise of Austria was a new pang to her already lacerated feelings. She could not conceal her grief on her first meeting with Napoleon after the event that deprived her of every claim upon his thoughts and affections. He often visited her, and evinced the lingering love and veneration he had entertained for her admirable character, by the entire confidence with which he unfolded all his plans to her. A correspondence sustained between them was her greatest pleasure. The birth of a son at St. Cloud was announced to Josephine, while attending a dinner given by the prefect at the city of Evreux. With no feeling of jealousy or envy, this noble woman added her congratulations and sincerely rejoiced with all of France at the accession of an heir to the throne. The only regret she expressed was that she had not first received the intelligence from Napoleon himself. When at length a letter arrived, communicating the tidings, she retired to read it and remained in seclusion an hour. When she returned to her guest, her face bore evident traces of tears. She longed to behold the young prince, a wish which Napoleon granted by himself placing the child in her arms, but which would have been refused by Maria Louise, who so disliked Josephine that she would ride miles out of her way rather than pass the resident of her rival in the Emperor's affections. Bonaparte continued to confide his most secret plans to Josephine. When he imparted to her his designs upon Russia, she used her utmost persuasion to induce him to abandon the wild project, in which she dimly foresaw his ruin. During that frightful campaign their correspondence was continued without interruption. His letters to her were more frequent and more affectionate than ever while hers, written by every opportunity, were perused under all circumstances with a promptitude which clearly showed the pleasure or consolation that was expected. In fact, it was observed that letters from Malmaison or Navarre were always torn rather than broken open, and were instantly read whatever else might be retarded. The news of his disasters filled Josephine with fearful apprehensions, more especially as the French had lost the blind enthusiasm with which they formerly worshipped their hero and were as ready to heap anathemas upon his name as they had before been eager to find superlatives with which to praise him. 
He returned to France with the shattered remains of his brilliant army, unwilling to believe her people would dare to conspire against the bold conqueror who challenged all the world to battle. Neither his self-confidence nor his giant grasp could retain the crown, lost in his vain reachings for another. It was too late now to retrace his steps. In a short and painful interview with Josephine he acknowledged that he might still have been Emperor of France had he regarded her faithful entreaties. This was the last time she ever beheld him. The revolution that soon succeeded alarmed her for his fate. Could she have flown to him when deserted by Maria Louise? Her grief would have been assuaged in imparting hope and consolation in his reverses, but she was obliged to wait in patient retirement widely separated from him, the issue of events that threatened his freedom, if not his life. Her own future was a secondary matter. She scarcely knew what to expect from the Allied sovereigns. They will respect her, who was the wife of Napoleon, said she and with truth, though the honor and deference paid her was not because of her rank, nor because her fame had been closely associated with the fearful, hated, yet strangely glorious name of Napoleon Bonaparte. It was due alone to the world-wide admiration of her noble, generous, exalted character. A message from the Allied sovereigns expressed a desire to visit her at Malmaison, with which she immediately complied for the sake of her children, whose honors and titles had vanished with the Emperor's downfall. On arriving at her beloved home she was deeply affected to find a guard of honor had been stationed there to protect her property from the pillage and destruction involved in a revolution, like the devastation that marks the track of a whirlwind. Josephine was here visited by the Emperor Alexander, with whom she pled for Napoleon. It was greatly owing to her influence and eloquence, and a regard for her devoted attachment for Napoleon, that severe measures were not taken to crush or effectually pinion his ambitious spirit. Josephine was comparatively happy when it was at last announced to her that he was to possess in full sovereignty the principality of the island of Elba, an envied fate in contrast to the one she had feared. Upon his departure with the few who were still devoted to him, she wrote a most affectionate and touching letter, and would have followed him but for the delicacy of supplanting his rightful wife. Malmaison was again thronged with the great and gay, who came now not with empty flattery, but to assure the empress of the most profound esteem. The emperor Alexander, on meeting her, expressed his gratification thus. Madam, I burned with the desire to behold you. Since I entered France I have never heard your name pronounced but with benedictions. In the cottage and in the palace I have collected accounts of your goodness, and I do myself a pleasure in thus presenting to your majesty the universal homage of which I am the bearer. She was also visited by the King of Prussia. Louis, the occupant of the throne of France, conferred flattering distinctions upon Eugene, and would have made him Marshal of France, had his pride permitted him to accept the honor. Hortense was also received with marked favor. These monarchs, besides the most distinguished persons in Europe, frequently visited and dined at Malmaison, where Josephine gracefully did the honors. On the last occasion, May 19th, when a grand dinner was given to the Allied sovereigns, she became too ill to remain with her guests. She left her duties with Hortense to perform, obliged at length to yield to a disease that for some time she had endeavored to keep at bay. A malignant form of quinsy had fastened upon her, and despite the exertion of the most skillful physicians it made rapid and alarming progress. She articulated with much difficulty. She expressed affection for her children, who remained constantly at her bedside, by grateful and tender looks, often smiling upon them while enduring the severest pain, endeavoring to calm their agitation and lessen their anxiety. A few days, however, so changed the beloved countenance of their mother that no hopes were entertained for her recovery. She herself quickly recognized the hand of death. In her last moments her thoughts wandered far away to Elba, longing for the presence of one whom even the near approach of eternity could drive from her heart. A portrait of Napoleon hung near, which she motioned to be brought to her and placed where she could gaze upon it, as if to number him who had forsaken her among the weeping ones gathered about her. Hortense and Eugene knelt at the bedside, overcome with grief, and sobbing painfully while they received her last blessing. At this moment the Emperor Alexander, who visited her daily, entered and was gratefully recognized by Josephine. She summoned all her remaining strength to say in a faint whisper, I shall die regretted. I have always desired the happiness of France. I did all in my power to contribute to it. I can say with truth that the first wife of Napoleon never caused a tear to flow. 
She died May 29, 1814, mourned, as she had said, not only by the French nation, but by all Europe. Princes testified their remembrance of her noble and eminent goodness by following her remains to the simple little church at Rouel, which was covered with black drapery on the occasion of her funeral. No ornament or inscription decorated the walls, but the tears of the proudest sovereigns of Europe mingled with those of the poor of France to pronounce the funeral oration of the good Josephine. Her remains were afterwards placed in a beautiful tomb of white marble, upon which the empress is represented in a kneeling posture, as if praying for France. It gives no recital of her virtues, no enumeration of titles. The monument only bears the simple, touching inscription, Eugene and Hortense, to Josephine. Though crowned an empress, she never lost the sweetness and simplicity of character that belonged to her lively girlhood in the quiet at Martinique. Early disappointments and afflictions, so far from embittering her nature, served to chasten and fortify her spirit for the gentle endurance of sterner griefs. Great in prosperity, she was greater in adversity. She is an example of humane sympathy, of calm reason, of lofty magnanimity, thorough integrity and unfaltering devotion to the objects of her affection. She was one of the countless instances of womanly tenderness repeatedly sacrificed to worldly schemes of the base and crafty, and she is an illustrious evidence of the higher policy of a frank and straightforward rectitude. Hers was that simple wisdom of a true heart which transcends the most dazzling genius of man, and as one of earth's true souls she will enlist the warm admiration of all who have an earnestness akin to hers so long as the world endures. End of section 21section twenty two of the heroines of history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ruth golding the heroines of history by john s jenkins elizabeth of england oh she has an iron will an axe-like edge, unturnable, our head, the princess. Tennyson. Here vanity assumes her pert grimace. Goldsmith. Elizabeth of England is a heroine of history, not as a crowned and vain woman, but as one who, in early life, captivated all hearts by her youthful graces and acquirements, sustained many trials with fortitude, and escaped repeated dangers by her precocious sagacity and self-command. To her own wisdom, more than to any other mortal means, she owed her preservation, her popularity, and firm establishment on the throne of England. Her subsequent course presents little to be admired. Lord Bacon has been called the wisest, brightest, meanest of mankind. Elizabeth, in whose reign Bacon flourished, may be called the wisest, brightest, and meanest of women, if her reputation for extraordinary intellect is to be trusted as readily as the evidences of her odious character. That she was shrewd, learned, and energetic cannot be doubted, but it is hard to decide how far any ruler should be credited with measures in the suggesting or perfecting of which the wisest counsellors of a nation always participate. If the truth were fully known, many monarchs and presidents would lose the praise of glorious acts, and to some degree the blame of wrongs and follies into which they were entrapped. Elizabeth had the discernment to select able men as her advisers and agents, and the constancy to retain them in office during her long administration. She was fortunate in ascending the throne when the invention of printing, the discovery of America, and the Reformation had just aroused human intellect to new life, and produced great men in every department of literature and enterprise. Bacon, Shakespeare, Spencer, Raleigh, Sidney, and Drake, and other names of like lustre, made the Elizabethan age glorious not the selfish woman from whom the period borrows its title. Her favourites, not herself, 
were the patrons of genius in her lifetime england entered on its present career of national grandeur and achieved the peaceful and magnificent triumphs of art and commerce but other motives actuated her than enlarged and generous ones she established the reformation and founded the english church but it was due to her resentment rather than to any enlightened and free spirit like the heroine of a novel she gave her period a name and had the most prominent position in its scenes the subordinate characters were the real heroes she was an eagle as one who most visibly hovered over the sunrise of modern intelligence but in remorseless spirit as in lean-necked ugliness she was a vulture and in absurd vanity as in the full-sailed finery of her ludicrous dress she was a peacock she was born september the seventh fifteen thirty three at greenwich palace a little below london on the thames now the site of the greenwich hospital for disabled or superannuated men of the british navy the royal birth occurred in a room called the chamber of virgins and as further coincidences it is noticed by a superstitious writer of the time that she was born on the eve of the Virgin Mary's nativity, and died on the eve of her annunciation. A solemn te deum celebrated her advent. Her mother was Anne Boleyn, second wife of Henry the Eighth, and famous for her beauty and cruel death. King Henry, the bluff King Harry, was in some respects the fit father of elizabeth he had six wives four of whom were either divorced or beheaded to make way for their successors he was a man of corpulent person brave frank and susceptible of strong transient attachments but prodigal capricious rapacious and overbearing in spirit he once threatened a leading member of Parliament with the loss of his head if he did not secure the passage of a certain bill. His reign was a scene of bloodshed, and nearly all crimes are imputed to him. He divorced his first queen, Catherine of Aragon, mother of the one called Bloody Mary, to make room for Anne Boleyn, and when Elizabeth was in her third year, he brought Anne to the block by an unsupported charge of secret amour in order that he might marry jane seymour mother of edward the sixth and like her predecessor first a maid of honour in the royal household the christening of elizabeth on the fourth day of her life was very gorgeous the lord mayor and civic authorities of london together with a great array of nobility were present at greenwich to assist at the ceremonial which took place at the neighbouring church of Greyfriars, whereof no stone is now left. The procession marched from the palace in the inverse order of rank, citizens and esquires proceeding first. After them went the aldermen, and then lords and ladies, carrying gilt-covered basins, wax tapers, salt, and the jewelled chrism, a cloth to be laid on the child's face and finally the babe in the arms of her great-grandmother, beneath a canopy upheld by noblemen. The infant was robed in purple velvet, with an ermined train borne by earls and countesses. A crowd of bishops and abbots received the precious charge at the church door, and the celebrated Cranmer acted as godfather. After the baptism, a king-at-arms loudly invoked a blessing on the high and mighty Princess of England, Elizabeth. A flourish of trumpets followed, the child was confirmed, and the sponsors presented her with gifts of golden cups and bowls rich with gems. Thus was the royal babe initiated into the church of him who taught a gospel of lowliness and simplicity and thus was the symbol of purification applied with all pomp of pride elizabeth's state governess was the duchess dowager of norfolk her governess in ordinary was lady margaret bryan
who had sustained that office to the Princess Mary also, and the mansion and costly furniture, together with eleven attendants, were appointed for her infantile years. King Henry would not endure a child's presence at Greenwich. Therefore, when she was three months old, an order of council was issued, with all the solemn folly that attends royalty, to this effect. The King's Highness hath appointed that the Lady Princess Elizabeth shall be taken from hence towards Hatfield upon Wednesday next week, that on Wednesday night she is to lie and repose at the house of the Earl of Rutland at Enfield, and the next day to be conveyed to Hatfield, and there to remain with such household as the King's Highness hath established for the same. In a few weeks, Parliament acknowledged her heiress presumptive to the crown on certain conditions, and disowned her half-sister Mary. Then she was removed to the palace of the Bishop of Winchester at Chelsea. At a proper age, and after a profound deliberation of the great ministers of state on the subject, she was weaned. The official letter authorising this serious step states that the king's grace well considering the letter directed to you from my lady brian and other my lady princess officers his grace with the assent of the queen's grace hath fully determined the weaning of my lady princess to be done with all diligence the king built a palace at chelsea where until recently a nursery bathhouse and aged mulberry tree were known as elizabeth's According to the custom of bargaining away royal hearts and hands even from the cradle, it was now time to provide the infant with a future husband. A negotiation was commenced with Francis I of France for her marriage with his third son, the Duke of Angoulême, but the conditions proposed by the English court were so exacting that the affair was broken off and all further schemes respecting her were arrested by the execution of her mother, and the Act of Parliament by which she herself was declared illegitimate and incompetent ever to receive the crown. She was consequently so neglected by the court that not even the means for her comfortable support were furnished to her governess, who at last wrote a lengthy petition to my Lord Privy Seal, in which she says that Elizabeth hath neither gown, nor kirtle, nor petticoat, nor no manner of linen, nor forsmocks, nor kerchiefs, nor rails, nor body-stitchets, nor handkerchiefs, nor sleeves, nor mufflers, nor biggins. She adds, alluding to the child's slow teething, I trust to God and her teeth were well graft, to have her grace after another fashion than she is yet, so as I trust the king's grace shall have great comfort in her grace for she is as toward a child, and as gentle of conditions, as ever I knew any in my life. This governess was judicious and faithful, and her commendable course, as well as the simple manner of life led by the young princess, doubtless contributed much to the strong qualities afterwards displayed by the latter. Her first appearance in scenes of court was at the christening of her half-brother Edward the Sixth. She was then four years old, and carried the chrism at the ceremony, marching with infant gravity in the procession, while the long train of her robe was borne by Lady Herbert, a sister of the woman who became the last wife of King Henry. As a great favour to her, she was made a companion of the young heir. The two became much attached to each other, and on his second birthday, when she was six years old, she gave him a cambric shirt, worked by herself. Her precocious intelligence and propriety of demeanour won the good opinion of all visitors and associates, even that of her jealous sister Mary. Both Elizabeth and Edward were fond of study, so much so that, quote, as soon as it was light, they called for their books, end quote. Their first morning hours were devoted to the scriptures and religious exercises. After these came lessons in languages and science, 
and then, while her brother played in the open air, the princess resorted to her lute, viol, or needlework. When her father was married to Anne of Cleves, his fourth wife, Elizabeth desired to see the new queen, and wrote her a letter remarkable for its good sense, and as being her first known attempt of the kind. Anne was delighted with her sprightly and fair stepdaughter, returned her young affection, and when herself divorced, requested that she might sometimes see the child, declaring that, quote, to have had that young princess for her daughter would have been greater happiness to her than being queen. End quote. Her successor, the lovely Catherine Howard, fifth wife of Henry, and cousin of Anne Boleyn, was equally pleased with Elizabeth, placing her opposite at table and giving her a position nearest herself on great occasions. But it is noticeable that the flattering caresses of so beautiful a woman could not win away the child's preference for Anne of Cleves, so early developed was the characteristic constancy of disposition which was ever one of the few mitigating traits of the relentless maiden queen. Catherine Howard, however, deserved this invidious treatment. She proved to be anything but virtuous, and after her decapitation, the princess lived for the most part with Mary at Havering Bower. In her eleventh year, the king offered her to the son of Arran, a Scottish earl, in order to gain the earl's influence in favour of a contract of marriage between the infant Queen of Scots and young Edward of England. Arran did not improve the offer, nor, fortunately for Elizabeth, were any similar schemes successful. Instead of being sent to be educated in foreign courts, like Mary Stuart, in fulfilment of such contracts, she was happier in enjoying the care of her father's sixth queen, the worthy and cultivated Catherine Parr, who had always appreciated her mind and manners and now gave her a room near her own in the palace of Whitehall. For a child of ten or twelve years old, she certainly had made wonderful advances in knowledge. With great ease, she had mastered the rudiments of all the sciences. She wrote and spoke French, Italian, Spanish, and Flemish, and was familiar with history, to which she set apart three hours every day as if with a secret design already to prepare herself for public life. Her penmanship was very perfect. There was a volume in the Whitehall Library, written by her in French, on vellum, and in the British Museum is a small devotional volume of extracts from various languages selected by Catherine Parr, and translated and penned by Elizabeth when twelve years of age. The initials of the Queen and of the Saviour were, by her hand, worked in blue and silver thread on the cover. These acquirements and accomplishments, with her graceful behaviour, sparkling wit, and the kind of beauty that belongs to all childhood, gained her many admirers. Had her destiny been the private domestic circle, she might have been generally beloved through life and perhaps have left a name in the annals of intellect. But as she grew older, her proud station changed her stability to wilfulness, her high spirit to violent temper, her ambition to vanity, and her maiden life made the, quote, vinous fermentation of youth turn to the acetus, end quote, vinegar of malign envy and jealousy. For a time before her father's death, Elizabeth lived at Hatfield House, in the town of that name, and the hedges of her garden there are still cut in the form of arches, as when she sported among them. There, too, her cradle is exhibited. From this place she was taken to Enfield, where, in her fourteenth year, the death of her father, Henry the Eighth, was announced to her and her brother Edward who both wept bitterly at their affliction. Never, in the charming words of an old writer, was sorrow more sweetly set forth 
their faces seeming rather to beautify their sorrow than their sorrow to cloud the beauty of their faces. Edward was ten years old, and the splendour of his coronation could not divert his grief at losing the company of his sweetest sister, as he called her. According to her father's will, and by an act of Parliament rescinding a former one, Elizabeth was to succeed to the throne, if neither Edward nor Mary left heirs. Her income was the same as her sister's, over fifty thousand dollars a year, so that she was enabled to live in magnificence befitting the sister of the king. It was about this time that the Lord High Admiral Seymour made a bold attempt to engage for himself the affections and the hand of Elizabeth, of whom he had the charge in connection with his wife, who had been the last wife of King Henry. He was uncle to Edward, and was an immoral and unscrupulous man, though accomplished and handsome. He had married the widow of Henry with an unbecoming haste, and before his marriage had made some advances to Elizabeth which she firmly rejected. A year passed by. He still continued his very familiar attentions to her. His wife, the Queen Dowager, noticed it, and sent the young princess away. And soon after, Seymour was in mourning for his wife, whom it was suspected he poisoned. Immediately he renewed his addresses to Elizabeth. He took care to find out the value of her estates, and he gained over to his interest Mrs. Ashley, her governess, and Parry, her treasurer. A girl of fifteen, it is not wonderful that she was pleased with a daring, agreeable man, who the year before had romped with her and caressed her. Now, though he was twenty years her senior, she gave him her first ready tender love, having no competent adviser in all her princely household of one hundred and twenty servants, and yielding to the persuasions of Mrs. Ashley and Parry, she met her wily lover at various times and places by stealth. Yet she seems to have acted with remarkable prudence at these imprudent meetings, as in all her communications with him. She assured him that she would marry him, if he gained the consent of the royal council, over which Seymour's brother, the Duke of Somerset, ruled with kingly power as protector during Edward's minority. But rumours of the secret courtship were already afloat. The brothers Seymour and Somerset were both exceedingly ambitious and jealous of each other. Both aimed at royal authority and the former had got himself appointed Lord Admiral in the absence of the latter, and had lately boasted of his concealed power. Seymour was soon arrested on the charge of high treason, and after the show of a trial was beheaded in the Tower of London. Parry and Mrs. Ashley had given evidence against him, but had exculpated Elizabeth. She herself was very strictly examined, but neither artful falsehoods nor terror could induce her to implicate any one. At so early an age, she was a match for the subtle persons who were sent to sound the depths of her heart. The tragical event made a powerful impression on her, and all things considered, it must have had an unfavourable effect on her character. The execution of her mother and her own first winning lover, the disgrace heaped upon their memories and herself, the neglects shown her through all her youth, her friendless condition, and the appointment of a new and strict governess, must altogether have exasperated her strong and princely will, and embittered her feelings. The child, the youth, if not the after tyrannical woman, has many claims to admiring sympathy. The common reports concerning her at this time were of the most scandalous sort. That she gave some occasion for misrepresentation was probable at her period of life, 
and is rendered plausible by the fact that Mrs. Ashley is known to have deceived the servant of Sir Henry Parker, sent to inquire into the facts, and that she and Parry were promoted to high offices by Queen Elizabeth during all her reign, as if she would keep them silent on some points of the affair. At all events, the young princess displayed singular tact and talent in the whole course of it, and was schooled in such trials for the profound craftiness of her career. When Seymour's fate was announced to her, she betrayed no emotion to the spies who watched her features, and only said, This day died a man with much wit and very little judgment. End of section 22 Section 23 of The Heroines of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins Elizabeth of England, Part 2 her effort henceforth was to recover that popularity which was the object of her lifelong pursuit. She became very grave and studious, and devoted herself, among other things, to the theological questions which were then generally agitated. To the learned William Grindle succeeded the learned Roger Ascombe as her tutor. He had before written to her governess in these curious words after the style of the time. Gentle Mrs. Ashley, would God my wit wist what words would express the thanks you have deserved of all true English hearts, for that noble imp, Elizabeth, by your labour and wisdom now flourishing in all goodly godliness. Now he undertook to perfect her in the classics. As to her personal decoration at this time, he writes in a Latin letter to a friend that, quote, she greatly prefers a simple elegance to show and splendour, so despising the outward adorning of plaiting of the hair and wearing of gold, that in the whole manner of her life she rather resembles Hippolyta than Phaedra. End quote. Little did the good man imagine that at her death her wardrobe would contain three thousand costly dresses and eighty wigs of various colours. Her household expenses were already on a grand scale, befitting the blood royal. Large sums were paid to musicians, theatrical companies, and for her servants' velvet liveries and for her stock of choice wines, prize oxen for her table, and walnut furniture for her palace. But she affected extreme simplicity of dress, knowing that her youthful charms were best unadorned, and desiring to ingratiate herself with a triumphant Protestant party who opposed the claims of her sister Mary, a Catholic. On the 6th of July, 1553, King Edward died of consumption, sixteen years of age, Elizabeth being twenty and Mary thirty-six. Somerset had met the fate of his brother, and had been superseded by Dudley, Duke of Northumberland, who had persecuted Mary on account of her faith, and, when Edward's health failed and Mary was likely to assume the sceptre, was alarmed at the ruin ready to fall on his head. He resolved both to save and further advance himself by a bold step. The Lady Jane Grey, sixteen years old and of marvellous learning, beauty and loveliness of character, was, like Mary Queen of Scots, a granddaughter of a sister of Henry the Eighth, the father of Mary, Elizabeth and Edward. By Henry's will, she was next heir to the crown after his own children. Dudley therefore effected a marriage between Jane Grey and a handsome promising son of his own, 
then appealing to the religious convictions of the dying edward procured his legacy of the crown to her and concealed his death for a while in order to get the sisters into his power in this he failed but forthwith prevailed on jane grey against her will to be crowned she acted the part of queen but nine days dudley's forces did not rally in sufficient strength the nation apparently from a sturdy sense of honesty flocked to the standard of mary who soon entered london in triumph the duke with many adherents of the quasi queen suffered under the axe and three months afterward poor lady jane and her young husband met the same fate in that tower of london which still stands a mute and sullen witness to the heroic death of many noble victims elizabeth's conduct during these exciting events was marked by her rare caution and sagacity when deceitfully summoned to edward's bedside by dudley she remained at home being warned by friends perhaps and even feigned illness as it is asserted that she might not be mixed up with dudley's scheme while on the other hand mary was nearly entrapped before this sickness she gave the conspirators a shrewd and brave excuse for not signing away her title to the throne namely that she had none during the life of her elder sister her defenceless situation and the seeming success of lady jane's party evinced her courage in this and when mary victoriously advanced towards london elizabeth forgot her illness and hastened to meet and pay homage to her sister with an armed retinue of two thousand horsemen whose leaders were dressed in green faced with velvet satin and taffeta learning that mary had already dismissed her useless army she next day met her with an unarmed cavalcade of a thousand persons many of whom were ladies of rank they were kindly received and when the sisters entered the city they rode side by side on horseback mary's small faded form and reserved demeanour poorly contrasting with the fresh youthfulness tall erect person graceful airs and carefully shown delicate hands of elizabeth who then as ever craved applause and made the most of her attractions mary though styled the bloody was an unostentatious sincere woman of excellent intentions her mixture of spanish and tudor blood gave her much latent pride and resolution and she was embittered by her mother's and her own wrongs but her heart was susceptible of the tenderest affection she was generous to her sister under trying circumstances and would have been humane in her administration but for her intolerant creed the sanguinary zeal of her advisers the dangers of her position and the spirit of the age unfortunately differences soon sprang up between her and elizabeth and were fomented by the friends and ambition of each or by the enemies of both the younger sister was the hope and boast of the protestant party and for the sake of their plaudits as well as in consequence of her own education she refused the queen's summons to attend romish mass and resisted all her persuasions and threats until finding that she was endangering her safety and prospects she sought an interview with mary threw herself at her feet and expressed a willingness to be convinced of her errors if they were such in various ways she so pursued a double course that the queen for a while gave her the place of highest honour on all occasions in the grand pageant of the coronation elizabeth wore a french dress of white and silver tissue and rode in a chariot drawn by six horses trapped also with gold and silver 
which followed immediately after the gold-canopied litter in which the sovereign was born. But when Parliament passed an act which so affirmed the legitimacy of Mary as unavoidably to imply the contrary concerning herself, she resented it by an effort to withdraw from court. At this juncture the difficulties beset her which formed the third and greatest peril of her early career. Nothing but extraordinary care and good fortune saved her from the whirlpool of dangers into which she was now drawn. Her rash friends were her worst enemies. At the false instigation of her mortal foes they formed a plot known as Wyatt's Rebellion by which they hoped to enthrone Elizabeth, stop the Catholic schemes of Mary, and prevent her proposed marriage with Philip of Spain. Courtney, Earl of Devonshire, a prepossessing yet weak man, and kinsman of the sisters, had been rejected as suitor to Mary, and was now a leader in the plot, and resolved to gain Elizabeth. The King of France was busily seeking, by insincere offers of aid, to promote the conspiracy, and inflame both parties in England against each other, in order that he might set his daughter-in-law, Mary of Scotland, another claimant, on the English throne. The Emperor Charles V of Spain was a still more deadly enemy of Elizabeth, because her pretensions endangered the plans for his son Philip and because her mother had supplanted Catherine of Aragon in the days of King Henry. Thus was the future virgin queen beset by various powerful foes, and by mistaken supporters who vainly tried every means to involve her in the plot. Rumours of it reached Mary, who was persuaded to require Elizabeth's acceptance of the Prince of Piedmont, that the mouths of the Protestants might thus be shut in regard to her own alliance with Philip. The undaunted girl steadily resisted this, even in the face of not improbable death by the axe, for she was already accused and suspected, and her retirement from court to avoid indignities and vexations was construed against her loyalty. Letters from the rebels and the French to her were intercepted, and the odium of these unsought tamperings fell on her. The King of France offered her unlimited assistance, or, if she preferred, engaged to give her a refuge in his dominions, a refuge which would have proved a virtual imprisonment for life. At last the whole plot was disclosed to the royal council. In four days after, Wyatt, a knight in the southeastern part of England, raised the banner of revolt and marched with four thousand men towards London. He was suffered to enter the city, and finding no expected aid, he was surrounded and yielded himself up in despair. The other leaders, in various parts of the kingdom, failed to support his movement, and were one after another arrested among them Lady Jane Grey's father, who, in common with her and sixty of the conspirators, was speedily executed. It was a critical time for Elizabeth. The streets of London were hideous with heads of victims exposed to the populace, and the tower flowed with blood. She was summoned to the court to appear before avenging powers and with the fate of her mother and many of her friends in vivid recollection. She delayed on the score of sickness, which, whether the result of agitation of mind or merely physical causes, was not feigned entirely, though doubtless she made the most of it in order to gain time. At length she was brought to the city. As she entered it, her lofty spirit rose superior to her bodily weakness and the terrific scenes around her. Gibbets were to be seen everywhere, and that morning the Lady Jane's father had perished, following to the block his lately sacrificed and lovely daughter. But Elizabeth ordered her litter to be uncovered, 
and gazed with scornful dignity on the crowd that pitied but dared not rescue her. She was dressed in white, emblematic of her innocence, and a hundred gentlemen in velvet coats formed her guard of honour, followed by a hundred others in the royal livery of fine red cloth, faced with black velvet. Thus was she escorted to the palace of Whitehall, and there closely guarded. For three weeks her fate was discussed in the council, while she remained in torturing doubt of the result. There was every cowardly temptation for the traitors to criminate her in order to shield themselves, or recommend themselves to mercy. Wyatt did so, but, finding it of no avail to mitigate his sentence, confessed on the scaffold the falsity of his charges. The other prisoners, for the most part, acted with more honour than could have been anticipated. No positive evidence could be found against her, and the Queen, against the urgent advice of her chief statesman, firmly opposed the immolation of her sister on insufficient proof. But Queen Mary was to attend a meeting of Parliament at Oxford. She had to dispose of Elizabeth in some safe way and so she ordered her to the tower. This command was received with natural dismay. Elizabeth wrote an admirable letter to the Queen, pleading against her supposed fate in strong, simple language, uttered with too much heartfelt anxiety to admit of her usual pedantic and finical amplification. She took care to occupy so much time in writing it that the tide of the Thames ebbed, and the barge that was to convey her could not pass the London Bridge. The next tide was at midnight, and it was not thought safe to attempt her removal at an hour when her friends might take advantage of the darkness to rescue her. On the morrow she was put aboard the boat. The tide not being fully up, she was nearly wrecked in the stream while passing the bridge. She reached the tower in a rainstorm, angrily dashed away an offered cloak, resisted the attempt to lead her through what was called the traitor's gate, and, when she landed, exclaimed, Here lands as true a subject, being prisoner, as ever landed at these stairs. Before thee, O God, I speak it, having no other friend but thee alone. She seated herself on a stone in the pelting rain, and when urged not to endanger her health thus, she replied, Better sit here than in a worse place. She rebuked some of her attendants for weeping, and was conducted into her prison. The high-born captive remained two months in the tower. She and her servants were subjected to the severest examination by the council, one member of her household being even put to torture to extract some evidence against her. It would appear that she had held some cautious conference with accomplices of the rebellion, perhaps that she might ascertain the designs of Jane Grey's party, who were engaged in the affair, professedly to favour Elizabeth. But Mary was too conscientious and faithful to the tender ties of blood to permit her prisoner's murder without good proof of treasonable intent. Moreover, at one of the examinations, Lord Arundel, one of her most influential and furious opposers, was suddenly convinced of the injustice done her. He nobly and impulsively expressed his sympathy, and Elizabeth, with her usual cunning and something of her subsequent coquetry, began to flatter him in such a way that he warmly espoused her cause and henceforth began to entertain hopes that he might win her hand for himself or for his son. Still she suffered much rigorous usage. English prayers and Protestant forms were forbidden to her and her ladies, two of whom were taken away on account of their resistance to this tyranny. Her place of close confinement is said to have been directly beneath the alarm-bell of the castle, so that her keepers might ring it readily to arouse the city in case of any attempt to deliver the princess. The handsome Courtney, 
for whom it is still supposed she had some liking, was incarcerated near her, probably to tempt them to some communication which might be used against them. But her conduct is represented by her fellow prisoners as calm and brave. Whether it was to win favour or not, they spoke of her sweet words and sweeter deeds in consoling them. By degrees her privileges were increased. She bribed the chamberlain to remit his officious interference with the provisions of her table by giving him a bountiful portion of them. Her health began to fail, and she was allowed to walk through a splendid suit of apartments known as the Queen's Lodgings, the tower being sometimes used as a refuge for royalty as well as a prison. In these walks she was accompanied by a guard, and the windows were blinded that she might not look out. But her need of air procured her the liberty of a small garden within the walls. While pacing there, the captives were not permitted to gaze at her from their windows, lest some mutual understanding or plot might be contrived. Her constraint was relieved, however, by the winning acts of several children of the officers. These incidents are memorably beautiful. One infant girl brought her some little keys while she was in the garden, and told her that she need not stay there but might unlock the gates. Another child, a boy of four years, daily offered her flowers, and received trifling presents in return. This caused suspicion in the prying magnates of the place, who questioned the child, but could neither frighten nor coax him into any confession that he was employed to carry messages to and from the princess. He pitifully said to her through the keyhole of her door, Mistress, I can bring you no more flowers now. She was delighted with these little angels of consolation, and ever after seemed pleased with children for their sake. Among the many distinguished persons under arrest in the tower was Lord Robert Dudley, committed for aiding his father, Dudley, Duke of Northumberland, in the plot previous to the last mentioned one. He was born in the same hour with Elizabeth, had been a playfellow with her in her childhood, and was afterwards her chief favourite, and made by her the Earl of Leicester. He was on service abroad after leaving the tower, and until her accession to the throne, when he was immediately promoted and showered with favours. It is thought that he held a correspondence with her at the time of their imprisonment, by means of the boy who brought the flowers, inasmuch as they had no other opportunity of intercourse for a long time. Some hypothesis is apparently needed to explain her sudden partiality to one who had long opposed her interests. But their early companionship, his qualities, and her policy or susceptibility may account for it all. End of section 23 Section 24 of The Heroines of History this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Elizabeth of England. Part 3. The climax of Elizabeth's danger soon came. It was a narrow escape from violent death and illustrates the truth everywhere suggested by the pages of history, namely that the course of human events is daily changed or nearly changed by slight circumstances. The artful gardener, chief minister of state to Mary, had been gained over to the Spanish interest, and had persistently sought the princess's death. The queen was taken ill, Alarmed, probably, at his own fate, if Elizabeth mounted the throne, he sent a privy council order to the tower for her instant execution. The lieutenant of the tower observed that the Queen's signature was not appended to the warrant, and had the good sense to send a messenger to her, inquiring her will. 
had he been more swayed by the influence of Gardiner, he might have thought the sovereign too ill to sign a document approved by her and legally drawn. Elizabeth might have perished, leaving a sadly romantic fame only second to Lady Jane Grey's, and Mary, Queen of Scots, might have sat on the English throne, carried out the designs of the English Mary, and further established popery in a land where no strong Scottish relish for endless secessions would have hindered the still papistic tendencies of a nation too aristocratic to care for other than a formal state religion. The Queen was aroused by this attempt on her sister's life. She sent Sir Henry Bedingfield, an honest and fearless man, with a hundred men of the Royal Guard, to take command of the tower until she could transfer the princess to a safer place, far from the intrigues of court. She had already given up the idea of prosecuting her any further, and had begun to speak of her again by the endearing title of sister. She had refused, too, a Spanish proposal to send her to some continental court, an event that would have led to Elizabeth's ruin. At length it was resolved to remove her in the custody of Bedingfield to Woodstock, a royal residence fifty miles west of London. Elizabeth, apprehending that any hour might seal her fate, had been suddenly frightened at the first coming of Bedingfield, with his hundred men in blue uniform. As they rode into the castle she turned pale and hastily asked her attendants whether Lady Jane's scaffold had been taken away. When she learned that she was to be conducted to Woodstock, her terror took a new form. She inquired whether the knight were a person who made conscience of murder. She knew too well that prisoners who could not be legally executed were sometimes exposed on the highways to a concerted attack but her fears were allayed by the reputation of her staunch new keeper. She went by boat to Richmond, near London. There the Queen was sojourning with her court, and with her she had an interview which resulted in nothing but a renewal of the former effort to induce Elizabeth to marry Philibert, Prince of Piedmont, and most intimate friend of Philip of Spain. As often before, she asserted her determination to remain single, and to intimidate her into the measure, her servants were all taken from her. This deed again made her anxious for her life. This night I think I must die, she said. Her servants wept as they left her, as if they had looked upon her for the last time. But Lord Tame, one of her guards, assured her that he would protect her. When she was about to cross the Thames the next morning, her servants came to look another final farewell. "'Go to them,' she said to a gentleman, "'and tell them from me, tan quam ovis, like a sheep to the slaughter, for so am I led.' No one except her keepers was allowed to have the least communication with her. No I, the detestable French ambassador, who had all along laboured to destroy her, sent to her a present of apples on her way, a plan to cast upon her more of the odium of French friendship. The people of England, who were mostly Protestant and admired her, made sincerer demonstrations of sympathy. Wherever she passed they crowded near, and greeted her with prayers, acclamations, and tears, though rudely thrust back and denounced as rebels by the soldiers. In some of the villages a joyful peal of bells announced her arrival. But Bedingfield, who was both her honest protector and suspicious master, silenced the bells and put the ringers in the stocks. The other guardian, Lord Tame, was bold enough to cheer her with a rich feast and invited company, while the party rested at his country seat. He said, Let what would befall, her grace should be merry in his house. 
so much chivalry and noble feeling existed even in those bloody days at this entertainment she was not permitted to see the conclusion of a game of chess lest some covert plan of delay were intended and while continuing the journey she was for the same reason forbidden to take shelter from a severe storm in a house by the wayside at the palace of woodstock she was uncomfortably lodged in the gatehouse and treated with much harshness on her window she wrote these words with a diamond much suspected of me nothing proved can be quoth elizabeth prisoner on a shutter with a bit of charcoal it is said that she inscribed these pathetic lines composed by herself o fortune how thy restless wavering state hath fraught with cares my troubled wit witness this present prison whither fate could bear me and the joys i quit thou caused the guilty to be loosed from bands wherein our innocence enclosed causing the guiltless to be straight reserved and freeing those that death had well deserved but by her envy can be nothing wrought so god send to my foes all they have wrought quoth elizabeth prisoner she composed elegant latin verses to the same effect and she wrote the following amusing yet excellent thoughts on the fly-leaf of a copy of paul's epistles quote, august i walk many times into the pleasant fields of the holy scriptures where i pluck up the goodlesome herbs of sentences by pruning eat them by reading chew them by musing and lay them up at length in the high seat of memory by gathering them together that so having tasted their sweetness i may less perceive the bitterness of this miserable life End quote. one day it is related she saw through her window a milkmaid in the park singing as she milked she exclaimed that milkmaid's lot is better than mine and her life is merrier sixty soldiers were on guard round her apartments all day and night and well were they needed the infamous gardener sent one basset with twenty-five ruffians in disguise to assassinate her but so strict were the regulations of those who had her in custody basset could get no access to his intended victim an incendiary also kindled a fire directly beneath her room but it was discovered in time to extinguish it the fears and hopes of wily politicians and the zeal of catholic priests were arrayed against her her right to live was denounced from their pulpits as a matter of policy she outwardly conformed to the romish rites yet when questioned as to her belief in transubstantiation the changing of bread and wine into the actual flesh and blood of christ at the catholic communion she made a famous reply in extempore rhymes to which no person could object of course christ was the word that spake it he took the bread and brake it and what his word did make it that i believe and take it while she was thus inditing poetry at woodstock or suffering severe illness or reading and meditating in resignation weariness or bitterness as she paced her room and the adjacent garden a change of feeling was taking place in regard to her after a year of married life queen mary was disappointed in her hope of an heir and therefore looked still more kindly to her sister as her successor and mary's husband philip of spain fearing the claims of the queen of scots hating france desirous to gratify the english people and perhaps with an eye to elizabeth's hand himself as he indeed sought it after the death of the queen who was now in declining health with such motives 
he urged his wife to invite the captive princess to pass Christmas at court in London. Arrived at Hampton Palace, she was still kept in close ward, and repeated attempts were made to induce her to confess some kind of guilt in order that she might not seem to have been imprisoned without just cause. On this condition she was promised full liberty. But she heroically resisted this disgraceful proposal, saying, I had as lief be in prison with honesty as to be abroad, suspected of Her Majesty. That which I have said I will stand to. After a week's strict confinement, she was startled by a summons at ten o'clock at night to appear before the queen. This was at least the fifth time in her captivity when immediate preparations seemed to be making for her death. She begged her attendants to, quote, pray for her, for she could not tell whether she would ever see them again, end quote, and was conducted by the light of torches to the queen's apartment. Philip, ashamed to confront a woman at whose destruction he and his country had so long aimed is said to have been concealed behind the tapestry of the room a long conversation followed in english and spanish resulting in a fair understanding between the sisters elizabeth received a ring in pledge of amity and soon after was honoured as next in station to the queen at the showy festivities of the holidays. She sat at the queen's table, and was served by her late enemy, Lord Paget. Her brave and amiable suitor, Philibert, Prince of Piedmont, was present, but she avoided his attentions, having perhaps too much preference for Courtney or Dudley and influenced doubtless by the wishes of her party, as well as by her own ambition to wield an undivided sceptre. With Philibert, who afterwards married a French princess, Margaret of Valois, she would have passed a happier life, but the event would have been a great disaster to England by hindering the free principles of the Reformation. Many other distinguished guests from various courts of Europe were gathered at this time to attend a grand tournament, which was to have taken place the year before in honour of Mary's marriage, but for some reason was delayed. Elizabeth sat beneath the royal canopy to witness the jousting, in which two hundred lances were shivered, the knights of Spain and Flanders entering the lists in their national costumes. At the services in the royal chapel, she was dressed in robe of rich white satin, parsimented all over with large pearls. Her appearance is described by the Venetian ambassador in this language, quote, Milady Elizabeth is a lady of great elegance, both of body and mind, though her face may be called pleasing rather than beautiful. She is tall and well made her complexion fine, though rather sallow. Her eyes, but above all her hands, which she takes care not to conceal, are of superior beauty. She is proud and dignified in manners. End quote. Great respect was shown her by the greatest dignitaries of the realm at this time. King and Cardinal, when they met her, sank on one knee and kissed her hand. She was very gracious to Philip, and afterwards boasted of him as one of her conquests. She returned to Woodstock. Her servants were allowed to accompany her, and she lived in comparative freedom. Some difficulty indeed arose concerning an astrologer, John Dee, whom she entertained on account of the strange interest which a woman of her education took in his occult science. Persons in her household were accused of practising by enchantment against the Queen's life. Elizabeth was brought back to Hampton Palace, but Philip so befriended her that she was finally suffered to return to her own chosen home, Hatfield House, where she was molested no further than by having one spy under her roof. This was Sir Thomas Pope, 
a learned and agreeable man, who was recommended by the Queen as a person who would look after her comfort, a pleasant way of installing him as her guardian. Quote, the fetters in which he held her were more like flowery wreaths thrown around her to attach her to a bower of royal pleasance than aught which might remind her of stern restraints, end quote, and she was well satisfied with the arrangement. Sir Thomas interested her in his plans concerning Trinity College, which he had just founded at Oxford. In return for her goodness, he assisted in the amusements at Hatfield House. One of these scenes is thus described by a chronicler of the time. Quote, at Shrovetide, Sir Thomas Pope made for the Lady Elizabeth, all at his own cost, a grand and rich masking in the great hall at Hatfield, where the pageants were marvellously furnished. There were twelve minstrels antiquely disguised, with forty-six or more gentlemen or ladies, many knights, nobles, and ladies of honour, apparelled in crimson satin, embroidered with wreaths of gold, and garnished with borders of hanging pearl. There was the device of a castle of cloth of gold, set with pomegranates about the battlements, with shields of knights hanging therefrom, and six knights in rich harness tourneyed. At night the cupboard in the hall was of twelve stages, mainly furnished with garnish of gold and silver vessels, and a banquet of seventy dishes, and, after a void of spices and subtleties, with thirty spice-plates, all at the charge of Sir Thomas Pope, and the next day the play of Holofernes. But the Queen, per case, misliked these follies and so these disguisings ceased. End quote. Another scene is recorded. Quote, she was escorted from Hatfield to Enfield Chase by a retinue of twelve ladies clothed in white satin on ambling palfreys, and twenty yeomen in green, all on horseback, that her grace might hunt the hart. At entering the chase or forest, she was met by fifty archers in scarlet boots and yellow caps, armed with gilded bows, one of whom presented her a silver-headed arrow, winged with peacock's feathers. Sir Thomas Pope had the devising of this show. At the close of the sport, her grace was gratified with the privilege of cutting the buck's throat. End quote. When the Queen visited her, quote, she adorned her great state chamber for her majesty's reception with a sumptuous suit of tapestry representing the siege of antioch after supper a play was performed by the choir boys of st paul's when it was over one of the children sang and was accompanied on the virginals by no meaner musician than the princess elizabeth herself End quote. such were the merry-makings in the olden time at Hatfield her grace enjoyed again the services of Mrs. Ashley and Parry, who were so convenient to her in her first love affair. Roger Ascombe, too, resumed his place as her instructor, though she was now twenty-three years old, and so versed in the classics that Ascombe confesses he could teach her nothing more, but rather her, quote, modest and maidenly looks taught him, end quote a modesty that her Italian master calls, quote, a marvellous meek stomach, end quote. Her meekness must have undergone a sudden and astonishing change before she became queen. The language of these men is merely the ordinary flattery of those promoted to places near princes, or it shows a finished artfulness in the future mistress of all deception. At this time, the Archduke of Austria was expected at London to propose for her hand. There was no end of the matches arranged for her from her infancy until long after her coronation. The great Gustavus Vasa of Sweden offered his son, but the union was declined. The subject of Philibert's addresses was repeatedly introduced, 
and always with resulting ill-will. At last, quote, he was seen making love from his window to the fair Duchess of Lorraine, end quote, and this discovery by Elizabeth herself, as well as the final resolution of the Queen, terminated the vexatious suit. The urgent renewal of it immediately after the death of Courtney is thought to argue a private engagement between him and the princess. How far her heart was tried with disappointment, and how far this led to her maiden resolutions, can never be known. End of section 24「Section twenty five of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Elizabeth of England. Part four. In various ways her peace was constantly disturbed and her temper injured. In 1556, two insurrections broke out, headed by adventurous aspirants for her hand and a share in her expected sovereignty. The first was that of Sir Henry Dudley. Two of her officers were implicated in it, and she narrowly escaped suffering by their treason. The next revolt, a few weeks after, was raised by an impostor, and proclaimed Elizabeth Queen and himself King as her husband. From another danger she escaped only through the honesty of the new French ambassador. Wearied out with court intrigues respecting her, she twice applied to him to secure her safe passage to France. At last he plainly told her that if she ever hoped to ascend the throne, she must never leave England. But the Queen was prostrate with mortal sickness in November 1558, and Elizabeth's anxieties for herself were soon to cease. Mary bequeathed her crown to her, and secured some kind of promise that she would maintain the Catholic religion. In fact, she observed the ceremonies of that church for a month after her sister's death, when she found that the Protestants were certainly in the majority. Mary sent her the crown jewels, and Philip added a precious casket. In gratitude for such favours, Elizabeth always retained his portrait in her bedchamber. As the Queen failed in strength, the courtiers, as usual at such times, forsook their late mistress and crowded around the expectant successor to the crown. Yet so cautious was Elizabeth that she would assume no airs of royalty until she was certified of the Queen's death by private means. She engaged Sir Nicholas Throckmorton to procure Her Majesty's black enamelled ring, which she always wore as a bridal one so soon as she ceased to breathe, and ride with it to her at his utmost speed. This he commemorates in verse. She said, since naught exceedeth woman's fears who still dread some baits of subtlety, Sir Nicholas know a ring my sister wears, enamelled black, a pledge of loyalty, for which the King of Spain in spousals gave. If aught fall out amiss, tis that I crave. When the news came, she knelt and repeated in Latin the sacred words, It is the Lord's doing, it is marvellous in our eyes. This was afterwards engraved on her gold plate, and another text, I have chosen God for my helper, was written, likewise in Latin, on her silver service. On the seventeenth day of November, 1558, Mary expired, and Elizabeth was proclaimed queen. Great trouble was anticipated in consequence of the distracted state of religious parties, and the late bloody persecutions by the papists, but it all passed off peaceably. 
the Catholic Lord Chancellor nobly secured the recognition of Elizabeth by Parliament. The people, worn out with tyranny, and terrified by a pestilence that swept the kingdom and strangely attacked many high ecclesiastics, hailed the new sovereign with joy. The bells were pealed, bonfires lighted, and the poor were publicly feasted by the rich. Queen Elizabeth appointed Cecil her Secretary of State, and retained him so long as he lived, and his course proved the true policy of her choice. In a few days she took her journey to London, followed by a splendid procession of nobility and multitudes of the people, who had often before enthusiastically crowded to see and hail her. To the people she ascribed her quiet succession to the sceptre. On her way she met a company of bishops, and offered her hand to be kissed by each, excepting Bonner, who had become notorious for his cruelty in persecuting nonconformists. As she approached the city she rode in a costly chariot, but entered the streets on horseback. Her dress was of purple velvet, with a scarf over her shoulders, and Lord Robert Dudley, her henceforth chief pet, rode next to her. Before her were borne the sceptre and sword of state. The walls of the city, then existing, were hung with tapestry, and music everywhere resounded, while the tower guns were continually discharged. At various points children were in waiting to welcome her with songs or set speeches. Nothing escaped her eye. She responded to everything, knowing well how far every attention goes in attaching the people to one in high station. It was always her rule to gain over all enemies and lose no friend. Reaching the tower, she went directly to the rooms where she had been imprisoned, fell on her knees, and thanked God, comparing herself to Daniel escaped from the lion's den. A few days after, she removed her court to Somerset Palace. Her first care was to ascertain by shrewd experiments how far she might restore the independent church and government of her father. After this, on the day preceding her coronation, she made a procession through the city. The Lord Mayor and his city companies, says a chronicler, met her on the Thames with their barges decked with banners of their crafts and mysteries. His own company, the Mercers, had a bachelor's barge and an attendant foist, with artillery shooting off lustily as they went, with great and pleasant melody of instruments, which played in a sweet and heavenly manner. Landing at the tower, she left it in a chariot covered with crimson velvet, and overshadowed with a canopy borne by knights. One who was in the procession records that, quote, The queen, as she entered the city, was received by the people with prayers, welcomings, cries, and tender words and all signs which argue an earnest love of subjects towards their sovereign. And the queen, by holding up her hands and glad countenance to such as stood afar off, and most tender language to those that stood nigh her grace, showed herself no less thankful to receive the people's good will than they to offer it. End quote. Frequently she stopped her chariot to receive gifts of flowers from poor women in the concourse. At the upper end of Gracechurch Street, beneath a splendid arch, had been erected a stage in three stories. On the lowest platform were effigies of the Queen's grandparents. Elizabeth of York, in the midst of a gigantic artificial white rose, at her side was Henry the Seventh peeping from a mammoth red rose, and holding his consort by the hand. From these roses a stem reached to the next higher stage, where the Queen's father was represented in the centre of a grand red and white rose, and holding Anne Boleyn by the hand. Another branch proceeded from this to the highest platform, where Elizabeth herself was counterfeited on a throne. 
thus was her genealogy embracing the houses of york and lancaster very ingeniously set forth and thus was anne boleyn at length honoured many other devices such as father time the beatitudes deborah etc were to be seen through all this remarkable display the maiden queen acted her part with consummate address according to the taste of the period in later times it would have been regarded as ludicrously theatrical when she held up hands and eyes to heaven while certain speeches and songs were recited to her at her coronation the next day she was duly attired with crimson velvet ermine and buttons cords and tassels of gold the usual elaborate ceremonies were observed much to the edification of all concerned if we accept the anointing with oil which her majesty so much disliked that she retired to change her dress remarking to her maids that the oil was grease and smelled ill at the banquet in westminster hall which concluded the drama the customary champion rode into the room in complete armour and offered to defend against all gainsayers the quote, most high and mighty princess our dread sovereign lady elizabeth by the grace of god queen of england france ireland defender of the true ancient and catholic faith most worthy empress from the orcade isles to the mountains pyrenees End quote. here ends the truly heroical period of elizabeth's life she was now twenty-five years of age had bravely and discreetly held her course through a sea of early troubles and was so firmly established on the throne that the occasional plots of malcontents could not seriously affect her safety her long career was one of eminent worldly wisdom but a wisdom that was confined to her personal interests and did not like that of maria theresa or isabella of spain embrace the national welfare the unprecedented prosperity of england during her reign was due to the peace which she selfishly maintained and to other causes than her conduct her deceitful and cruel course towards mary queen of scots belongs properly to the history of the latter it was prompted by well-grounded fears but carried to the pitch of despicable jealousy and unscrupulous malignity this and the other leading events of elizabeth's administration unlike her youthful life are too well known to require a detailed recital as a rare picture of good queen bess in her thirty-first year we have the account of a conference with her enjoyed by melville a scottish ambassador the morning after his arrival in london he was admitted to an audience by elizabeth whom he found pacing an alley in her garden the business upon which he came being arranged satisfactorily melville was favourably and familiarly treated by the english queen he remained at her court nearly a fortnight and conversed with her majesty every day sometimes thrice on the same day sir james who was a shrewd observer had thus an opportunity of remarking the many weaknesses and vanities which characterized elizabeth in allusion to her extreme love of power he ventured to say to her when she informed him she never intended to marry madam you need not tell me that i know your stately stomach you think if you were married you would be but queen of england and now you are king and queen both you may not suffer a commander elizabeth was fortunately not offended at this freedom she took sir james upon one occasion into her bedchamber and opened a little case in which were several miniature pictures the pretence was to show him a likeness of mary but her real object was that he should observe in her possession a miniature of her favourite the earl of leicester upon which she had written with her own hand my lord's picture 
when melville made this discovery elizabeth affected a little amiable confusion i held the candle says sir james and pressed to see my lord's picture albeit she was loath to let me see it at length i by importunity obtained sight thereof and asked the same to carry home to the queen which she refused alleging that she had but that one of his at another time elizabeth talked with sir james of the different costumes of different countries she told him she had dresses of many sorts and she appeared in a new one every day during his continuance at court sometimes she was dressed after the english sometimes after the french and sometimes after the italian fashion she asked sir james which he thought became her best he said the italian quote, whilk pleased her weal for she delighted to show her golden coloured hair wearing a kell and bonnet as they do in italy her hair was redder than yellow and apparently of nature end quote. Elizabeth herself seems to have been quite contented with its hue, for she very complacently asked Sir James whether she or Mary had the finer hair. Sir James, having replied as politely as possible, she proceeded to inquire which he considered the more beautiful. The ambassador quaintly answered that the beauty of either was not her worst fault. This evasion would not serve though Melville, for many sufficient reasons, was unwilling to say anything more definite. He told her that she was the fairest queen in England, and Mary the fairest in Scotland. Still, this was not enough. Sir James ventured, therefore, one step further. They were both, he said, the fairest ladies of their courts, and that the queen of England was whiter but our queen was very lussome. Elizabeth next asked which of them was of highest stature. Sir James told her the Queen of Scots. Then she said the queen was over high, and that herself was neither over high nor over lay. Then she asked it what kind of exercises she used. I said that as I was dispatched out of Scotland, the queen was but new come back from the highland hunting, and that when she had leisure for the affairs of her country, she read upon good books the histories of divers countries, and sometimes would play upon the lute and virginals. She spirit gin she played weel, I said, reasonably for a queen. End quote. This account of Mary's accomplishments piqued Elizabeth's vanity and determined her to give Melville some display of her own. Accordingly, next day one of the lords in waiting took him to a quiet gallery, where, as if by chance, he might hear the Queen play upon the virginals. After listening a little, Melville perceived well enough that he might take the liberty of entering the chamber whence the music came. Elizabeth coquettishly left off as soon as she saw him, and coming forward, tapped him with her hand, and affected to feel ashamed of being caught, declaring that she never played before company, but only when alone, to keep off melancholy. Melville made her a flattering speech, protesting that the music he had heard was of so exquisite a kind that it had irresistibly drawn him into the room. Elizabeth, who does not seem to have thought, as people are usually supposed to do in polite society, that comparisons are odious, could not rest satisfied without putting, as usual, the question whether Mary or she played best. Melville gave the English Queen the palm. Being now in good humour, she resolved that Sir James should have a specimen of her learning, which it was well known degenerated too much into pedantry. She praised his French, asking if he could also speak Italian, which she said she herself spoke reasonably well. She spoke to him also in Dutch, but Sir James says it was not good. 
Afterward she insisted upon his seeing her dance, and when her performance was over, she put the old question whether she or Mary danced best. Melville answered, The Queen danced it not so high and disposedly as she did. Melville returned to Scotland, quote, convinced in his judgment that in Elizabeth's conduct there was neither plain dealing nor upright meaning, but great dissimulation, emulation, and fear that Mary's princely qualities should too soon chase her out and displace her from the kingdom. End quote. Surely such exquisite vanity as this description reveals could hardly belong to a mind of such breadth and power, whatever cunning it may have possessed. The great events of Elizabeth's reign were the establishment of Protestantism and the war with Spain, signalized by the defeat of the Invincible Armada. The motives of her renunciation of the Pope's authority have been mentioned she displayed the most admirable prudence in effecting a peaceable revolution of the national religion and the beneficial consequences of it to the world cannot be overestimated england and scotland were for a long time the sole champions of religious reform among the nations and nobly did they maintain their cause Whatever were the faults and the springs of action of those who governed these two countries during this most critical period of the Church, a great debt of gratitude is for ever due to their firmness and intrepidity. End of section 25 Section 26 of The Heroines of History this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Elizabeth of England, Part 5. The ecclesiastical position of England was the cause of the Spanish War. The great powers of the continent, temporal and spiritual, were leagued to crush everywhere the interests of truth and freedom, much in the way they are combined at this day. But the English aid rendered to Holland and Belgium against Philip, and the piracies committed on Spanish commerce by English vessels, were the occasions, if not the causes, of the war. The renowned Sir Francis Drake, the first circumnavigator of the world, had passed around Cape Horn, loaded his ships with gold and silver taken from the Spanish trading vessels, and finding his return intercepted, came home by way of India and the Cape of Good Hope. The Queen took possession of his plunder, on pretense that Philip might demand restitution. She disowned the expedition but she welcomed the adventurer back, visited his ship, attended the festivities on board, and knighted the legalized buccaneer. When Philip, in 1587, was preparing his gigantic naval invasion of England, Drake, with a fleet of some thirty vessels, sailed for Spain, boldly forced his way into the harbour of Cadiz, and destroyed more than a hundred ships of the proposed expedition. Continuing his search, he burned or scuttled all the vessels he could find along the Spanish coast. This aroused the indomitable Philip to still greater exertions, and by the next year he had prepared his armada of one hundred and thirty ships of unprecedented size, and carrying thirty thousand men together with 2,630 large pieces of brass cannon. Great was the terror of England at this vast armament, and great were the preparations made to resist it. Every rank of the people, high and low throughout the kingdom, contributed its share of men, money, and ships. For months it was all enthusiasm, fear, and busy work. 
thirty-four thousand foot and two thousand horse, with a considerable fleet, were in waiting on the coast to meet the enemy, while twenty-two thousand foot and a thousand horse, under the command of Leicester, were stationed near the mouth of the Thames to protect the capital. The Queen was undaunted in courage and untiring in activity through all this season of dreadful suspense. She was the animating soul of the whole defensive movement, and so great was her excitement that she suddenly knighted a lady who exhibited great spirit in encouraging her warlike plans. Herself generalissimo of all the forces, she was determined to lead them in the contest, or seemed to be resolved so to do, and was with difficulty dissuaded from endangering her person. As it was, she reviewed the troops at Leicester's camp, mounted on a fine horse, and attended only by two earls, one of whom carried the sword of state, while a page followed bearing her helmet with a white plume. A bright steel corslet covered her breast. Immensely distended robes, as in her portraits, encumbered her person, and she held a marshal's truncheon in her hand. She was received with deafening applause, and made a spirited speech, in which she said, I am come among you, as you see at this time, not for recreation and disport, but being resolved in the midst of the heat of battle to live and die amongst you all, to lay down for my God and for my kingdoms and for my people, my honour and my blood even in the dust. I know I have the body of a weak, feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and of a king of England too, and think foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe dare to invade the borders of my realm, to which, rather than any dishonour should grow by me, I myself will take up arms, I myself will be your general, judge, and rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field. Rapturous shouts and professions of fidelity followed this appeal. A storm scattered the armada for a while at the outset. This was reported as its entire loss, and Elizabeth ordered her larger vessels to be dismantled, so quickly did parsimony succeed her boastful self-denial. Her admiral ventured to retain all his force on the strength of his private purse, and thus saved England. On the 19th of July, 1588, the tall Spanish ships, with their lofty decks turreted like castles, were descried entering the channel and extending seven miles to the right and left in the form of a half-moon. Night sank upon the dusky beach and on the purple sea. Such night in England ne'er had been, nor e'er again shall be. From Ediston to Berwick Bounds, from Lyme to Milford Bay, that time of slumber was as bright and busy as the day. For swift to east and swift to west, the warning radiance spread. High on St. Michael's Mount it shone, it shone on Beachy Head. Far on the deep the Spaniard saw along each southern shire, cape beyond cape, in endless range, those twinkling points of fire. The result is well known. The light English vessels hovered about the unwieldy ships of the Armada, crippling and sinking them. At night many were set on fire, all were thrown into confusion, and escaped towards the Orkney Isles, where a storm so overwhelmed them that not one half of the proud armament returned to Spain. The first half of Elizabeth's forty-five years' reign was much occupied with her flirtations. She had innumerable lovers who longed to share her power. Her position, next to that of the King of Spain, was the most splendid of any sovereign, 
and many princes, both at home and abroad, burned for the prize of her hand. She seems to have been too politic to hazard her popularity among her subjects by wedding a foreign and therefore Catholic suitor, and too ambitious to accept of any subject of her own. But she had vanity enough to dally with all who numbered themselves among her admirers and once or twice the advantages of married life betrayed her into actual preparations for the nuptial ceremony. She professed, however, a desire to remain single. When the House of Commons ventured to suggest the desirability of an heir to the throne, she replied that she would be content to have her tombstone declare that here lies one who lived and died a maiden queen. Philip proposed to her through his messenger, immediately on the death of his wife. Two years afterwards she had the smallpox. The kingdom was alarmed at the prospect of her death, and the confusion that might follow concerning her successor, and Parliament again recommended marriage to her on her recovery. There seemed to be some prospect now of her union with Robert Dudley, whom she had made Earl of Leicester, and had chiefly favoured. He was suspected to have murdered his wife to make room for such an event, and Elizabeth had thrown out a remark that appeared to justify such an expectation. In her frequent and magnificent excursions he enjoyed her manifest partiality. Once she visited his seat, the castle of Kenilworth, which was a gift from her. The Earl, we are told, made the most extensive and costly arrangements for the reception and entertainment of the Queen and her retinue on this occasion. The moat of the castle had a floating island upon it, with a fictitious personage whom they called the Lady of the Lake upon the island, who sung a song in praise of Elizabeth as she passed the bridge. There was also an artificial dolphin swimming upon the water with a band of musicians within it. As the Queen advanced across the park, men and women in strange disguises came out to meet her, and to offer her salutations and praises. One was dressed as a Sibyl, another like an American savage, and a third, who was concealed, represented an echo. This visit continued for nineteen days, and the stories of the splendid entertainments provided for the company, the plays, the bear-baitings, the fireworks, the huntings, the mock fights, the feastings and revelries, filled all Europe at the time, and have been celebrated by historians and story-tellers ever since. But Leicester's flatteries were all in vain. In despair he married another. The Queen, as usual in such circumstances, was enraged, and sent him to prison, but afterwards released him. So unwilling is poor human nature to yield an inch of the territory it has acquired in other hearts, that many a person, though like Elizabeth a Minerva in wisdom, and, unlike her, an angel of goodness, will yet indignantly regard the one as faithless and fickle, who, doomed for an indefinite period to be fried on the coals of hopeless anxiety, at last turns to another and more heroic spirit to find sympathy. With the Virgin Queen it was a settled system to prevent all love-matches that seemed to promise happiness to those who meditated them and also to separate and imprison for years or for life those who married without her knowledge or consent. Standing irresolute at the half-open door of matrimony, she would neither enter herself nor suffer others to go in thereat. The many outrageous instances of her envy and cruelty need not be repeated. A passage in the life of Sir Walter Raleigh illustrates the tyranny of Elizabeth in affairs of the heart. 
and also her extreme susceptibility to the gross flatteries which she constantly craved and received she was mad with resentment at his marriage and sent him to the tower he straightway affected to be overcome with wretchedness at his separation not from his beautiful bride but from the queen herself as her majesty sailed by on the thames he counterfeited a crazy determination to leap from the window and swim out to the royal barge being only prevented by his keeper whose wig he tore off and whose heart he pretended he would strike through with his dagger in the struggle he then wrote to cecil knowing that the letter would be shown to the queen of her he thus spoke how can i live alone in prison while she is afar off i who was wont to behold her riding like alexander hunting like diana walking like venus the gentle wind blowing her fair hair about her pure cheeks like a nymph sometimes sitting in the shade like a goddess sometimes playing on the lute like orpheus but once amiss hath bereaved me of all all those times are past the loves the sighs the sorrows the desires can they not weigh down one frail misfortune elizabeth was so affected by this tender description of herself that she released him not long after her suitors gradually fell off as she approached an unfruitful age until in her forty-sixth year francis duke of anjou and brother of the french king was almost the only one that remained he was not half her equal in years and had never seen her he plied his courtship through an artful proxy and the ancient maiden so warmed towards him that he made a pompous visit to the english court the affair was fully arranged and at a banquet the queen publicly put a ring on his finger in token of the engagement the event created a great sensation on the fast-anchored isle and throughout the continent where it was signalized with bells and bonfires but as the marriage approached elizabeth wavered she summoned francis to her presence and when he had left her apartment he dashed away the ring and cursed the caprice of woman she accompanied him with much parade to the coast and entreated him to return but he never showed his face again that side of the channel her last favourite was robert devereux earl of essex by which name he is generally known he was a son of leicester's second wife and was a fascinating fiery generous young man just of age when elizabeth nearly sixty transferred to him her partiality for leicester who had died soon after the defeat of the armada her regard for essex appeared to be a mixture of motherly fondness and maidenly romance she felt a torturing solicitude for his safety and was frequently agonized by his unannounced departure on cruising expeditions against the spaniards in which he leapt for joy at every encounter and plunged into the thickest fight he gained a high place in general admiration and with more discretion would have been the first man in the realm but he overstepped the queen's patience irritated by her refusal to grant a request of his he committed the egregious offence of turning his back on her as he left her presence she started up in a rage and boxed him on the ear and bade him go and be hanged he seized his sword-hilt in a threatening way and declared that he would not have taken that blow from king henry her father nor would he endure it from any one they were afterwards reconciled quarrelled again and again were reconciled but when the queen withdrew the monopoly of wines from him which was his chief support he entered into treasonable plots 
was condemned and was executed, maintaining a brave spirit to the last. The Queen had formerly given him a ring, with the promise that it should be a guerdon of her favour if he ever fell into extreme disgrace and danger. She delayed his death for a long time, hoping that he would avail himself of the promise. He did, in fact, but the one to whom he entrusted the ring withheld it from Elizabeth. Subsequently this person, the Countess of Nottingham, confessed on a sick-bed her fault to the Queen, who shook the dying woman, and fiercely told her that God might forgive her, but she never would. These events induced in her a melancholy that hastened her death, which occurred in the seventieth year of her age, and the forty-fifth of her reign. She refused food and medicine, and lay prostrate on the floor at Richmond Palace, whither she had removed to be near a chapel that communicated with the royal apartments. For ten days and nights she lay in the anguish of remorse and bitterness, declaring that life was a burthen, and groaning at every breath. When urged to appoint a successor, she said angrily, I will have no rascal son in my seat, but one worthy to be a king, meaning thereby no one low in station, but the king of Scotland, the son of her hated rival, the queen of Scots. At length she sank into a profound sleep, from which she never awoke. When she breathed no longer, the preconcerted sign of the fact, a sapphire ring, was dropped from her window into the hands of a messenger, who started at full speed to convey it to James of Scotland. She was buried with magnificent ceremonies in Westminster Abbey. A wax figure of her, exhibited on the occasion, excited great lamentation, and is still preserved in a secret room of the abbey. It has her delicate features, broad forehead, and high cheekbones, and is dressed in her robes of crimson satin, profusely ornamented with pearls, rubies, emeralds, diamonds, fringe, and ample ruffs, with a purple velvet mantle, ermined and gold-laced. On the head is a light red frizzled wig, and on the small feet are high-heeled shoes, a fit emblem of her character. She was a learned, acute, brave, and determined woman, but deceitful, jealous, vain, selfish, and malicious. Her life was a long progress from all that is promising and romantic to all that is pitiful and detestable, and her last years were a notable comment on the emptiness of pomp and power. In her reign the great stars of literature shone, and England, from a second-rate kingdom, began the splendid career by which, at this hour, she boasts an eighth of the habitable globe, forty colonies, and a seventh of the world's population, or one hundred and eighty million subjects. End of section 26「Section 27 of the Heroines of History」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Cologne. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Mary of Scotland, Part 1. Virtue may be assailed, but never hurt, surprised by unjust force, but not enthralled. Yet even that which mischief meant most harm shall in the happy trial prove most glory. Milton. The character of no woman whose name figures in the past has excited more discussion than that of Mary, Queen of Scots. From her day to this, countless volumes have been published in bitter accusation or in defense of her, 
or with a professed attempt at impartiality. All the long-entailed disputes of royal families, the unforgiving pride of three great nations, and the endless conflict of religious parties have contributed to prolong the agitation of this question, whether she was guilty or not of the iniquities charged upon her. But the world has more generally taken a favorable view of her character in proportion as prejudices have worn away, and the causes of controversy have been removed. To exculpate her now, it is enough to know that there is no positive evidence against her, and that her enemies had every unworthy motive to misrepresent the facts, and that her whole spirit to the last hour of her unfortunate life was evidently that of a pure and noble-hearted woman. Scotland, in common with Europe, was still emerging from the barbarism of the Middle Ages when Mary acted her part in the scene of human affairs. She was born in the palace of Linlithgow on the 7th of December, 1542, a remarkable year inasmuch as it was precisely a half-century after the discovery of America, and just a quarter of a century after the first act of Luther's Reformation. It was also very nearly one hundred years subsequent to the invention of the art of printing with separate types. These three events smote the dead calm of man's intellect into increasing commotion, and set forward the world in a rapid tide of progress. At the period of Mary's birth, Scotland was in the fiercest struggle of that Protestantism which developed itself more sternly there than elsewhere, and was likewise passing through the most sanguinary conflicts of the feudal barons and clans with each other, and with a centralizing royalty. In no other country were internal broils so severe and protracted. The advantage of mountain fastness, the small number of nobles, the lack of large towns, and the division of the nation into great kindreds or tribes were a few of the causes of the state of things. Besides the kingdom was a bone of contention between the English crown, which labored to unite the Scottish with its own, and the French, who adroitly played off the latter in their wars with the former. Into such a furious sea of changes was Mary thrown, nor is her nature the less beautiful for the contrast of so fair a flower with the dark billows on which it was helplessly tossed. Her father was James V of Scotland, and her mother was Mary of Lorraine, daughter to the Duke of Guise of France. Both were strong and cultivated in mind and of energetic character. Commerce and agriculture had made little progress in this wild northern country. The wealthy in common with the poorest classes were without education. Edinburgh was not as now the Athens of the North, and traditionary songs and legends were almost the only literature of the people. King James was himself a poet, and encouraged learning and art in various ways directly, as well as indirectly, by the ingress of foreigners, consequent of his alliance with France, that is now the center of refinement. In personal beauty, valor, and accomplishments, he was worthy of such a daughter as Mary, tall and muscular in figure, fair-haired, of regular features, bright gray eyes, and sweet voice, his presence was both commanding and winning, and his death was brave and graceful like his life. Repulsed by the English army, and suspecting treachery in his own officers, he was yet cheerful in his last hour. Before he expired, he smiled upon the assembled noblemen, and gave them his hand to kiss. Mary was only seven days old when her father died and neither of them ever saw the other. The nation was immediately distracted with troubles connected with the choice of a regent to govern during her infancy. James Hamilton, Earl of Auden, of royal blood, was finally chosen. With him, Henry the Eighth of England, a Protestant, negotiated a marriage between his son Edward and the infant Mary. The treaty was soon broken up by her mother and Cardinal Baton, the leader of the Catholic party, who knew that if fulfilled it would destroy the influence of their church and of the house of guise and tend to make scotland an english province the cardinal in this affair made a tool of the earl of lennox who disappointed in his expected reward the regent's office instigated king henry to send an avenging army which however after plundering edinburgh retired home the earl was obliged by his part in this movement to escape into England, where in token of his services Lady Margaret Douglas, niece of the king, was given him in marriage. To them was born Darnley, afterwards so conspicuous as the husband of our heroine, and the father of James I of England. Thus the failure of the Earl of Lennox led to indirect success, and gave him the proud distinction of being an ancestor of the first sovereign and of many succeeding ones 
after the union of the crowns of Scotland and England. Soon after these events, the English king and his enemies, Cardinal Baton of Scotland and Francis I of France, were one after another numbered with the dead. But the rivalries of the three nations continued nonetheless. The English regent pursued the same policy of forcing the Scotch to comply with arbitrary demands, and defeated them in the Battle of Pinky, slaying eight thousand of their men. The Scotch applied for aid to Henry the Second of France, and bartered their young Queen Mary to his infant son, the Dauphin Francis, agreeing to send her to the French court to be educated. The same fleet that brought six thousand Frenchmen to assist their country in its wars carried her away from her native shores. She was now six years of age, and hitherto had been the unconscious object of national homage and contention. When nine months old she had been crowned in the presence of nobles and foreign ambassadors, at a place famous for its beauty and associations, Stirling Castle. The English ambassador beheld her disrobed, that he might satisfy his king, whose plans depended on her union with his son Edward. The officer reported her to be as goodly a child as he ever saw. She remained another year in the care of her nurse Janet Sinclair at her birthplace, the Palace of Linlithgow, situated on the margin of a small lake, and now in ruins. Here she had the smallpox, which, however, left no marks to disfigure her beauty in after years. For safer keeping, she spent the next two years at Stirling Castle, and then, for the same reason, was removed to Ickmahome, a small island in the lake of Monteith one of the gems that are hidden in the once inaccessible highlands of Scotland. Linlithgow, Stirling, and Monteith all lie at about equal distance in a northwest direction from Edinburgh. Four children of rank, each bearing the name of Mary, were her playmates and fellow students in this wild island home, and afterwards the same number of the same name were retained when one after another of the four Marys ceased to be a companion of the Queen. Attended by these, and the Lords Erskine and Livingston, and her three brothers, she sailed from Dumbarton on the west coast of the kingdom in July 1548. After a stormy voyage of two weeks, the precious child arrived safely in France, there to spend thirteen years of happiness as exquisite as the misery that followed it. Never was a life more singleized by transition from the height of honor and pleasure to the depth of humiliation and woe. By order of the king, Mary's reception and journey to the palace of St. Germain were royally magnificent, and the prisons of every town she passed were thrown open, as if the liberation of the king's criminals were a favor for which the people should be grateful to the young queen in honor of whom the act was done. Arrived at the palace and duly complimented with festivities, she was soon sent with the king's daughters to a convent for education. Here she evinced great aptitude for learning, but even at her tender age manifested such a growing fondness for cloister life that her royal friends and princely relatives at the end of two years took her away and introduced her to all the dazzling pomp of courtly life, fearing lest she might acquire an incurable love of religious solitude, take the nun's veil, and defeat their ambitious hopes. Such thus far, and during all her years, were the kind and amount of interest that centered in a playful, innocent child, no different from a multitude of others, except in the accident of birth. The eyes of Europe were fixed upon her, as if her sunny ringlets covered the wisdom of a Charlemagne, and in her dimpled arms slept the strength of a Charles Martel. Grave counselors made her the theme of deep study. Kings were sleepless in their anxiety. Nations were embattled and blood flowed freely, all for the sake of a little helpless girl. Yet in the walls of Stirling, on the island of Ickmahome, beneath the roof of the convent, and in the regal gardens of Fontainebleau, she prattled and romped and slept, as sweetly as if only a peasant's humble life awaited her. It was fortunate for Mary to pass her youth in France. The court and people were not then, as since, eminently licentious. The king and his favorites were outwardly correct. His sister, the Princess Margaret, exercised a highly moral influence, and the queen, Catherine de Medicis, a woman of great talents, had not yet developed her unenviable character. Everything tended to the cultivation of religious and delicate feeling in the young mind entrusted to their care. 
Nothing indeed would seem more mutually beneficial than the intercourse of the Scotch and French nations. The former by nature have a surplus of conscience, and the latter appear to have a native lack of that endowment. And at the period in view, something of the ignorance, religious severity, and iron inflexibility that characterize the one people could be well exchanged for something of the refinement, elasticity, and joyous grace of the other. It was the era of fresh intellectual life in France. Its systems of education had just been grandly enlarged. All branches of science were gratuitously taught by professors who were supported by government, and many men of genius and celebrity adorned the various departments of authorship. The most noted of these were selected as instructors of Mary and her companions, in addition to the two teachers who had accompanied her from her native land. She became familiar with Latin and Italian, and could write and speak the French with elegance before she was ten years old. And poetry then, as ever, had for her a peculiar charm. In rhetoric she was taught by Fauché, in history by Pasquier, and in poetry by Rosnard, all of them names well known in the annals of literature. In the accomplishments of ingenuity she excelled, particularly in embroidery and the inventing of devices and mottoes which were very fashionable at that day. Her loving remembrance of her convent home was testified to by the present of a richly worked altar-cloth from her hands. Some of the devices which her fancy produced have been preserved. When her first husband died, she had a seal representing a branch of a licorice tree, of which the root only is sweet, and beneath the branch a motto in Latin signifying, The earth covers my sweet. On her trapping she embroidered a French sentence meaning, My end is my beginning, a thought that all persons, the obscure no less than the great, and the suffering as well as the fortunate, would do well to keep in mind. By her orders also a medal was made, with the image of a wrecked ship and the words in Latin, Nothing unless erect, teaching the value of uprightness. That physical development, without which mental activity is almost a curse, was not forgotten in the education of the Queen of Scots. Lively recreations and vigorous exercises gave her that flow of spirits which is the essence of health, and thus that health which is the life of life rendering it something else than living death. Particularly did the exercises of dancing and riding exalt her naturally fine figure and movements to the height of graceful freedom. Her excellent performance of the stately minuet may be still recorded to her honour, and all the more so in view of the indecent waltz, polka, and Scottish of later times. The romantic but cruel amusement of stag-hunting fascinated her with the joy of a bounding chase through the forest, and although thrown from her horse on one occasion, and nearly trampled down, she mounted and gaily sped forward again. Thus she nourished the royal power and beauty of the human frame, prepared herself for healthy thought and brave action in the duties of life. In 1550 our heroine's mother, the Dowager Mary of Guise, came from Scotland to see her child, on whom two years since their separation and eight years of age had shed bloom and wisdom. Overcome at the sight of her daughter's expanding loveliness, she wept tears of joy. She persuaded the king to secure her the regency of Scotland, and returned thither destined never to look upon her beautiful and ill-fated child again. At this period, too, came from Mary's native land the accomplished James Melville to act as her page of honor. He was a few years older than herself. He subsequently acted often as her ambassador and figured much in the events of the time. Surrounded by instructors, the young queen— and the king's daughter spent several hours every day with Catherine de Medicis. And so devoted was Mary to this woman's brilliant society that excited jealousy rather than affection. She would not believe the child's assertion that she loved to gain wisdom from her and her distinguished visitors, nor would she respond to the trustful love of her future daughter-in-law. Jealous, doubtless of Mary's superiority over her own daughters, she even endeavoured, in common with those in France who envied the elevation of the House of Guise, and those in Scotland who deprecated the reign of a French Catholic influence, to defeat the proposed marriage with her son Francis. Whether instigated by an interested party, 
or by his own mistaken zeal for his country, a Scotch archer in the king's guards attempted to poison the youthful queen. These circumstances only hastened a union, which was at least a providential solace of recollection to Mary during her after years of trouble. The machinations of even the powerful Montmorency and the family of Bourbon could not swerve the king from his purpose to strengthen his power in Scotland as speedily as possible, nor sever the two hearts that already clung to each other. Francis was slender in health and diffident, yet kind and affectionate in disposition, and Mary, though strong and spirited, had grown up in his companionship, always regarding him as her husband-elect, in a spirit of cheerful compliance with the arrangement made, and probably mingling compassion with her responsive tenderness. The marriage was solemnized on the 24th of April, 1558, at the Church of Notre Dame. The month previous, commissioners had arrived from Scotland, who negotiated the important conditions of the Union in view of every contingency, which provisions, however it is affirmed, Henry the Second was prepared to evade so as to unite the Scotch and French crowns at all events. The wedding party on the bridal morning were assembled at the palace of the archbishop, the bride being dressed in a jeweled white robe, with a long train borne by girls after the humor of the time. There is endless evidence that her reputation for uncommon beauty was something more than flattery. Her form was full and tall, her hair a sunny brown, and falling in luxurious ringlets, her face clear and softly outlined, with a Grecian nose, lovely lips, and chestnut eyes, and her delicate hands as they waved in gesture, or glided over the strings of a lute when she sang sweetly, threw the court poets into spasms of admiration. From the bishop's palace the royal company marched through a temporary covered way, lined with gold-embroidered purple velvet, into the stupendous church the pope's nuncio proceeding with a gold cross the bridegroom following then the king and the bride passing through the church they appeared on a platform at the door in sight of an immense throng seated in an amphitheater built for the occasion here the ring was given and a benediction pronounced when they returned to the choir of the cathedral where high mass was performed after a feast and ball at the bishop's house, the party adjourned to the Tournelle Palace, to enjoy such amusements as beholding artificial horses, richly comparisoned and bearing children of rank, moved by internal machinery through the halls, and superb barges pass on indoor lakes, and rode by a single youth who thus carried off from the crowd his lady love. The celebration continued fifteen days, and was closed by a grand tournament. During all these spectacles Mary was as much a wonder of loveliness to all who saw her, as she was not long before, when bearing a torch in an evening procession, and looking unearthly radiant in the wild light shed down on her features, she was asked by a woman in the crowd if she were indeed an angel. In Scotland the marriage was honoured among other ways by bonfires, and by firing the famous gigantic gun called Mons Meg, which is still to be seen. The bride and groom retired into the country, after the ceremonies to enjoy the quiet that was especially grateful to the shrinking nature of Francis. Here Mary showed herself as eminent in the affectionate duties of a wife as she had been in the splendors of the court. But the freedom of rural life was not long the privilege of these two amiable beings. Cares and griefs were near at hand. The first interruption of their quietude was the death of the king henry the second at a tournament given in honor of his sister's and eldest daughter's marriages he himself entered the lists in all the pride of his strength courage and regal array but by one of the accidents that sometimes happened in that warlike diversion a lance pierced his helmet inflicting a wound from which he died a few days after francis ill at the time sprang from his bed assumed the scepter, and was crowned at Reims, September 1559. Mary was now queen of both France and Scotland, and through the influence of her friends unwisely paraded a title to the English crown also. The young Edward the Sixth, to whom she was once engaged, and his sister Mary, known as the Bloody, had successively worn that crown and died, leaving it to the famous Elizabeth, 
who was first cousin to the father of Mary, Queen of Scots. The title of the latter to this, a third throne, was urged on the ground of Elizabeth's illegitimacy, which had been first decreed and afterwards denied by acts of Parliament, the question being whether the divorce of her mother, Anne Boleyn, rendered the daughter a rightful heir to royalty or not. The death of Elizabeth would, without dispute, have given Mary a triple sceptre, and she was right in refusing, as she did, most firmly and ably for one so young, to relinquish such a rich reversion. As it was, her plate, banners, seals, furniture, all bore the united arms of Scotland, France, and England, and her chosen device was the crowns of the two first, with the words in Latin, Another is delayed, or awaits me. Provoking as was this to the high temper of England's maiden sovereign, it fitly signified our heroine's peerless position before the eyes of a continent. She stood in the glory of youth and beauty, at the head of two of its greatest kingdoms, and claimed headship over another. The then as now most splendid empires of Europe were hers in possession or expectancy. But even in the first full blaze of her fortune she did not lose her sweet humility and magnanimity. In the coronation procession she yielded her own rightful precedence to her always ungracious and now discrowned and frowning mother-in-law. End of section 27. Recording by Stacy Cologne, Fort Worth, Texas. Section 28 of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Cologne. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Mary of Scotland, Part 2. Francis, notwithstanding his feeble constitution, and his title of the little to distinguish him invidiously from Francis the Great, entered on his duties with much energy, but his health declined, and after a reign of seventeen months he died, expressing to the last his love for Mary. She had already, the same year, mourned the death of her mother, the Regent of Scotland, whose life was wearied out in vain attempts to crush the Reformation in that land, and now she was an orphan, and suddenly a widow, and a stranger in the beloved country of her adoption, her education, her short reign. Catherine triumphantly resumed her power as guardian of the new king, Francis's brother, and banished Mary's uncles from their influential stations at court. The Queen of Scots retired to a private country residence, and there relieved her sorrow for her lost husband, in tears or in sweet poetry composed to his memory. Monarch still of her native mountains and valleys, and only eighteen years of age, her hand was sought by princes and kings, but she would entertain none of their offers until she had decided her course of life. This was too apparent to be doubted. Her brother Lord James, on behalf of the Protestants, and John Leslie, in the interest of the Catholics, came from Scotland to secure her favor for their respective parties, and to hasten her return to the home of her infancy. To each of the delegates she replied in a reserved and prudent manner a characteristic that should have weight in judging her of her subsequent alleged intimacy with the notorious Earl of Bothwell, who it is noteworthy at this period came to France with other noblemen to greet their sovereign. Previous to embarking, Mary, as the custom was, sent word to Elizabeth of England, asking permission to pass through her dominions. Elizabeth replied through her ambassador that she would give a pass only on condition that Mary would no more refuse to sign the rejected article of a former treaty, which was a relinquishment of all claim to the English crown. Mary's refusal of this repeated demand, as well as her reply to other messages touching her religious position, are preserved at full length, and are beautiful exhibitions of gentleness and candor, on the one hand firmness, dignity, and intelligence on the other. These answers added to the personal charms and Catholic predilections of the one who uttered them so incensed the homely, bitter, and ambitious spinster who wore the British diadem, that she began anew to excite the Scots against their sovereign and her own cousin, and sent out a fleet ostensibly to capture pirates, but really to intercept and seize that sovereign and relative on her voyage home. In August 1561, she set sail from France, having lingered for months to wean her heart, if possible, 
from that sunny land and to overcome her very natural dread of the country of her parents' past and her own anticipated trials. The French court accompanied her to Calais, the port of departure. Catherine, forgetting her jealousies, took an affectionate leave of her sad daughter-in-law and a few noblemen connections and literary men set sail with her who had been the light of the palace the pride of blood and the theme of song two historians and a poet chatelot afterwards a miserable actor in this narrative were of the company as mary's ships weighed anchor another in an attempt to make the port was wrecked before her weeping eyes and declared by her to be an evil omen to the last moment of twilight she sat on deck gazing in steadfast despair at the home of her childhood and the kingdom of her splendid nuptials tears fell unceasingly from her and her lips constantly murmured farewell france farewell my beloved country when the night hid the shore she gave way to louder lamentation exclaiming the darkness now brooding over france is like that in my heart and then refusing to enter the cabin she slept on deck awaiting the dawn's earliest light when her attendants had promised to wake her a heavy fog delayed the vessels and at morning she saw again the dear fading hills and wept freshly saying farewell beloved france i shall never never see you more on the voyage she composed a famous song which is desecrated by any attempt to translate it into english verse and is literally this adieu pleasant land of france O oh, my country the most dear which nourished my infancy adieu france adieu my happy days the ship which sunders my friendships has only a part of me one part remains with thee that is thine i trust it to thy affection and for this do thou remember the other the sweetness of the french words and rhymes as in the pool ma patrie of the marseilles hymn the very prepositions to an english ear give the language a mournful effect. The young poet, Ellsworth, exquisitely conveys the spirit of the scene, without reference to the words of the original song in these lines. Wooed in the may day of my prime, and won by love to warmer earth, how can I seek in Scotia's clime, again alone a sullen hearth? But France is now for other eyes, and unto me are other skies. O oh, never shall a ship convey a sadder wanderer away. Behind the shore, distinct and bright, extends a farewell arm to me. Before me is the drooping light, the sunset and the misty sea. And thus in gloom and doubt decays to me the light of glorious days. When love to France with Francis flew, adieu, adieu, ami, adieu. The ships propelled by sails or oars according as the wind blew or not, and built with high prows and sterns like the ancient galleys reached scotland august twentieth fifteen sixty one on the way a heavy mist alone prevented a capture by the english cruisers who as it was found and seized one of the vessels containing mary's furniture a dense fog like that which shrouded the french coast and likewise interpreted as an evil sign by the queen misled her mariners so that they were nearly wrecked on the rocks of the scottish shore the disheartened mary declared that she had no wish to escape wreck or the chains of english imprisonment so cheerless seemed her future residence in the stern land of her fathers the voyage had been conducted with enough secrecy to surprise the scots by the sudden arrival of their admired queen they were wholly unprepared to do fitting honor to the occasion, but were delighted with the return of their renowned ruler, especially with the fact that she so trusted them as to appear with no armed escort. Forthwith the population of Edinburgh arrayed themselves according to their trades along the road to the port of Leith, and horses poor in breed and array compared with the superb ones Mary had been accustomed to see were brought to receive the royal party shouts of applause rent the air bonfires and illuminations shone everywhere and after the newcomers had been established in holyrood palace all the musicians in the city made the whole night hideous with inharmonious sounds among which a party of covenanters too strict to play on profane instruments and too loyal to be silent mingled their loud hymns knox the great yet violent reformer records that so soon as ever her French felix, fiddlers, and others of that kind got the house alone, there might be seen skipping not very comely for honest women. Her common talk was in secret, that she saw nothing in Scotland but gravity, which was altogether repugnant to her nature, for she was brought up in joyeux cité. 
The intolerance which the reformers in those times had learned from the papists themselves was singly illustrated the next Sunday after Mary's arrival. She had announced her intention to be present at High Mass in the chapel of Holyrood House. This ceremony the Protestants had forbidden throughout the realm, and now they assembled in great numbers and would have rushed into the assembly to expel the priests, had not Lord James himself, a Protestant, stood at the door and quieted the tumult. On the next Sunday, Knox thundered from his pulpit against the idolatries of Rome. But he himself had not become so enlightened as to inveigh also against the grand banquet given on the same holy day by the city to the queen at Edinburgh Castle, on her way to which she was grieved, as on many other occasions, by public exhibitions and ridicule of her religion. It speaks volumes in her praise that she manifested through all her life a liberality and moderation quite in contrast with the spirit of all religious parties in that age. She conceded so far indeed as to invite into her presence the great reformer, who had not concealed his opposition to her, and though in his mistaken conscientiousness, to use the most charitable word, he uttered disrespectful and indelicate language in her ears, she was no less calm and forbearing than shrewd and ready in her replies. This scene, as well as the mob at Holyrood Chapel, has been worthily painted by American artists, Leutz and Rothermel. The Privy Council soon formed was made up of the great earls of both parties, and whose musical names, as handed down in their proud titles, are familiar to all readers of Scottish history and poetry. Lord James, who is now made Earl of Mar and afterwards Earl of Murray, a handsome, stern, sagacious man of thirty-one years, stood highest in the government, and exerted the most influence over the Queen on the one hand, and the new church on the other. He and others in power are accused of paying deference to the secret plottings of Elizabeth of England, who thus made trouble for Mary unceasingly, but could not turn that tide of popular admiration for her person, not her faith, which followed her everywhere. She journeyed about this time with her lords and ladies to the palace of Linlithgow and Stirling Castle. The scenes of her infancy and to other palaces among them Falkland, where her father had died. At Stirling she had a narrow escape from death, her bed having caught fire from a candle, and at Perth she fainted at the shocking means taken by the crowd to show that their enthusiastic loyalty did not imply any complacency toward her belief. The tour was made on horseback, there being but one wheeled vehicle in the realm, a chariot brought from England by Mary's grandmother, which would have been useless without better roads than there were than anywhere to be found. On her return to the capital, the young queen, still in her nineteenth year, was further provoked by a city proclamation, classing the papist clergy with outcasts of society, and expelling them from the town, under pain of carting through the town, burning on the cheek, and perpetual banishment. The French nobles and courtiers who had accompanied Mary to Scotland were quite disgusted by all these savage proceedings as they deemed them, and one after another left the country. Many suitors now sent their envoys to propose a marriage with the royal widow. Among them were Don Carlos of Spain, Archduke Charles of Austria, the King of Sweden, the Duke of Ferreira, and the Prince of Conde. Two Scotsmen of rank added themselves to these, the Earl of Arden, the partly insane son of the regent of that name in Mary's infancy, and Sir John Gordon, a man of noble appearance, and the second son of Earl Huntley, who was leader of the Romish army. There is no evidence that she favored the addresses of the latter, the former she certainly disliked, and all the more on account of a report that he had conspired to seize the queen and carry her to Dumbarton Castle, whereby great alarm was excited at Holyrood. It was a turbulent period, and no sooner had this fear been allayed than a party of base noblemen led by Bothwell assaulted the horse of a merchant, whose daughter was supposed to be intimate with Auden. The offence was repeated notwithstanding the Queen's rebuke. A great mob was occasioned, which was dispersed and Bothwell disgraced by the court. A more serious disturbance followed on the heels of this. The Earl of Auden, through timidity or remorse, disclosed a plot of himself, his father, together with Bothwell, Huntley, and his son Lord Gordon, to shoot Lord James while hunting with the Queen. The motive was alleged to be a fear that the royal heirship of the Hamiltons, of which family was Auden, would be set aside. 
and a desire to give the Catholics greater influence in the government. Whether the story of the half-crazy Auden were wholly true or not, he and Bothwell were arrested. But inasmuch as so many of rank are implicated and so little proof could be found against them, the Queen was contented to take possession of Dumbarton and hold Bothwell in prison. From this he escaped and remained abroad two years. No man is either wholly an angel or a demon, and this plausible attempt at his very life may explain something of the young Lord James's subsequent wicked, merciless, and successful scheme to extinguish Huntley, a scheme strangely prefaced by the sumptuous festivities and humanizing joys of his own marriage with a daughter of the Earl of Marshall. This occurred in February 1562. In August, the iniquitous plan was executed. The Earl of Huntley was the most powerful baron in the north of Scotland. He had been a devoted and honored friend of Mary's father and mother, and to the last breath evinced himself a high-minded and faithful subject to herself. But Lord James, who had already affected the downfall of the Hamiltons and others who stood in the way of his unscrupulous ambition, was determined to ruin the Earl, and the Protestants generally, from less personal motives, had long wished such a result. Lord James was in reality king, and marry his deceived instrument. From her he had secured the earldom of Mar, the benefits of which had hitherto accrued to Huntley, and now he privately obtained a grant of the revenues and title of the earldom of Murray, which were decreed for a term of years to the family of Huntley. The first step was sufficiently exasperating to the old northern baron, who did not suspect that such a second step had been taken but an affray brought on by the question of this latter earldom happened between two members of the family in the streets of Edinburgh. This gave occasion to James to persecute one of the actors in the affray. Sir John Gordon, and thus offended his father, Earl Huntley, still more deeply. He next prevailed on the Queen to make a tour through her dominions, including the estates of the Earl, and there he sought both to alarm her with the falsely reported treason of Huntley, and to so beard the lion in his den by slights and injuries for which Mary should seem responsible, that he would be driven to rebellion. The Earl and his heroic wife in various ways proved their loyalty, but he was at last forced to an unequal encounter with James's troops, and nobly refused to fly, was taken and fell dead from his horse, so great was his indignant grief at the manifest overthrow of himself and his ancient house. The faithful, brave heart of the old man was broken, and he was no more. Yet James, now openly Earl of Murray, pursued his unrelenting ambition and vengeance. He procured the death warrant of the son, John Gordon, who was beheaded before the Queen's eyes. She wept and fainted as the axe descended on her former admired suitor, against whom history writes no blame. The other son she would not condemn to death, though he would have fallen a victim had not a forged death warrant prepared by James, Earl of Murray, been detected in season. He lived to recover the castles and estates of his father, which were now, by all this triumphant course of villainy, in the hands of Murray and his adherents. Mary is to be blamed only as a woman too honest to suspect so stupendous plots, and as one unfortunate in her period and position. Perhaps she failed to assert her better discernment and feelings. She had as much intelligence and tenderness as she had that manly courage which led her to scorn all supposed danger and on the same infernal expedition to regret that she was not a man to know what life it was to lie all night in the fields, or to walk upon the causeway with a jack and knapsack, a Glasgow buckler, and a broadsword. But she was deluded by the seeming austere integrity of her half-brother, this Lord James, Earl of Murray, nor was it her only misfortune to blindly aid his aspiring designs. She was thus also exposing herself to the machinations of Queen Elizabeth, with whom Murray maintained a most detestable and traitorous understanding. Evidently, he would have stopped short of nothing between himself and his sister's crown, and possibly he made his reckless course a matter of piety for the same papacy which he opposed had taught him, as it has taught others in all times, the satanic doctrine that the end sanctifies the means. After these exciting scenes, two years of peace to Mary and her kingdom ensued. Her quiet was, however, invaded by the presumption of a French poet of fortune and family, Chatelain, who was one of her numerous escorts to Scotland, and who now went thither again to urge the suit of his patron, the Duke of Danville. He was pleasing, accomplished, 
and a grand-nephew of Chevalier Bayard. The queen, being fond of poetry, and not averse to the customary glowing compliments of courtiers, received his laudatory effusions with favor, and even replied to them in verse. In this she was no doubt culpable. She could have gratified and encouraged his poetic nature, and yet have kept him at a suitable distance, until the danger or safety of his temperament was fully apparent. Her whole life was a training to discretion, while his vocation was to give free flow to feeling and impulse. He introduced himself into her bedchamber, was discovered and ejected with a severe rebuke, but soon after repeated the offence, when Mary called Murray to her assistance, and Châtelain was seized, tried, and executed. On the scaffold he looked toward her window and exclaimed, Farewell, loveliest and most cruel princess whom the world contains. Nothing but a blind zeal, or mere malignity, can accuse the queen of more than imprudence in this sad affair. Châtela merited his fate. During these two years of peace, Knox also continued to annoy Mary by his irritating personalities and preaching, his seditious opposition, and his bitter remarks when admitted to her presence. For the most part, he may have acted from a mistaken sense of duty but he too often exhibited the strange mixture of artfulness with conscientiousness, peculiar to his nation, to be set down as a blundering zealot, much as to be pardoned to his times, yet, in the queen herself, he had an example of calm charity, even in that day of persecution. Mary endeavored to conciliate him by gentle words. Nevertheless, after she had opened her first parliament with a befitting display of royalty, he and his brethren denounced in public the superfluity of clothes and vanity of their sovereign and her ladies. And Knox boldly attacked her governmental acts, because they were not in form, as well as substance, what he desired. Called to an interview with her, he threw her into excessive weeping by his blunt severity until she could abide his presence no longer. She saw him but once more, and then he was on trial for treason, a few weeks subsequently to the audience granted him. Two rioters, out of many who had been disturbing the services at Holyrood Chapel, were imprisoned and Knox, to save them, wrote letters to all the leaders of his party, in order to assemble a crowd that would terrify the magistrates into an acquittal of the rioters. This was a treasonable infraction of an express law recently passed, but the reformer was pronounced innocent by the Protestant majority of the royal council. Such were the winds that frequently ruffled the serenity of Mary's life during the two years of lull that preceded her stormier days. She spent this time in journeying through the western and southern parts of Scotland, and making a second progress through the wilder north. Her ordinary life was varied by the duties of her office, and every study and amusement that could adorn her gifts. Rising before light in the morning, her first hours were given to her privy council, before whose august members she sat, needlework in hand, giving and receiving advice. She was a great lover of history and the classics, in the reading of which, especially the works of Livy, she passed an hour or two each day after dinner. For the study of geography and astronomy, she had the advantage of the first globes ever introduced into Scotland. End of section 28. Recording by Stacy Cologne, Fort Worth, Texas. Section 29 of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Cologne. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Mary of Scotland, Part 3. Gardens were her delight, and were attached to her six chief palaces of residence. Holyrood had two, but not satisfied with so limited exercise as these afforded, she often walked to Arthur's seat, or along the Salisbury crags which overlook Edinburgh. The indoor confinement varied only by short, slow walks abroad, which is the greatest curse of American women, never enfeebled Mary's strength, or paled her bright cheek. In the fresh air she practiced with the crossbow, or rode, hawked, and hunted, or walked miles together like her later countrywomen. At home she danced, sang, played on the lute and virginal, or assisted in the masks that were customary. One of these is described. At a feast during the first course, a cupid entered and sang Italian verses, accompanied by a chorus. During the second course, a young maiden sang Latin verses. 
at the third a person in the character of father time appeared and offered his parting advice the queen had always at hand a company of musicians who sang or played the viol lute and organ to her chapel music she added strangely enough a military band with bagpipes and drums elizabeth of england had an endless wardrobe but mary's though rich was not extravagant we are told that her common wearing gowns as long as she continued in mourning which was till the day of her second marriage were either made of camlet or demise or serge of florence bordered with black velvet her riding habits were mostly of serge of florence stiffened in the neck and body with buckram and trimmed with lace and ribbons in the matter of shoes and stockings she seems to have been remarkably well supplied she had thirty-six pair of velvet shoes laced with gold silver and silk and three pair woven of worsted of guernsey silk stockings were then a rarity the first pair worn in england were sent as a present from france to elizabeth six pair of gloves of worsted of guernsey are also mentioned in the catalogue still existing of mary's wardrobe she was fond of tapestry and had the walls of her chambers hung with the richest specimens of it she could bring from france she had not much plate but she had a profusion of rare and valuable jewels her cloth of gold her turkey carpets her beds and coverlids her tablecloths her crystal her chairs and footstools covered with velvet and garnished with fringes were all celebrated in the gossiping chronicles of the day indeed mary's reign was a new era of refinement and politeness in wild rough scotland her sweet manners and charming conversation and cultivated tastes soon elevated the tone of her court to that of any european capital we know not how much the present culture and elegance of the land of wilson and macaulay are due to the influence of mary nor with all her expensive tastes did she forget the duties of charity to all the poor she was a mother herself directing the education of many poor children and often personally watching the courts where she maintained a lawyer to defend those who could not pay an advocate two priests also were employed by her to distribute alms constantly to all the needy in the year fifteen sixty five henry stuart lord darnley went from england to scotland and with his advent commenced the great troubles of the queen of scots elizabeth had already begun her course of premeditated mischief in the matter of mary's marriage having insultingly proposed her own polluted favorite dudley whom she had made earl as a husband for a pure-blooded and pure-minded sovereign and knowing the offer would be rejected mary had declined many proposed alliances with the most powerful princes of the continent in spirit of kind concession to england she now turned her thoughts to her cousin darnley who next to her was heir presumptive to elizabeth's crown whenever it should be vacated by death and the english queen guessing the intention not only permitted darnley to go but recommended him to mary's favor in order that she might interfere afterwards and break off the match by a civil war in scotland in this she overshot her mark as the event proved though it would have been well for our heroine if the attempt to foil her purpose had succeeded darnley was four years younger than mary who was now a little more than twenty-two though so young he was mature in his appearance being uncommonly tall and well proportioned his features were regular his movements graceful his address winning and his presence altogether full of fascination in his childhood he had displayed a precocious mind as a letter still preserved and a story written of his spoken of may testify his mother had always been ambitious to have this match take place his father the earl of lennox as before mentioned had been banished from scotland and his estates confiscated he was now reinstated in his forfeited honours and his son darnley following him reached weems castle near edinburgh on the north shore of the frith of forth where mary was then sojourning she had every reason of policy for accepting him she found him as she remarked the lustiest and best proportioned long man she had seen he behaved well on first acquaintance and he exhibited the accomplishments and professed the taste that might win her regard never was there a prospect of more fitting and happy union he could not conceal entirely his boyish opinions and rash arrogancy but these were naturally imputed to his youth he courted the reform party the nobles generally welcomed with gladness any one who would supplant murray in authority and darnley's mother had taken care to send presents to the queen a ring with a fair diamond 
one emerald to my lord of Murray, one or loge or montre, watch, set with diamonds and rubies, to the secretary of Lethington, a ring with a ruby to my brother Sir Robert, for she was still in good hope that her son, my lord Darnley, should come better speed than the Earl of Leicester, anent the marriage with the Queen. But more favourable to his suit than diamonds were the measles and ague, that opportunely attacked this long man, and demanded Mary's nursing care, and excited in her that pity which is akin to love. When her mind was fully made up, she first intimated it to Darnley, who, unlike the modern Prince Albert, had not awaited a Queen's proposal, and of course was silenced until she offered herself. Next she sought the concurrence of her good cousin Elizabeth, who forthwith refused it in peremptory terms. Mary replied that she had only made known her independent intention as an act of courtesy, and did not beg any consent. Elizabeth proceeded to excite the discontent of Mary's subjects, particularly Murray, and having imprisoned Darnley's mother, commanded himself and his father to return to England. Lennox made answer that the heir of England did not agree with his health, and his son more plainly sent word that he considered himself subject to Mary's word alone. But the trouble which Elizabeth had been brewing began to develop itself. The leading nobles of the Scottish court openly opposed the marriage, and Murray commenced in good earnest to set a rebellion on foot with the purpose of seizing his sovereign's person, and himself assuming the government. She was in company with her intended husband, to attend the baptism of a child of Lord Livingston. The conspiring lords were to waylay her on the road she was to travel, but she learned the plot in season, to provide a powerful escort, and to pass by the ambush so early that her enemies were unprepared to intercept her. Another attempt to provoke disturbance was made at Edinburgh, under the cloak of religion. It was frustrated, however, by the timely arrival and activity of the Queen. Next, on the 17th of July, Murray and his accessories boldly proclaimed civil war at Stirling Castle, and sent to England for money. Mary's wisdom, courage, and diligence now shone forth in her measures to meet this rebellion. Her nature was one that difficulties brought out in its strength instead of overpowering it. Her administration had been mild and acceptable. The majority of the people were attached to her, and many men of rank rallied around her in this emergency. But to anticipate any unforeseen calamity, and to take away the excuse for treasonable acts, she hastened to consummate her union with Darnley. The marriage was solemnized on Sunday, July ninth, 1565, in the Holyrood Chapel. According to the Catholic ceremony, John Sinclair, Bishop of Brecon, officiating. It was generally remarked, says Bell, that a handsomer couple had never been seen in Scotland. Mary was now twenty-three and at the very height of her beauty, and Darnley, though only nineteen, was of a more manly person and appearance than his age could have indicated. The festivities were certainly not such as had attended the Queen's first marriage, for the elegancies of life were not understood in Scotland as in France, and besides, it was a time of trouble when armed men were obliged to stand round the altar. Nevertheless, all due observances and rejoicings lent a dignity to the occasion, Mary, in a flowing robe of black, with a wide mourning hood, was led into the chapel by the earls of Lennox and Ethel, who, having conducted her to the altar, retired to bring in the bridegroom. The bishop having united them in the presence of a great attendance of lords and ladies, three rings were put on the queen's finger, the middle one a rich diamond. They then knelt together, and many prayers were said over them. At the conclusion, Darnley kissed his bride, and as he did not himself profess the Catholic faith, left her till she should hear Mass. She was afterwards followed by most of the company to her own apartments, where she laid aside her sable garments, to intimate that henceforth, as wife of another, she would forget the grief occasioned by the loss of her first husband. In observance of old custom, as many of the lords as could approach near enough were permitted to assist in unrobing her by taking out a pin. She was then committed to her ladies, who, having attired her with becoming splendor, brought her to the ballroom where there was great cheer and dancing till dinner time. At dinner, Darnley appeared in his royal robes, and after a great flourish of trumpets, largest was proclaimed among the multitude who surrounded the palace. The earls of Athol, Morton, and Crawford attended the queen as sewer, carver, and cupbearer, and the earls of Eglinton, Cassillis, and Glencairn performed the like offices for Darnley.
When dinner was over, the dancing was renewed till supper time, soon after which the company retired for the night. Further messages were now exchanged between the neighboring queens, resulting only in further display of the envious hypocrisy of the one and the straightforward intelligence of the other. Mary's honeymoon was full of vexatious diplomacy and military preparations. The earls Bothwell and Sutherland were of necessity recalled from banishment, and Lord Gordon recovered the titles and possessions wrested from his father by the grasping Murray. The queen appointed a new provost at Edinburgh, in place of the unreliable one, and summoning her subjects to arms marched to Linlithgow, to Stirling, and to Glasgow, her forces accumulating at every step. Murray, with an army of twelve hundred, was at Paisley, five miles from Glasgow. But fearing an encounter, hastened to Edinburgh, there to find that his selfish motives were well known, and hardly one person ready to assist him. Thither, the royal army, now numbering five thousand, returned in pursuit, and Murray hurried at its approach back to the vicinity of Glasgow, whither the queen again marched so immediately that Murray retired to the southern border where through the English Earl of Bedford he received three thousand pounds and three hundred men from Elizabeth, with brazen deceit, had just assured Mary of her good will. The latter put forth a proclamation in which the real designs of Murray were set forth in plain words. Eighteen thousand soldiers soon gathered to her aid. The rebels fled from their approach and finally dispersed, leaving their leaders to take refuge in England. For a long time Elizabeth did not permit Murray to come into her presence, and at last made him and the abbot of Kilwinning, on their knees, and in the presence of the French and Spanish ambassadors, declare that she herself had taken no part in the Scottish rebellion. To such degradation were the traitors compelled, instead of reaping their expected reward. After this they lived at Newcastle for some time in want and neglect. In this campaign the Queen of Scots, by common consent, exhibited great executive talent and admirable spirit. She rode with her officers in a suit of light armor carrying pistols at her saddle-bow, and Knox himself confesses that her courage was manlike and always increasing. The revolt thus suppressed was but the prelude of Mary's henceforth uninterrupted misfortunes, all of which flowed chiefly from her ill-starred marriage. Darnley soon manifested a nature too gross and defective to bear his sudden elevation to power. He gave loose to intemperate and libidinous inclinations, and to his willful temper. His manner towards his wife was often cruelly rude. His time was given to riotous companions, and the kingly title and equal power conferred on him by the generous love of the queen, together with many other favors, only fed his childish appetite for more, until he determined to usurp the supreme authority. The Earl of Morton, who affected allegiance, to the queen, was ready to seize on the passions of her husband as instruments for the execution of his own purposes, which must be considered selfish ones for the most part, inasmuch as Mary's whole course, and all historical documents, evince no design in her to join the Continental League of Princes for the suppression of Protestantism by fire and sword. But she was resolved at a Parliament soon to meet, to secure the final expatriation of that Murray who, in the face of her offers of pardon, had persisted in rebellion, and had long shown himself a faithless and ungrateful dissembler. This resolution stirred up the disaffected to immediate action. Morton and others at once conspired with Darnley and the absent Murray, in a way that seemed to favor the separate interests of all concerned. The king was to be clothed with the right over the queen. Murray was to be restored, and the reform party to have full sway. Thus was Darnley made a poor dupe, and bound by written agreement to go to any extreme, even, as the language of the compact evidently implied, to the wresting of liberty or life from his devoted wife and munificent queen. The first step in this treason was the infamous murder of Rizzio, the confidential secretary and faithful adviser of Mary. There is some proof that this was perpetrated not merely through jealousy of Rizzio's long influence with the Queen, but more immediately in revenge of his disclosure of this same plot, which it is affirmed, he had accidentally overheard as one that purposed her imprisonment until the rebels secured their objects. Rizzio was a native of Piedmont, and came to Scotland in 1561 as an attaché of the Savoyan embassy. He was retained by Mary on account of his musical talent and three years after rose to be her French secretary. Advanced in years, and repulsive in features, he was accomplished in mind and manners, and in various ways serviceable to his mistress. 
She could trust no man, not even her husband, and though two of her four Marys yet remained unmarried with her, it is not wonderful that she admitted the trusty Rizzio to a familiar companionship, which has given some false color to the indubitably false insinuations of her enemies. Besides these, it was reported that the Italian was a paid agent of the Pope, a report that would make his assassination a popular scene in the drama of iniquity to be acted by the traitors. Saturday, the ninth of March, 1566, was fixed upon for the deed of blood. Morton introduced into Holyrood Palace five hundred armed men as a safeguard. Lord Ruthven, a fierce man, and encased in a coat of mail beneath his robe, led a chosen few to Darnley's room, directly beneath a small private room where Mary was at supper, in company with a brother, a countess, and the secretary. By a secret stairway that led to this room from the lower one, Darnley, at eight o'clock, entered and sat down at the supper-table next to the Queen. His not returning after a certain interval was a preconcerted sign that his accomplices could do their work. Accordingly, as many as could crowd into the small chamber suddenly appeared, one after another, their savage leader clanking his armor as he sat down without a word of salutation. Mary demanded an explanation. Ruthven declared that no evil was meant except to the villain near her, and fixed his ghastly eyes on the secretary, who was conspicuous in his dress of satin, velvet, damask, fur, and jewels. Mary heard the reply with calm courage, and called on Darnley to maintain her rights. Then seeing him move not, she commanded the intruders to leave, saying that Parliament should investigate any charges against Rizzio. Ruthven now assailed the latter with a storm of invective, until, frightened from his senses, he rushed into the recess of a window behind the person of the Queen, and cried repeatedly in Italian, "'Justice! Justice!' In the confusion that followed, the table was overturned, all the lights but one extinguished, and swords and pistols flourished at random. At last, George Douglas grasped Darnley's dirk, and leaning over the Queen, struck Rizzio, who was dragged out into the presence chamber, dispatched with fifty-six stabs, and afterwards thrown down the great stairway, with the King's weapon still in his side. Several noblemen then in the palace were to have been captured, but they managed to escape by ropes from the windows and aroused the provost of the city. The alarm bell was sounded, hundreds of citizens ran to the palace, and called for the Queen to show herself and convince them of her welfare. She was forcibly kept back, and Darnley dismissed the crowd. To her presence Ruthven returned, and there drank a glass of wine, and to her rebuke for his conduct replied in abusive words. All night she was held captive, suffering the while from illness brought on by terror and her condition as almost a mother. Next day Parliament was prorogued in Darnley's name, and in the evening Murray and the exiled noblemen arrived at the palace. The affair had succeeded, but how the Queen should be disposed of was a perplexing question. To set her at liberty, or put her to death, were equally dangerous, and to imprison her almost as much so. Darnley began to entertain misgivings and at his entreaty the party agreed that Mary should be released, provided she would pardon all concerned. Alone with him, her strong mind and heart soon overpowered his feelings, and he consented to escape with her at midnight, and fly to Dunbar Castle for their common safety against the lawless nobles who befriended in order to ruin him. There her still loyal earls rallied around her, and at her return with a sudden collected army they fled for their lives. She now found it advisable to pardon Murray and the leaders of the former rebellion, and to confine her indignation to the recent evildoers. Her whole reign, it has been said, was a series of plottings and pardons. She became very melancholy, as well she might be for various reasons. Her conjugal love had been betrayed, none of her associates were to be relied on, and Elizabeth still pursued her malevent schemes one of which was the sending of a man to Mary's court, who passed himself off as a Romish priest, deputed by English Catholics, to offer her the crown of their country. He proved to be an emissary of Elizabeth, herself, who had the face to demand his capture. His real character had already been discovered, and he was arrested in a way his mistress dreamed not of. End of section 29 Recording by Stacy Cologne Fort Worth, Texas. Section 30 of the Heroines of History. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Cologne. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Mary of Scotland, Part 4. In June of this year, 1566, the Queen gave birth to a son, who afterwards became James I of England, being the first sovereign who united the scepters of that country and Scotland. In him were Mary's double title, and many hopes realized, though not until after her death, and alas, after that tender infant over whom she now watched, when grown a young man, had repudiated in stinging words his own mother in her sad captivity. The birth was a great matter of public rejoicing. The celebration continued long, the people, both high and low degree, assembling in solemn thanksgiving. The infant had an earl for governor, and his lady for governess, and was kept at Stirling Castle. Six months after, the child, remarkable for health and strength, was there baptized with extraordinary pomp ambassadors from all the chief courts of europe came to attend the ceremony sixty thousand dollars were levied to defray the cost of their entertainment and of the occasion queen elizabeth sent a font of gold worth five thousand dollars and the baptism was duly performed after the catholic ritual the christened name was charles james james charles prince and steward of scotland duke of rothesey earl of carrick lord of the isles and baron of renfrew among many other provisions made for the royal babe five ladies of rank were appointed rockers of his cradle and though he as yet could taste milk only he had a master cook a foreman and three other servitors and one for his pantry one for his wine and two for his ale cellar as a specimen of the presents given by mary in honor of the event may be mentioned a chain of diamonds worth three thousand dollars given to the duke of bedford elizabeth's ambassador the most exciting scenes in the life of mary had already begun to rapidly unfold themselves all that occurred so far is but the first breath of a tempest after the affair of rizzio darnley found himself more than ever despised and slighted by the nobility nor had he the cunning or the care to hide his resentment from them he shunned the society of almost every one accompanying the queen only a part of the time on her journeys after her confinement and for the rest wandering restlessly from one place to another through all these months his wife maintained the same kind manner to him and paid him indeed all the more attention as a rebuke to the contemptuous lords and he had the nobleness to recognize this in a marked way and by declaring always that he had no complaint to make against her he formed or pretended a plan to leave scotland for the continent this may have been done to extort some concessions of power from her when she was so sick with fever and convulsions two months before the christening that all hope of her recovery was given up he was by her side having flown to her at the first news of her serious illness and when immediately on her recovery the proposal to divorce darnley was made at the instigation of bothwell by her counsel she instantly rejected the idea from personal choice as well as for reasons of state this proposal was the first step in the bold and terrible part which bothwell played it led to the scenes of horror that which history has few greater that earl was now in his thirty-sixth year and but nine months before had married lady jane gordon sister of the earl of huntley the plan to effect a divorce between the queen and the king was the first sign of the purpose he had evidently formed to wear a crown himself as the husband of mary never was a design more daring in itself or in its execution he so addressed himself to the selfish interests of the barons that he secured their active or tacit support to any extremity or procedure against darnley still keeping his own ulterior purpose disguised the king's death was resolved upon or assented to by all the chiefs at this crisis darnley was taken ill at glasgow with the smallpox it has been asserted with much improbability that it was poison rather than disease the queen full of sympathy and alarm went immediately to take care of him she found him recovering and returned with him in a vehicle to edinburgh from the nature of his infectious disease or from his aversion to the presence of the lords he was lodged in a house adjoining the southern wall of the city and called kirk in the field it had four rooms of which an upper one was occupied by darnley 
and the one immediately beneath it by Mary, who spent much of her time and often slept there. She sat for hours by her husband's bed, and occasionally entertained him with the songs and instrumental music of her band. Little did the Queen or Darnley dream of the volcano preparing beneath their feet during the ten days they passed together in that house. We may imagine him subdued by sickness, to calm thought and gentle feeling, and her renewing the ardor of first love to her handsome and wayward lover in commiseration for his calamities. And well may he be an object of pity to all men. He was but a boy of nineteen when wedded to a queen and raised to a kingly power that half maddened his naturally strong will. Now he was aged twenty years only, and his heroic wife was but twenty-four. Men of age and wisdom had in every way endeavored to estrange the hearts of these two fair young beings, and were now busily plotting the destruction of one or both. Bothwell lost no time. On Sunday night, the ninth of February, 1567, the Queen was to attend the marriage of two of her favorite servants at Holyrood, and thus would not be at the Kirk in the Field. Duplicate keys of the house had been obtained. Eight men were enlisted to do the deed. As the best plan to avoid recognition and detection, powder had been brought from Dunbar Castle two days before. With this, the house was to be blown up. There was of so great quantity that the men went twice with horses to transport it. The queen and three earls were in Darnley's room while it was carried into her room beneath, and Bothwell himself, after overseeing the inhuman work, joined the party in the sick man's chamber, so self-possessed and fearless was he. In the conversation there, it is said that Mary remarked, It was just about that time last year David Rizzio was killed, a chance word that might well have made the bold earl visibly shrink. At eleven o'clock, she affectionately kissed her youthful husband, unconscious that she would never hear his voice again, then left with the others to attend the wedding. As she entered Holyrood House, she detected the smell of gunpowder in a passing servant of Bothwell and asked what it meant. An evasive answer was given, and she said no more. Bothwell joined the dancing and masking party, then went to his own house and exchanged his silver-embroidered doublet of black satin for coarse dress and cloak. With his accomplices, he hurried to the scene of action, affixed a piece of lint to the powder, which lay in a heap on the floor, and lighting the train, hastened to a garden close at hand to await the catastrophe. For fifteen minutes all was silent, and Bothwell was with difficulty restrained from going to examine the lighted match. But his patience was needed no longer. Suddenly, the city echoed as with many thunders in one, and shook as with an earthquake. The doomed building was shivered to pieces. Stones, ten feet in length and four in breadth, it is affirmed, were found blown from the house a far way. Bothwell made all speed through by-streets for his lodgings and retired to bed. In half an hour the news came to him that the king was killed. He donned the same dress he had worn in the presence of the queen a few hours before and assuming great anger, went with the others to break the news to Mary, who was already distressed to know certainly of the rumor that had reached her. At daybreak the guilty lords went to the scene, where they found a crowd gathered. One servant was rescued alive from the ruins. Three others were killed, one of whom, together with Darnley, was found at a great distance, both dead, but with hardly a wound. Thus perished Henry Stuart, who bore the titles of Lord Darnley, Duke of Albany, and King of Scotland, after a reign, if it may be called such, of eighteen months. Young, imprudent, willful, and vicious, yet fascinating and accomplished, his union with Mary and his shocking death have attached to his name a lasting interest. The unhappy queen shut herself up and refused to see any one. Her account of the event in a letter to her ambassador at Paris is on record, and is full of unaffected grief and horror. Believing that violence was intended to herself also, she removed to Edinburgh Castle for greater safety. Great rewards were offered for the detection of the murderers. Suspicion soon centered on Bothwell. At night, a placard was posted, charging the deed on him together with others, not accepting the Queen as one who connived at the crime. The whole country was agitated with mystery. Mary used every exertion to penetrate it, but she knew not whom to arrest, and was so worn out with trouble that she was prevailed on to journey for her health. According to the entreaty of Lennox, Darnley's father, 
she finally ordered a trial of Bothwell in April. At this, Bothwell was acquitted, having taken care to make it unsafe for Lennox to appear and support the charge, even if he could have found evidence to sustain it. Bothwell's next achievement was the procuring of a written bond signed by nearly all the nobility of every party and creed, pledging their lives and goods to aid his claims to Mary's hand. This was accomplished at a supper to which he invited them on the 20th of April. It must have required much preliminary electioneering, and as proof of very bold and subtle finesse, or perhaps the lords readily assented in order to better ruin Mary. The bond was secured for its effects on the Queen at a future day, and for the present was kept from her knowledge. When questioned as to the report of her intended marriage with the Earl, she said there was no such thing in her mind, and when Bothwell soon after hinted his desire to her, she discouraged it altogether. The time had come, therefore, for another high-handed act. The Queen had been spending a few days at Stirling, and was to return on the 24th of April. Bothwell gathered a band of cavalry, numbering between five hundred and a thousand men, as if to suppress disturbances on the southern border over which he ruled. But changing his course after proceeding a short distance, he intercepted Mary and her slender escort at Linlithgow, took the bride of her horse, and hastened to Dunbar Castle. An abduction at all, under the circumstances, together with the unnecessary number of troopers employed and the spirit of Mary's whole life and testimony, are some of the evidences that this affair was not with her knowledge or consent as has been maintained. Able writers have not only laboriously accused her of this, but have argued that she had already a criminal intimacy with Bothwell, and that too before the murder of her husband. All that we know of her on undisputed record and a great variety of circumstances that any reader of history may gather utterly disprove the foul insinuations and assaults of partisan or blind writers. At Dunbar Castle on the rocky seashore, Mary was held ten days in a solitude to which none but Bothwell was admitted, not even her own servants. She saw no signs of an attempt by her subjects to deliver her. She found the nobles were pledged on the earl's side. He both supplicated her love and tender appeals, and declared that he would compel her to marry him against her will if necessary. Darnley, though only three months in his grave, had been one of the murderers of her faithful servant and secretary, and had before forfeited her love, so that she must have felt his death a relief, though a great shock to her sensibilities. There was not a man of influence except her captor on whom she could rely. Her kingdom was full of trouble and violence. Bothwell was a man of shrewd mind, unflinching courage, and great energy. He had been acquitted at his trial, and had the written consent of all the peers to his marriage with her. He was that sort of fierce lover which her whole temperament would lead her to admire and yield to. She was not a shrinking maiden, and above all, she was wholly in his power with no prospect of escape. What wonder she at last consented to be his bride, or that, having once consented and received his fond attentions, she afterwards under less apparent necessity adhered to her promise. But there is reason to believe that he went to the most guilty extremities of compulsion, so that her course subsequently became one of mere necessity. Meantime, he and his injured wife both sued for a divorce, which was hurriedly granted by the courts. Taken under guard to Edinburgh Castle, which was in Bothwell's control, Mary was not permitted to appear in public until the bans of marriage had been twice proclaimed. The ceremony took place in a very quiet way, and according to the Protestant form, to which the Queen seems to have been reconciled only by a despairing state of mind, so unfaltering was her steadfastness and her peculiar faith through a whole life. A sermon was preached on the occasion, and after it at supper Bothwell gave loose to his coarse hilarity elated by his entire success. But his success so far was no less complete than was the conscious ruin of the Queen of Scots. So hopeless was she, it is declared, that she threatened to commit suicide. Though she was reinstated in Holyrood Palace, she was continually guarded by two hundred harquebusiers in the pay of her ravisher. His conduct to her was full of suspicion and rudeness. His other wife, formerly divorced, remained in his former residence, and, as it was believed, had an understanding with him. And to these sources of Mary's misery were added the now apparently confirmed and triumphant accusations of many of her subjects, and a loss of the respect of other nations and royal courts. Villainy ever overacts its part. Bothwell might have confirmed his triumph by a prudent course, 
but in his proud exultation he took no care to allay the already active envy of the nobles, and he even boasted that if he could get Mary's child into his possession, the young prince would never have an opportunity to revenge the death of his father. Soon after, he proclaimed his intention to go with the queen to quell some troubles on the border, and called on the chiefs to appear with their forces under arms for this purpose. It was at once suspected that he had designs on the young prince at Stirling Castle. Accordingly, the prince's lords, as they were thenceforth termed, gathered their retainers as if in compliance with the call, but assembled at Stirling in great numbers in open opposition to Bothwell. He just then learned that he could not rely on the keeper of the castle of Edinburgh, and fearing an attack from that quarter also, with the ready apprehension of an evil conscience, retired to Borthwick Castle seven miles south of the city. No sooner had he placed Mary there and collected all his force in defense than he found himself surrounded by the swarming army of his adversaries. At night he fled through their ranks, in company with Mary, whose fortunes were now thoroughly involved with his, and who thus escaped in the disguise of male attire. Arrived at Dunbar, he summoned all the queen's lieges to her name to appear for her defense. An army of two thousand men, moved by feeling of loyalty, answered the call and were led forth by himself and Mary. The opposing forces met at Carberry Hill, but neither seemed disposed to engage the other in battle. The day was spent in negotiations, at one time for peace, at another for a decision by single combat, Bothwell having challenged any man of his own rank to meet him, and each party claiming that the other was in blame for the failure of this proposal. Finally, the queen offered to place herself in the hands of her lords, and to pardon their seeming revolt, provided they would ensure her free sovereignty. To frustrate her purpose, Bothwell, with characteristic desperation, attempted to shoot her messenger, and not succeeding, retired angrily to Dunbar Castle with his few followers. The moment Mary surrendered herself to the nobles, for the sake, as she said, of saving the waste of Christian blood and her people's lives, was a turning point of his rash career. Not long after, he found it advisable to escape into the north of Scotland, where he held estates as a Duke of Orkney. Pursued thither by his enemies, and nearly captured as he was flying from them in a boat, it is related that he remained a while in the Orkney Isles, committing piracy on the seas, and was at last taken to Denmark, or else voluntarily went thither, to enlist the Danish king in his wretched cause. However that may be, it is believed he spent years in a Danish dungeon and at last died insane, from the mad chafing of his proud, restless spirit, and the gnawings of conscience. His life was strange and wild as a dream. He was an embodiment of the fiery passions of the age. In our times, noblemen are giving scientific lectures to the people, or sitting as chairman of peace conventions and missionary societies. Mary's conduct to Carberry Hill can hardly be construed into any real love for Bothwell, her army was so superior in numbers and position as to promise a sure victory. She would not have prevented a battle, or parted from him in such a manner, had she not desired to put herself out of his power. But her noble trust in her base nobleman was destined to be betrayed. As she entered the city, she was preceded by a banner, whereupon was painted the shocking picture of Darnley lying dead, and her child kneeling before it with the words, Judge and revenge my cause, O Lord. The populace pressed around her, and insulted her with the most shameful exclamations while she rode on, her face bowed down in tears. To her surprise, the lords led her past Holyrood. She called out all her loyal subjects to interfere on her behalf, but she was taken to the provost's house. The next day, she so worked upon the variable sympathies of the crowd that her oppressors escorted her to the palace. This was but a feint of submission, or rather a step to a greater outrage. At midnight, Ruthven and Lindsay, the grim earls who were active in Rizzio's assassination, aroused her from sleep, disguised her in a coarse riding dress, and placing her on a horse, made all speed through the darkness until morning, when she found herself at Lochleven Castle, which was situated on a small island in the lake of that name north of Edinburgh. This was a place of great security, and the more so in this case, as it was, the seat of Lady Douglas, the mother of Earl Murray, and closely connected with Lindsay and Morton, all of them at heart, the foes of Mary. The full extent of the designs against her was hidden from the unfortunate queen. It was represented 
that extreme care for her safety in view of the power of Bothwell was the reason for such treatment, but she could not doubt that some evil was intended. Her keeper, the Lady of Lochleven, as she was more generally known, behaved harshly to her charge, and even taunted her with a pretension to the crown itself. She was kept, too, in close confinement. Her rooms occupying a bastion that overhung the waters of the lake are still shown to travelers, though dilapidated, like the rest of the castle. Thus far, the dominant party had not dared to publicly charge her with crime. Their declarations show that she was universally regarded as a helpless victim of the Lord of Dunbar Castle. Two great parties, however, soon began to define themselves, one for the Queen and one for the Prince. Morton, the leader of the latter, was at Edinburgh with his supporters. Hamilton Palace near Glasgow was a rendezvous of the Queen's friends, among whom were Huntley, Argyll, Rothes, Livingston, and Seton, altogether representing a majority of the kingdom. The prince's friends, as they termed themselves, began to publish many systematic falsehoods criminating Mary, and these have been repeated and urged ever since. Their motives are plain. They hoped by dethroning her both to escape punishment for their misdeeds and to rise into greater power. And the queen's friends, knowing this, proposed that they should liberate her on condition that she would forever pardon them. But they had gone too far to consent to this. Elizabeth, too, was busily instigating them against Mary, and Murray, who had long been at Paris, cautiously watched events in Scotland, lent them his encouragement. End of section 30. Recording by Stacy Cologne, Fort Worth, Texas. Section 31 of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Cologne. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Mary of Scotland, Part 5. The 26th of July, 1567, was perhaps the saddest of all the sad days of this hapless queen. Sir Robert Melville and Lord Lindsay came to make her abdicate her throne. Melville first saw her, and used his persuasive talent to the utmost, but without effect. The savage Lindsay was next admitted. He at once broke forth in fierce threats, vowing to the unprotected queen that if she did not immediately sign the papers of abdication brought with them, he would sign them with her blood and cast her into the lake beneath the window. Mary had known his sanguinary part in the Rizzio tragedy. She now saw him about to draw his dagger, as she supposed. Melville adroitly whispered to her that acts done under compulsion would not be binding if she ever should choose to disown them. In an agony of tears and terror, she put her name to the documents, wherein she was made to say that she freely resigned her crown, being wearied with the labors of government. Thus, did this woman, whose honorable ambition was her ruling passion, suddenly find herself no more a sovereign. Four days afterward her son James, then one year old, was crowned at Stirling. All commands were published in his name. Buchanan, one of Mary's bitterest enemies, was made his tutor, and from that time contempt for his own mother was carefully instilled into the child's mind. Murray soon returned to Scotland. With characteristic circumspection, he did not at first commit himself to either party. The regency, during James's minority, was urged upon him. He went to Lochleven, and, counterfeiting great sympathy for Mary, prevailed on her to approve his assuming that office for her sake. At Edinburgh he pretended much humility, and a regret that the choice had fallen upon him, but took the oaths of regent. He set himself energetically and carefully at work to suppress discontent and to strengthen his power for a virtual reign in James's name that promised to endure many years. And to make assurance doubly sure, love letters were now forged and produced purporting to be from Mary to Bothwell and implicating her in Darnley's murder. The summit of his ambition appeared to be attained when Mary, a light-hearted girl of eighteen in sunny France, received the respectful visits of her Scottish earls. Little did she foresee how strangely the dark threads of the lives of the two of them were to be interwoven with the fair fibers of her own. For the first seven months of her imprisonment, the gloom of the poor queen was unalleviated by one ray of hope. 
in four short months, an unparalleled series of misfortunes, wrongs, and insults had fallen upon her. The Lady of Lochleven, a former dismissed courtesan of her father, was bitter and malicious. One of the chief servants of the castle was concerned in Rizzio's death, and declared he would gladly kill the queen. Her own servants were her only solace and protection. These were faithful and tender, yet even with their aid she had no chance of escape. But in March, 1568, a new light shone into her prison. A son of the lady keeper, George Douglas, aged 25, and a relative of the family, William Douglas, 17 years old, had entertained a very romantic interest in the beautiful and luckless Mary. They now arranged a plan for her escape. She clothed herself in the garments of her laundress, concealing her face, and bundle in hand passed out of the castle and took the boat in waiting. But the boatmen discovered her delicate hands, and, despite her commands as their queen, took her back to the castle. The resolute and chivalric George and William did not relinquish the idea of rescuing their lovely sovereign. Five weeks after, another scheme was formed and this time successfully carried out. On the 2nd of May, William abstracted the keys of the castle from the family supper table where they had been laid, locked the whole household in as he passed out, helped Mary out of the one window into a boat prepared for her, threw the keys into the lake, and with the assistance of Mary herself at the oars, soon placed her exultingly in the hands of several of her trusty lords who were waiting with the guard to receive her. Quickly mounting and riding rapidly with little rest, they arrived with her at Hamilton Palace early in the forenoon of the next day. The whole land was aroused by the news of her escape. Multitudes of every grade gathered to her assistance. Among them nine earls, nine bishops, eighteen lords, and many barons and gentlemen. Six thousand soldiers were at her command before the week closed. She renounced her forced abdication, Melville himself appearing and testifying to the circumstances. Murray's friends began to silently withdraw from him. He was at Glasgow near the headquarters of Mary. He saw the need of instant action to arrest her intention to fortify herself in Dumbarton Castle, which is situated on a lofty pyramid of rock, and was a place of impregnable strength. She was already on the way with her troops. Murray called together some four thousand men and met the Queen's army at Langside, two miles south of Glasgow. Both armies endeavored to gain a commanding hill. Murray, by the advice of a veteran, mounted his infantry behind the trooper's saddles and reached the point first. A fierce battle ensued, for a long time doubtful, but at last decided by a reinforcement of Highlanders in favor of the regent. Mary watched the scene in unimaginable excitement, and overwhelmed at the result cried out that it were better for her not to have been born. There was no time for delay. With a few attendants she put her excellent horsemanship to full proof, and never paused until she was sixty miles away to the south at the Abbey of Dundrennan. She was advised to sail for France, but was too proud to enter as a fugitive the land she had reigned over in splendor as the queen of a triple scepter nor would it do for her to apply for aid to a Catholic country. It would hazard her crown too much. She trusted that Elizabeth would at least give her refuge and applied for it. Unable to wait for a reply, she made her way by land and water to the vicinity of the castle of Carlisle in England. Men of rank came to meet her and conducted her with great respect to the castle. Elizabeth sent hypocritical messages of sympathy. She privately exulted in the climax of her wishes, the apparent ruin of Mary. She did not know how far it was prudent to take advantage of her power and waited to consult with Murray. With the excuse that Mary was in danger from her Scottish enemies, the castle was repaired. She at all times kept under guard, and her walks and rides finally prevented altogether. For the same ostensible reason, she was not long after removed farther south to Bolton Castle in the north of Yorkshire. Elizabeth's course was soon settled. She conferred with Murray, who had dispersed the renewed gatherings of forces in Mary's cause, and busily entrenched himself in his ill-gotten authority. The plan was to bring the Queen of Scots to what amounted to a criminal trial, and by foul means make her stand condemned before the world. 
She was called on to appoint commissioners to meet those of Murray, and others named by Elizabeth, to settle all disputes between her and the regent. Against this she protested as a sovereign, who could not be placed on a level with rebels to herself, but was ultimately persuaded to thus vindicate her honor. The English queen, from first to last, acted with a cunning as fiendish in its subtlety as in its malice. The commissioners met at York on the 4th of October, 1568. Notwithstanding Murray's utmost efforts, the case seemed to be going against him. Elizabeth, to give her influence a more deadly certainty, removed the conference to Westminster, and received Murray to her presence, whereas she had cruelly and unjustly refused to see Mary, the royal defendant, as if her pretended purity could not come in contact with one on whom rested suspicions which Elizabeth herself, after the mock trial even, declared to Mary she did not believe. With her quick intelligence and decision, Mary instructed her commissioners to withdraw from the council, and thus dissolve it, because it was so evidently unfair to adjourn it to a great distance from the accused, and to admit the accusers to opportunities denied to herself. Before this order reached her friends, Murray had, as a last resort, brought forward the forged love-letters and sonnets ascribed to Mary, and involving her in the death of Darnley. The evidences for their suspiciousness need not be recounted the way they were used and at other times neglected to be used by the usurpers of the queen's power is enough to brand them as false the conference was broken up but murray and his spinster dictator arranged a little scene in which he was reprimanded and in defence brought forward an elaborate written statement of charges and proofs which england might employ in various ways and a reply to which was denied reception thus the whole infamous plot did not succeed but the great point was sufficiently gained, namely, to so overshadow the character of one of the earth's noblest and purest heroines that she could be held in lingering captivity. The retribution that followed the perfidious actors in this history is remarkable. Murray did not long enjoy his success. He was shot by Hamilton in revenge of maddening injuries done to the family of the latter by the troops of the former, and the tears Mary shed for him were witness to some good in his character, but more to the lofty magnanimity of her own. Lennox and Morton, who succeeded him, and other participants in the same events, after covering themselves with crime or cruelty or treachery, one by one met a violent death. They that took the sword perished by the sword. Mary was but twenty-five when she entered England, in the first full bloom of body and mind. She was doomed to a thraldom of eighteen years that gradually destroyed her spirits and health, and ended in the bloody vengeance of the axe. This portion of her life was as much more heroic than the days of her active achievements, as the virtues of endurance and resignation are more noble than executive talent. She ceased to be the acknowledged Queen of Scotland, but she gained the kingdom of her own ambitious and afflicted heart, and she was purified like gold tried in the fire for the kingdom of heaven. She was taken from one castle to another and committed to the charge of one lord after another, in order that she might neither gain too much influence over her keepers nor carry out a plan of escape. Her luxuries, comforts, attendants, and friends were continually diminished through the relentless hatred of her oppressor and her communications with friends at a distance was intercepted as far as possible. She employed herself in embroidery, reading, and writing. Some of her poetical efforts are preserved, and are beautiful memorials of her genius, her grief, and her Christian faith. And well did she need all resources to beguile her weary days and make her forget a while her discomfort. She had gradually ceased to be remembered, and her strong party at home was by degrees suppressed and thinned by death her hair turned prematurely gray with sorrow her strength from want of exercise miserable fare and bad accommodations failed her a painful symptom of disease in her left side began to grow upon her she thus describes her residence at tutbury in sixteen eighty this edifice detached from the walls about twenty feet is sunk so low that the rampart of earth behind the wall is level with the highest part of the building, so that here the sun can never penetrate. Neither does any pure air ever visit this habitation, on which descend drizzling damps and eternal fogs, to such excess that not an article of furniture can be placed beneath the roof but in four days it becomes covered with green mould. 
I leave you to judge in what manner such humanity must act upon the human frame, and to say everything in one word, the apartments are in general more like dungeons for the vilest criminals than suited to persons of a station far inferior to mine. Inasmuch as I do not believe there is a lord or gentleman, or even yeoman in the kingdom, who would patiently endure the penance of living in so wretched a habitation, with regard to accommodation, I have for my own person but two miserable little chambers, so intensely cold during the night, that but for the ramparts and entrenchments of tapestry and curtains, it would be impossible to prolong my existence. And for those who have set up with me during my illness, not one has escaped malady. For taking air and exercise, I have but a quarter of an acre behind the stables." To aggravate her miseries, a poor priest of her faith was hung before her window. These accounts are translated from her letters in French. She who is the glory of the Louvre and the pride of Holyrood was at last the neglected prisoner of a decaying hunting lodge in the midst of an English forest. Many conspiracies were formed and attempts made to release her and restore her to her throne. The chief of these was by the Duke of Norfolk, an English noble, and the most powerful subject in Europe. He proposed secretly for Mary's hand, and was assured that, though on general ground she was averse to another marriage, yet she would favor his project and his suit. For this he was on discovery in prison nine months in the Tower of London. When released, he set about his scheme with all the more determination. Spain and Rome were to aid his cause, the Duke of Alva to land with an army, the English Catholics to rise, and the government to be overturned. But a second discovery of his purpose sent him to the block. He died like a hero. Mary disclaimed all knowledge of his treasonable designs toward Elizabeth, though she admitted his efforts to release herself, and she was not therefore made to suffer on his account. Simple devotion to a lovely and suffering queen, and private ambition were not the only causes of disquiet in England. From whatever motive trouble was made, it inevitably seized upon Mary's fame as its rallying word. Hence, an association of nobles was formed and sanctioned by Parliament for the purpose of prosecuting to death any person for whom, as well as by whom, any movement against the government was set on foot. Never was there a more absurdly unjust course of procedure adopted. It became a law, and soon had occasion of execution against its real object, the Queen of Scots. In 1586, a new conspiracy was headed by Anthony Babington, a young man of wealth in Derbyshire who had heard much of Mary while he was at Paris. He was to be aided in the same manner as the Duke of Norfolk. Some letters passed between him and Mary, but there is no evidence of her initiation into the treasonable part of the plan. It was discovered. Fourteen of the leaders were executed, six of whom were pledged to assassinate the English Queen. Before the news had reached Mary, she was officially informed that she was to be held to trial as an accomplice. The nation was so greatly excited that Elizabeth saw that she might prudently go to any extremity against her admired prisoner. Mary denied the jurisdiction of another monarch over her, but as before, she was persuaded to submit to trial, lest a refusal be a tacit acknowledgment of guilt. The mockery of a court was held at Fotheringay Castle. In its great hall, with much pomp, the daughter of a hundred kings appeared, worn out with confinement and grief, but still resolute, calm, and discerning, before the greatest lawyers and politicians of the realm, and so ably answered their arguments that, on the testimony of her enemies who described the scene, she confounded her prosecutors. The old artifice was again used. The court was adjourned to a distance from her at Westminster, and there, of course, she was condemned. The shameless tyrant of England made a great show of reluctance to sign the death warrant, and waited to see what effect the verdict would have abroad. The King of France interposed feebly. The King of Scotland would have saved his mother, but was falsely counseled, and too timid, though now nineteen years of age. The warrant was signed, and the man to whom it was given was subsequently imprisoned for life on the hypocritical plea that he had received royal instructions not to have it executed. And the man who was the keeper of the doomed victim was enjoined by Elizabeth to secretly murder his prisoner before the sentence could be carried into effect, but he declined the wickedness. His name is Sir Amias Paulette, 
Mary requested that her servants might witness her constancy in death, and that her body might be buried according to the rites of her church, or carried to France. But no reply is known to have been made. On the afternoon of the 7th of February, 1587, the earls who were to carry out the sentence reached Mary's prison at Fotheringay. They respectfully disclosed their business. She heard them calmly as they read the death warrant. She expressed a cheerful willingness to die and made solemn oath on the Bible that she was innocent of the charge for which she was to suffer. She inquired about her son and the conditions of things abroad concerning which she had been kept in ignorance. When she found that the execution was to take place at eight o'clock the next morning, she manifested some emotion, but soon regained her serenity. From the first, however, her attendants, consisting of six waiting maids, a physician, surgeon, apothecary, and four male servants were extremely agitated and, when the lords retired, made great lamentations. She knelt with them and prayed. At supper, the last repast with her household, she ate lightly, conversed but little, looked smilingly, and drank the health of all around her calling them by name. Then she carefully disposed of all her money, furniture, and jewels, forgetting none of her friends near her or at a distance. After this, she wrote letters and her will, which occupied two large sheets, and is a fine memento of her strong and lucid intellect and of her noble heart. At two o'clock in the morning she retired to her bed, and rose at daybreak, gathered her little company of adherents, and continued in prayer, until a knock at the door announced the fated hour. No priest was allowed her, her attendants were forbidden to see her die, but on further entreaty four males and two females of these were permitted to accompany her. To Melville, the chief of her train, she said weeping, Tell my son that I thought of him in my last moments, and that I have never yielded either in word or deed to aught that might lead to his prejudice. Desire him to preserve the memory of his unfortunate parent and may he be a thousand times more happy and more prosperous than she has been. She perished in the room that had been the scene of her trial. A scaffold, carpeted with black, was at one end, and on it were two English earls and the executioners. Thither she was led, Melville bearing the train of her royal robe. She was dressed in state. She wore a gown of black silk bordered with crimson velvet, over which was a satin mantle. A long veil of white crepe stiffened with wire and edged with rich lace hung down almost to the ground. Round her neck was suspended an ivory crucifix. The ruins of her former stately and blooming self, she was still beautiful and dignified. The warrant of death was read aloud. She trembled not, nor changed her sublime tranquility of countenance. The Dean of Peterborough stepped forth from the two hundred spectators and soldiers and began to lecture her on points of doctrine. She turned from him, knelt, and prayed aloud for her enemies and for the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Rising, her veil and necklace were removed. The cross she was about to give to Jane Kennedy, but the executioner snatched it away as part of his customary spoils. Her eyes were bound with a gold-embroidered handkerchief, her head laid on the block, and from her lips breathed the words, O Lord, in thee have I hoped, and into thy hands I commit my spirit. Three awkward blows of the axe severed her neck. Her head was held up to the gaze of the dumb crowd. The executioner cried, God save Elizabeth, Queen of England. The Earl of Kent responded, Thus perish all her enemies. Her remains were left rolled up in old green bays taken from a billiard table afterwards buried with display in the Peterborough Cathedral, and finally, a quarter of a century afterward, placed in a splendid tomb at Westminster Abbey by her son James, who removed every vestige of the scene of her trial and death, Fotheringay Castle. Mary reached the age of forty-five years. Her active life was between the ages of sixteen and twenty-five. No queen ever possessed higher talents or virtues. Her faults were the noble ones of a warm, trustful heart and of ardent youth. She confided in the treacherous too often. She had not learned that there are always many persons utterly dead to every claim of reason, honor, and generosity. Reigning in maturer years, she would have vindicated her commanding intellect. 
As her enemies were often detestable in the face of their truer belief, so was she tolerant, deeply religious, and grandly upright in spite of her superstitious creed. Her character was frank and beautifully proportionate. Never would mere brilliancy of person and of mind have excited such glowing friendships, such bitter envies, such lasting admiration, and worldwide sympathy. End of section 31. Recording by Stacy Cologne, Fort Worth, Texas. Section 32 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 32. Catherine of Russia. Part 1. Why, I can smile and murder while I smile, and cry content to that which grieves my heart, and wet my cheek with artificial tears, and frame my face for all occasions. Shakespeare The long and conspicuous reign of Catherine the Second was one of great tragical interest, and signalized by memorable events. Her mind was subtle and vigorous, but it is impossible to regard her character with any other feelings than those of disgust and pity. She presented herself to the world under a mask of benevolence, sincerity, wisdom, and piety, beneath which lurked detestable hypocrisy, licentiousness, vanity, and an ambition that aspired to great actions and reforms for the sake of renown rather than the good of mankind. Anxious to outfigure her great predecessors in the eyes of posterity, she selected her historian, and charged him not to record the assistance of any one in the accomplishment of certain events, but to give the entire credit to her own wisdom and courage. She would have succeeding generations accept her as a model empress, she who began her reign with the secret assassination of three rightful heirs to the throne and ended it with the unjust and execrable division of Poland. In order to understand the steps by which she, a comparatively obscure princess, acquired the crown of the Russias, it is necessary to refer to the reign of her immediate predecessor. Elizabeth, the youngest daughter of Peter the Great, was proclaimed empress in 1741 by means of a revolt which deposed her cousin Anne and the infant Prince Ivan, for whom she acted as regent. The unfortunate Ivan was immured in the dungeon of Schlüsselburg, and his parents imprisoned in a fortress on the shores of the Arctic Ocean. Although Elizabeth was an amiable, gentle, beautiful woman, possessed of winning manners and a humanity that prompted her to take a vow, never to put a subject to death upon any provocation whatever, yet through the influence of favorites and the intoxication of unlimited power, her reign was marked by injustice and atrocious cruelties, and she became timid, weak, intemperate, and notoriously licentious. She selected for her successor, Peter, the son of her eldest sister. In order to have him under her immediate superintendence, she caused him to be brought from Holstein, where his education was progressing under the enlightened Brumner. By some strange caprice, she supplied him with a narrow-minded, illiterate tutor, and to prevent any revolution in his favor, kept him almost a prisoner, surrounded by spies and ignorant persons, who engaged him in amusements and frivolous occupations that assisted to suppress whatever talent and vigor or energy of character he possessed. Some estimable persons and ladies of the court at Petersburg remonstrated with the empress for her singular treatment of one who should be better fitted to occupy the throne. But she turned a deaf ear to their intercessions. One of her attendants ventured to suggest the evil that such an education was producing upon the character of the Grand Duke. If your majesty, said this courageous friend, 
do not permit the prince to know anything of what is necessary for governing the country, what do you think will become of him? And what do you think will become of the empire? Elizabeth, turning sternly to her attendant, said in a measured, threatening tone, Joanna, knowest thou the road to Siberia? These words were sufficient to silence future remonstrances. In 1747, Elizabeth determined to select a spouse for Peter. She was guided in her choice by the King of Prussia, who recommended a daughter of the Prince of Anhalt Zerbst. She was inclined to look favorably upon this alliance from the fact that she had once sincerely loved an uncle of the princess, and after his death resolved never to marry. Princess Sophia Augusta Frederica was born at Stettin, May 2, 1729. Her father was commander-in-chief in the Prussian service and governor of the town and fortress of Stettin. Her mother was a woman of distinguished beauty, prudence, and good sense. She took upon herself the education of Sophia, who received the familiar nickname of Fique among her companions. These were selected without reference to their rank, for her mother endeavored to cultivate the simplest manners to suppress pride, a predominant characteristic of Sophia, and to insist upon her respectfully saluting ladies of distinction who visited the house. Among her playfellows she invariably took the principal part, often bringing into exercise an imperious, commanding temper. She was educated in the Lutheran religion, was early instructed from the best authors, and was disposed to study and reflection. Her seclusion was occasionally varied by excursions and visits to Hamburg and Berlin, in company with her mother. These visits fitted her for an after-appearance at court. At the suggestion of the King of Prussia, the Princess of Zerbst repaired to Petersburg with her daughter, hoping, by means of Sophia's attractions and the reminiscences of Elizabeth's affection for her brother, to secure an alliance with Peter. They were cordially received by the Empress. The Grand Duke was quickly an admirer of the young princess who, now in her sixteenth year, added lively manners to an agreeable, if not handsome, face. She as readily regarded him favorably, for at this time his countenance was fresh, good-humored, and pleasing, and his person of good stature and finely formed. With such mutual good will, therefore, but little time was required to make and accept proposals of marriage. As a necessary preliminary, Sophia adopted the Greek religion, and received the name of Catherine Alexiana. Magnificent preparations were made for the approaching nuptials, but in the midst of this fair sailing, the Grand Duke was attacked with a violent fever, which soon divulged a malignant form of the smallpox. He recovered in a few weeks, but his face was for some time distorted and actually hideous with the marks of a disease which disfigured him for life. Catherine, who had been carefully kept in distant apartments, was prepared by her mother for the change in the appearance of her royal lover, and warned not to betray the aversion she might feel on seeing him, lest the fine air-castles they had been building should be blown away at a breath. Catherine promised to conceal her emotions, and, attired as becomingly as possible, was conducted to the presence of the Grand Duke. She played her part well. With consummate art she approached Peter in her usual lively and graceful way, threw her arms about his neck, and kissed his cheek, apparently with devoted affection. She had no sooner gained her own apartments, however, than she fell senseless, and remained unconscious for three hours. This extreme repugnance, which she had so successfully dissembled, did not interfere for a moment with the ambitious designs that already outweighed every other consideration. The marriage was accordingly solemnized in 1747. Catherine retained an outward show of affection and respect as long as she thought necessary, but she soon felt her decided superiority. Talented, accomplished, speaking several languages with facility, dignified and winning in her deportment, she easily and becomingly filled her distinguished position, while Peter, 
who had good sense and a kind, confiding heart, had been spoiled by a base education, lacked polish and intelligence, and blushed at his inferiority in the presence of his wife. He regarded her with pride, and admired the facility and fitness with which she acted the Grand Duchess. Determined to overrule and deprive him of the expected succession by placing the crown upon her own brow, she was easily induced to engage in the conspiracies formed against him by persons who preferred to see the ambitious Catherine upon the throne. Every possible means were taken to blacken the character of the Grand Duke in the eyes of Elizabeth. Slanderous reports were daily conveyed to her by one of her ladies of honor, who was engaged in the intrigues of the court. On one occasion, when she lamented the intemperate habits of the prince, the empress, shocked at this new charge, insisted she would not believe it till proved. The artful attendant took the first opportunity to dine with Peter, and by secretly putting an opiate in his wine, succeeded in prevailing upon him to unconsciously drink to excess. When he was sufficiently intoxicated, the deceitful woman hastened to call the empress. Bestyachev, the great chancellor, superintended these maneuvers by writing directions each day on scraps of paper, indicating the course of conduct each interested person was to pursue. These he enclosed in a snuff-box with a double bottom, and, under pretense of offering snuff, succeeded in conveying them to those for whom they were intended without observation. Soon after the marriage of Peter, the empress presented him with the palace of Oranienbaum, at some distance from Petersburg. There he preferred to remain, in freedom from his aunt's continual scrutiny and reproaches. For his amusement, he formed a guard of Holstein soldiers, and instructed them for several hours each day in the Prussian exercises. He also gathered about him those who had talent for music or the drama, besides a number of dissipated companions. Knowing his passion for imitating everything Prussian, they persuaded him to gamble, drink, and engage in other vices, assuring him that every officer in Prussia did the same. In the meantime, Catherine, wearied with the solitude of this country palace, and entertaining no affection for her husband, received the admiration of Soltikoff, the prince's chamberlain, a man of polished address and attractive appearance. Elizabeth soon heard the consequent scandal, and made her displeasure evident, though not fitted to reprove the misconduct for which she was notorious herself. By artful representations, Catherine was reinstated in her favor. But the Empress had frequent occasions to reprimand both of her belligerent wards, and seemed seriously to think of appointing Paul, the infant son of Catherine, her successor, with a regent to reign during his minority. Fearing this, Catherine assiduously applied herself to regaining the good will of the Empress, exalted herself in the eyes of the people by attending church daily with a devout air during the illness of the Empress, and assisted the intriguing party that favored her schemes by placing Peter in an odious light before the courtiers and the populace. At Elizabeth's death, which occurred early in 1762, in a fit of intoxication, she was made to repeat words of the attending priest that expressed affection for the Grand Duke and Duchess, and named them her successors. As soon as the royal message reached Peter, which commanded him to live long, the Russian form of announcing death, he passed in state through the streets of Petersburg, causing himself to be proclaimed emperor under the name of Peter the Third, Notwithstanding the contempt which the conspirators had sought to bring upon him, he was enthusiastically received by the people. He began his reign with popular measures. One of his first acts was to recall a multitude of state prisoners exiled to Siberia by the tyrannical and suspicious temper of Elizabeth. He took no revenge upon his enemies, permitted the nobility to travel abroad at their pleasure, and allowed them to join the military service or not as they chose. He also abolished the secret tribunal which had long been a terror to the Russians. 
every one was in transports of delight with the new emperor, who had suddenly become a wise, dignified, temperate prince. His affection for Catherine returned, and he treated her with the utmost kindness and attention, forgetting her unfaithfulness and coldness. She, however, withheld the advice and guidance she was capable of giving, and which Peter looked for. Wearied with her repulsive coldness and imperious harshness, surrounded by a deceitful court, with not a single friend to whom he could turn with confidence, and bewildered with cares for which his education and life had not prepared him, he returned to his vicious habits, unable, with his blunt perceptions, to detect or even suspect the conspiracies formed against him. In fact, he was too much engaged in plots of his own to perceive that any others were in progress. Jealous and suspicious of his wife, he had thoughts of displacing her and her heir, and naming for his successor Prince Ivan, who, for more than twenty years, had been immured in a dungeon. Peter secretly visited the unhappy prince, and soon after had him brought privately to Petersburg, and concealed in an obscure house. Catherine, whom Peter had dismissed to the palace of Peterhof, occupied her leisure and retirement in instigating and perfecting plots against the emperor, while she appeared to take no part of them. The Princess Dashkoff, then only eighteen, quick, witty, courageous, learned, and with remarkable talent for intrigue, remained at court, for the purpose of keeping Catherine informed of every circumstance that transpired. It was not only an attachment to the Empress that induced her to such a course, but jealousy towards a sister, who was the openly acknowledged favorite of the Emperor, and a base ambition to be the leader of a faction. The other principal personages were Count Panin, preceptor to the young prince, a man of obscure birth, and a character in which obstinacy and cunning were predominant. Gregory Orloff, Catherine's last lover, noted for courage and beauty, and his brother Alexei, both of them officers in the guards. Another, Cyril Razmanovsky, the hetman or commander of the Cossacks, having much influence at court, and possessed of immense wealth, besides being a favorite among the troops, was an important assistant. By the secret machinations of all these haughty heads put together, the conspiracy was ripe for execution. Peter the Third, who was nearly ready to put himself at the head of a waiting army, destined to war against Denmark, was to be seized on his arrival at Peterhof, where he expected to celebrate a festival previous to his departure for Denmark. He was now engaged in revels at his country palace of Oranienbaum. Catherine, meanwhile, lived in daily fear and unendurable anxiety, lest her schemes should be discovered. Even her dreams were haunted with guilty terrors. She frequently paced the floor of her apartments half the night, for sleep fled from her frightened eyelids. An unexpected occurrence hastened the execution of the conspirators' designs. Pasek, a lieutenant in the guards, had gained the soldiers of his company. One of them, supposing nothing was done without the concurrence of the captain, innocently asked him on what day they were to take up arms against the emperor. The captain concealed his surprise, and cunningly drew from the unsuspecting soldier the whole secret. Pasek was immediately arrested and put under guard, but he managed to write hastily upon a slip of paper, "'Proceed to execution this instant, or we are undone,' and gave it to a spy." who hurried it to the Princess Dashkoff. She quickly informed the conspirators, and though late at night, she assumed man's apparel and went out to meet them upon an unfrequented bridge where their plans were quickly formed. The Empress had vacated the palace at Peterhof to leave the apartments free for the festival. She occupied a summer house in the garden of the palace, at the extremity of which was a canal connected with the Neva, that gave private access to the gardens by means of a small boat fastened there. Catherine was sleeping here at midnight when she was suddenly aroused and beheld a soldier standing at her bedside. "'Your Majesty has not a moment to lose. 
get ready to follow me, said he. Terrified and astonished, the empress arose, called her attendant Ivanovna, and dressed in haste. The soldier returned for them. They followed him to a carriage that stood waiting, and found Alexey Orlov, impatient for their appearance. The empress and her maid were placed in the vehicle. Alexey took the reins and set off at full speed for Petersburg, twenty miles distant. Suddenly the horses stopped and fell down, and no efforts of Alexey and his companion could urge them on. Their danger was every moment increasing. It was still night, and several miles were yet to be traversed. The empress was finally obliged to leave the carriage, and they resolved to pursue their way on foot. Impatient to reach the city, and filled with terror, they fled rather than walked along the road, not knowing what moment they might be pursued. They had not gone far before they met a light country cart. Alexey Orlov seized the poor peasant's horses, and the empress and her maid sprang into the rough vehicle. Leaving the owner standing aghast in the middle of the road, they sped away to the capital. Catherine, worn out with fatigue and excitement, arrived at seven in the morning, but without taking rest, proceeded to the quarter of the soldiers. Seeing but few who issued from the barracks with clamorous greeting, she hesitated a moment, trembling. An instant's thought suggested a deception by which to gain the whole detachment. In a speech, she assured them that the Tsar, her husband, had attempted to murder her and her son that very night. She had just escaped, and now threw herself on their protection. The incensed soldiers, believing what she said, swore to defend her. The cry of, Long live the Empress Catherine, went up with enthusiastic demonstrations. The Orloffs secured a like reception from their regiments, and no one dared to stop the singular proceedings except Villebois, general of the artillery, who attempted to remonstrate. Catherine turned round, and, in an imperious tone, demanded what he intended to do. Confused and confounded with her commanding manner, he could only stammer out, "'To obey your majesty!' and immediately delivered the arsenals and magazines of the city into her hands. It had required but two hours to accomplish this feat, and, without bloodshed, Catherine saw herself surrounded by two thousand warriors, besides the inhabitants of Petersburg, who imitated the movements of the soldiers. In the afternoon she repaired to the church of Kafen, where the archbishop of Novgorod, in sacerdotal robes, accompanied by numerous priests wearing long beards, was ready to receive her at the altar. He placed the crown upon her head, proclaimed her the sovereign of the Russias as Catherine the Second, and the Grand Duke Paul Petrovich her successor. The shouts of the multitude who crowded the church were hushed by the chant of the Te Deum that solemnly swelled above the vast assemblage. The ceremony concluded the empress repaired to the palace that had been occupied by Elizabeth, and for several hours received the crowds who thronged the apartments to take the oath of allegiance. The Chancellor Varensov, father of the Princess Dashkov, but a firm adherent to the emperor's cause, ventured to warn Catherine of the danger to which she exposed herself. She replied with insulting impudence and hypocritical innocence, "'You see how it is?' I cannot really do otherwise. I am only yielding to the ardent sensibility of the nation. The Chancellor was attended to his own house by a guard. At six in the evening, Catherine, crowned with oak leaves and with a sword in her hand, mounted her horse, and accompanied by Princess Dashkov and the Hetman Razmunovsky, placed herself at the head of the troops at Petersburg and went out to meet those who were encamped at a distance, in order to secure their adherence before Peter should command their attendance upon himself. During all these rapid and singular movements, Peter the Third, in unsuspecting ignorance, set out for the expected festivities of Peterhof, with the ladies and courtiers who had been reveling at his palace at Oranienbaum. While riding gaily along the road to Peterhof, 
they were met by one of Catherine's attendants, who said the empress had escaped and was nowhere to be found. Peter, confounded and unbelieving, hastened to the palace, searched the apartments, fled from one place to another in the greatest fright, questioned all whom he met, but was unable to solve the mystery. While all about him were filled with gloomy forebodings, a countryman rode rapidly up to the group, made a profound inclination of the body, and without uttering a word, drew from the bosom of his caftan a sealed note, and presented it to the emperor. This revealed the occurrences at Petersburg, and his wife's duplicity. The terror of the emperor increased every moment, but the tears of the women about him, and the advice of his young courtiers, availed him nothing. Munich, whom he had released from exile in Siberia, presented himself, and suggested the only practicable course to pursue, telling him to put himself at the head of such troops as were left, and march to Petersburg, where the sight of the emperor might effect a counter-revolution. But the news that Catherine, with her army, was already marching towards Peterhof, so frightened the cowardly emperor that he accepted the last advice of Munich, threw himself into a yacht, precipitately followed by the weeping women and unmanly courtiers, and went to Kronstadt, an important port in the Gulf of Finland, which Munich knew would afford him ample means of defense if the inhabitants and garrison still adhered to the emperor's cause. Catherine had been too quick for them. They no sooner arrived in port than the sentinels cried out, "'Who comes there?' "'The emperor,' was the reply." "'Long live the Empress Catherine!' rang out from the soldiers, who threatened to sink the yacht if they did not put off in an instant. Munich entreated Peter to spring upon shore, and all might yet be his. But, like a terrified child, he ran into the cabin and hid himself among the terrified women. Nothing could be done but row the infatuated imbecile prince back to Oranienbaum. End of section 32。section 33 of the heroines of history。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by christine h。the heroines of history by john s jenkins。section 33 。Catherine of Russia, Part Two. Here he wrote a letter to the Empress, promising submission and acknowledging his misconduct. She deigned him no answer, but with her army approached his palace. At first he ordered a horse, intending to fly to the frontiers of Poland, but, always irresolute, he changed his plan and directed his fortress to be dismantled and his Holstein guard to retire to a distance that Catherine might be touched by his entire surrender. She caused him to be seized, however, and placed in close confinement till he wrote and signed a declaration that he was not capable of reigning, and that he voluntarily abdicated the throne. Even this did not serve to secure his liberty. The same night he was conducted by a strong guard to Ropecha, a small imperial palace, about fourteen miles from Petersburg. In despair at his sad prospects of imprisonment, he sent a message to Catherine, entreating her to send an old negro buffoon who had often amused him, a favorite dog, his violin, a Bible, and a few romances. She maintained a scornful silence. Catherine had been crowned empress. She had published a manifesto, declaring her motives to have been a tender love for her people, and anxiety for the preservation of the holy Greek religion. She had used every means to beguile and deceive the troops, who were necessary to her success. But she still felt insecure. She was alarmed at the murmurings and resistance of various distant towns and cities, which would have declared for Peter the Third had he succeeded in presenting himself before them. A career of guilt, once commenced, leads to manifold crimes. Probably Catherine, in her first design of seizing the throne, 
had no thought of imbruing her hands in the blood of those who, as descendants of Peter the Great, and rightful heirs to the throne, were revered in the eyes of the people. Harassed by constant fears of insurrection, and unwilling to resign what she had so dexterously grasped, she listened to the whispered suggestions of the fiendish courtiers who had thus far assisted her, and connived at, or at least did not prevent, the assassination of Peter the Third, in order to remove one so obnoxious to her repose. This act was accomplished with such secrecy and deception that the emperor's disappearance long remained a mystery, though no one hesitated to cast suspicion on Catherine. The revolting details have since been revealed. Alexey Orloff, noted for his strength and brutality, undertook with two companions the execution of the deed. Seven days after the empress had been crowned, which occurred June 28, 1762, Alexey repaired to the palace where Peter was confined, and, as he had often done before, dined with the emperor. Lieutenant Pasek, who was present, assisted him in introducing poison into the wine poured out for Peter. The unsuspecting emperor drank freely, and presently was seized with violent pain. Recognizing the design, he called for milk to allay his sufferings, and mingling his cries of agony with reproaches. They again pressed him to swallow more of the fatal beverage, but he resisted with all his strength. His valet, hearing the noise, rushed in. Peter threw himself in his arms, exclaiming faintly, "'It was not enough to deprive me of the throne of Russia. I must now be murdered!' The valet attempted to defend him, but Orloff, with his giant strength, easily thrust him from the room, and returned to his victim. The emperor fought with the strength of despair, but after a fierce and terrible struggle he was thrown to the floor, and strangled with a napkin snatched from the dinner-table. Alexey Orloff immediately mounted his horse and rode at full speed to Petersburg to inform the empress. On his arrival he found her just going to make her appearance at court. She maintained her composure, ease, and usual gaiety, dined in public, and in the evening again held a court. The following day, while she was dining with the foreign ministers and a few courtiers, a messenger was ushered in with great ceremony, and announced the tidings of the emperor's death. Catherine immediately arose from table, and with her handkerchief at her eyes, hastened to shut herself in her own apartments, where she remained for several days, as if overwhelmed with sorrow. During that time, she caused a manifesto to be published which, after mentioning his illness, declared that, in obedience to the divine command by which we are enjoined to preserve the life of our neighbor, we ordered that Peter should be furnished with everything that might be judged necessary to restore his health. It also expressed her great affliction. But despite this fabric of falsehoods, and Catherine's artful assumption of grief, no one was so stupid as to believe what she asserted, though no one dared say a word upon the matter, and that was all the Empress wished. The remains of Peter were brought to the capital, and buried with great pomp. Her next movement was to send Ivan back to prison, and at the same time she gave orders to put him to death, if any attempt was made to deliver him. There were many who sympathized with the unfortunate prince, fated to spend a lifetime, from infancy to manhood, in dungeons and fortresses, where he was subjected to every manner of suffering. Ivan is described as having fine light hair, regular features, an extremely fair complexion, a figure of commanding height and fine proportions, and a voice sweet and touchingly mournful in its accents. A conspiracy was set on foot to rescue him and place him upon the throne, headed by an officer named Mirovich, who forced his way into the fortress of Schlüsselburg, where Ivan was confined, determined to deliver him. The guards immediately assassinated the defenseless prince and flung his body before Mirovich, who immediately threw down his sword and surrendered, 
all who were engaged in this conspiracy were imprisoned, knouted, or sent to Siberia. Catherine, now relieved of those who could cause her the most uneasiness, turned her attention to measures which would secure the applause of her subjects and give her the fame she was ambitious to gain abroad. She no longer needed the services of the Princess Dashkoff, who had become odious to her, notwithstanding her sacrifices of family and of herself in the cause of her friend. Catherine was not capable of friendship. She made tools of those whom she flattered with her confidence. Princess Dashkoff, in the beginning of the revolution, had put on the uniform of the guards, and now asked, as a recompense for her services, the title of colonel of a regiment. To this the Empress scornfully replied that, the academy would suit her better than a military corps. The princess resented her ingratitude, and spoke of it among her friends, with the bold independence natural to her. But for such imprudence she was ordered to retire to Moscow. The Archbishop of Novgorod, who had also materially assisted in Catherine's designs, was disappointed in his expected reward, and dismissed with a warning as to how he vented his rage. These and similar occurrences caused discontent and irritation among the people, which took so serious a turn that it was thought for a time Catherine would be hurled from the throne she had usurped. But her courage and presence of mind never forsook her. She inflicted such terrible punishments upon the ringleaders as effectively prevented any farther demonstrations of dissatisfaction. Among the first acts of her reign was the confirmation of the two principal edicts of her predecessor, which had given him such popularity at his accession. But she took good care to appropriate all the credit to herself. With a policy that consulted the low state of the finances, she also ratified the treaties that had been made with Denmark and Prussia. By thus securing peace, she was enabled to turn her attention to the improvement and aggrandizement of Russia. She instituted many wise and admirable regulations that secured the highest encomiums from other nations, though it is said she was undeserving her celebrity as a lawgiver, since her famous code consisted of a tissue of paragraphs taken principally from Montesquieu's Esprit de Loi and Beccaria's Treatise on Crime and Punishment and other well-known writers. She laid claim to her code as having originated it herself and complacently received the adulations of all Europe. She certainly deserves credit, however, for her energy and skill in devising and prosecuting arrangements for the founding of colleges and hospitals on a grand scale in the principal cities, for the establishment of a foundling and lying-in hospital under the most benevolent and salutary regulations, and for the magnificent seminaries she endowed at Petersburg, one for the education of five hundred young ladies, the other a military school for young men, both of which are still the pride of Petersburg. She also invited foreigners from every country, whether professional or scientific men, artisans, mechanics, or common laborers, an invitation which quickly populated the deserts of Russia with a host who loudly murmured their discontent after they arrived and regretted their foolishness in abandoning better homes. All this and more was accomplished in the first year and a half of Catherine's reign. She added to her own reputation abroad for sagacity and wisdom by assisting at all the deliberations of the councils, read the dispatches from her ambassadors, dictated or wrote the answers, and attended to all the minutiae of foreign affairs. She often had interviews with Munich, who suggested to her the plan of driving the Turks from Constantinople, and with Bestuchev, a man of profound policy, who had the experience of Grand Chancellor in Elizabeth's reign, and who kept Catherine informed of the politics and resources of the European courts. In her interviews with foreign ministers, she assured them of her independence and courage, told them the world must not judge of her yet, that she had scarcely begun her reign, and would surprise Europe in time with her great exploits, 
and assured them she should behave with the princes of other nations like a finished coquette. But in the midst of all her occupations, the empress did not forget her old favorites, or neglect to find new ones. In this she imitated the profligate example of Elizabeth. Gregory Orloff, brother of Alexei, she seemed to entertain a sincere affection for, although he did not unite polished manners with beauty of person. He was ambitious, and hoped the empress would give him her hand, and thus elevate him to the dignity of a sovereign. Catherine would only consent to a concealed marriage, but that was not sufficient for the haughty but low-born Gregory. Fearful she would degrade her rank by marrying a man whom everyone detested, her turbulent subjects concocted new conspiracies. While on a visit to Moscow, Catherine discovered one of these plots, and, alarmed for her safety, returned immediately to Petersburg, entering that city with a pompous and magnificent display, which she intended should awe the disaffected. She believed that the Princess Dashkoff influenced some of these intrigues, and determined to conceal the dislike she bore her, and invited her to court again. She wrote a flattering and deceitful letter, asking her knowledge of the conspiracies, which was not calculated, however, to blind the quick-witted princess, who had too much occasion to know Catherine's artfulness to trust her words. To the long and affectionate letter of the empress, the wounded friend replied with daring haughtiness in a few words, Madam, wrote she, I have heard nothing, but if I had heard anything, I should take good care how I spoke of it. What is it you require of me, that I should expire on a scaffold? I am ready to mount it. Catherine was chagrined at this display of spirit, but did not take revenge, and left the princess in disgrace to travel about Europe. She everywhere attracted attention by her singular and bold manners. After her anger towards the empress had subsided, she returned to Russia, and Catherine, thinking it best to conciliate one so cognizant of her crimes, appointed her president of the academy. Here she presided with the whims and temper of a virago, deprived the professors of fuel in winter from avaricious motives, and commanded them as she would have done a regiment of soldiers. Wrapped in rich furs, she seated herself in the midst of the shivering professors, dictating to them what they knew better than she, till they were tempted to abandon the country where the empress was content to have but the shell of science and literature, without the colonel. Renown was Catherine's sole aim. For that, she continued to endow colleges and academies of science and art, which often proceeded no further than the selection of a site, or, if they were built, rarely afforded anything besides opportunities for grand and bombastic speeches from the empress. She encouraged the arts, inviting artists to her court, and paid most extravagant prices for pictures, though without the least taste to judge of their merits or defects. Her end was accomplished, however, so long as the recipients of her generous encouragement sounded her fame. Many of the pictures decorated the walls of her palace, being fitted together without frames, so as to cover on each side the whole of the walls, without the slightest attention to disposition or general effect. When a place could not conveniently be filled, the pictures were cut to suit the vacancy. Catherine prided herself upon the generosity of her gifts to those who visited her court, and to those who performed important services. She maintained a magnificence in her movements and decorations that exceeded all the courts of Europe, and added to the glory of her achievements by founding cities as well as colleges, which those who visited her vainly looked for. Many of them were never to be found, for the very good reason that she was satisfied to designate a site, give a name, and see it swell the list of her boasted cities, though it after all existed only in her imagination. Joseph the Second once accompanied her to lay the foundations of a new city. On his return he dryly remarked, The Empress and I have this day achieved a great work. She has laid the first stone of a great city, and I have laid the last. He was just in his surmise, 
the city can nowhere be found except upon some of the maps of russia while thus engaged at home she did not neglect to increase her power abroad poland for many years had gradually extended its possessions by the intermarriage of polish princesses with the heirs of royal domains in russia catherine therefore in a measure ruled the election of kings in that republic upon the death of augustus the third she contrived partly by the force of arms and partly by cunning policy to secure the election of one of her old favorites count poniasowski a man who is described as having but small capacity to govern rather weak than gentle possessing a mind that was better calculated to shine in social intercourse than to sway men of cultivation tall well made of a figure at once commanding and agreeable he could more skilfully play the lover than the courtier he was rather forced upon than accepted by the poles who loudly murmured at the accession of one who was neither distinguished by birth nor any brilliant achievements soon after his election difficulties commenced in poland which by causing innumerable divisions of parties weakened and exposed it to the rapacious robbery of russia and prussia in fifteen sixty three a law had been passed which granted equal rights to all religious persuasions whether greek lutheran or catholic in seventeen sixty three however the catholics had obtained a decided superiority and excluded from the diets all those who did not adopt their faith this occasioned serious contention the various parties received the name of dissidents and applied to russia for assistance in claiming their rights catherine sent an army under the command of prince repuin who immediately seized the principal persons in the diet and exiled them to siberia the king himself through the instigation of orloff was treated with great indignity prince repuin commanded like a despot in warsaw and the poles began to be amazed at the dangerous assistance they had sought and beheld their country overrun with russian soldiery from whom they had no power to extricate themselves they could only submit to the terms the empress chose to grant them she already proposed the recovery of those parts of poland which had been annexed from russia but her plans were not yet fully formed she contented herself for a few years to use her domineering influence over a nation that she was in honor bound to protect and not to oppress in seventeen sixty eight turkey declared war against russia in consequence of the oppression of poland the latter suffering all the horrors of a war partly civil partly religious and partly foreign and its haughty brave nobles unwilling to brook the outrages of russia applied to turkey for relief catherine with undaunted courage accepted the challenge prepared an army and powerful fleets and speedily sent them against her enemies while they gained victories along the danube the pruth and sailed triumphant on the yuxin catherine was occupied at home in vast preparations to attack them even in the isles of greece her dockyards were filled with workmen who busily constructed ships of war her cities resounded with the clang of metal moulded and shaped into death-dealing weapons by the hands of skilful artisans her politicians were engaged in exciting debates as to the expediency of the undertaking her foreign ministers and emissaries were directed to secure the non-interference of other nations and permission to enter their ports her fleets were manned not only by the most experienced officers of her own empire but notable englishmen danes and dutch were enlisted in her service admiral spiridoff commanded the fleet but he and all the armies were under the orders of alexey orloff who had been appointed general while these fleets and armies were sweeping victoriously through the archipelago and harassing the borders of the turkish empire catherine always industrious in intrigues kept up a secret correspondence with frederick of prussia pertaining to poland they mediated the partition of that nation an interview however was necessary to perfect the design 
unwilling that other monarchs should discover their infamous intentions, and knowing their motives could not be concealed if an ostentatious visit was made by either party, they decided to resort to stratagem. Prince Henry, the brother of Frederick, received instructions to go to Russia with full powers to concert the desired measures with the Empress. It was given out that he intended making a visit to his sister, Queen of Sweden, and should return to Prussia by way of Denmark. While at Stockholm, he received pressing invitations from Catherine to visit her at Petersburg, in which she expressed her anxiety to entertain so illustrious a prince. As if it had not all been managed beforehand, Henry expressed unexpected pleasure, and with an apparent change of his plans, set out for Petersburg, accompanied by a brilliant suite. He was received with flattering attentions by the minister, Count Penin, and conducted in great state to the palace prepared for him. The first day of his arrival was passed with the most ceremonious etiquette, after which a series of entertainments were given that in magnificence outdid all the courts of Europe. One of these entertainments was given at the summer palace called Zarskoselo. It was situated at a distance of twenty-four versts, or sixteen miles, from Petersburg, in an open country, diversified with low, picturesque hills and forests. The road to it was lighted by more than a thousand lamps, and every verst marked by a column of marble, jasper, or granite. All along there were views of elegant country seats and gardens, Gothic palaces with their lofty towers and turrets, Chinese temples crested upon high artificial rocks, villages built in the same style, fanciful bridges, and every other device by which the route could be made attractive and enchanting. The palace itself was immense and dazzling. Within and without were profuse gilded ornaments. Every portion of the interior was fitted up in the richest and costliest style. The extensive gardens were ornamented by artificial lakes dotted with charming wooded islands, from one of which rose a Turkish mosque, from another an elegant structure for musical performances, while from others shot up tall columns or Egyptian pyramids, miniature towns and villages, a hermitage, superb baths and picturesque ruins, completed this luxurious resort that, springing up in the midst of the bleak deserts of Russia, was the realization of a Titania's kingdom. To this magnificent and showy palace the Empress conducted Prince Henry in an immense sledge, followed by two thousand others containing a great number of ladies and the nobility, all in masks and fancy dresses. The ornaments along the road consisted of some novel display at every verst, fireworks in every possible variety and unimagined beauty, houses built to represent the style of different nations and enlivened with people dressed in corresponding costumes, shepherds and shepherdesses exhibiting national dances, and, at a little distance from the palace, an artificial volcano representing an eruption of Mount Vesuvius. The festivities at the palace were equally ingenious and startling. At table, everything was arranged with such magician-like effect that when one wished to change his plate, he had but to tap the center, and it fell through the table and floor, and was immediately replaced by another that came up by the same means, replenished with whatever he desired. End of section 33section 34 of the heroines of history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by christine h the heroines of history by john s jenkins section 34 catherine of russia part 3 by such displays Catherine sought to amuse her royal guest, and blind her subjects and the world at large, as to the secret purpose which all this show successfully masked. Henry looked on without appearing to be in the least diverted. He maintained a sober and dignified bearing, 
looking on the frivolous and expensive sports as mere child's play, but covered his disdain under an air of abstracted indifference. His dress and appearance occasioned infinite amusement to the Russians. His hair was worn in a high toupee, and his apparel sometimes consisted of a light blue frock with silver frogs, a red waistcoat, and blue breeches. In his interviews with Catherine, their disguised intentions were cautiously discussed. They decided upon the dismemberment of Poland, and Henry went so far as to assign to Austria, Turkey, Prussia, and Russia the spoils which should fall to the share of each. Catherine promised to frighten Turkey and flatter England into acquiescence. Said she, Do you take upon you to buy over Austria, that she may amuse France? Thus did this unscrupulous monarch devise and carry out a robbery, with as hypocritical and innocent a face as had carried her through the connived assassination of her husband. The treaty, however, was not signed for some years. Soon after Henry's departure, early in 1771, Count Alexei Orloff returned from his victories, laden with triumphant laurels, which fixed upon him the eyes of all Russia. He received honors and titles from his sovereign, and in the succeeding festivities resigned his giant strength to the ease and repose of courtly luxury. His ferocity, cruelty, and coarseness of manner were better fitted for the horrors of war than the refinement and etiquette of court. His huge arm knew better how to strike the assassin's blow than to shield the unfortunate. His soul was in its most grateful element when reveling in the consciousness of a victim's torment. At his request, Catherine provided him with ample means to prosecute his conquests in the archipelago. He left Petersburg, loaded with assurances of the favor of the empress, and went to join the squadron prepared for him at Leghorn. While in Italy, he executed a commission from the empress, requiring two pictures to be painted in representation of the burning of the Turkish fleet in the previous expedition. Orloff did not hesitate to have a score of ships in the harbor set on fire or blown up, in order that the painter might do justice to his subject. He had another commission from Catherine, which he performed with equal villainy. She had reason to fear the entire downfall of her throne as long as any descendants of Peter the Great existed. One remained, upon whom her eye was fixed. With her usual secrecy and false-heartedness, she laid a snare for the fair and unsuspecting girl whose shadow was a hateful ghost in the pathway of the guilty empress. The empress Elizabeth, by a clandestine marriage with Razumovsky, had three children, the youngest a girl, named Princess Tarakanov, and protected by the Polish prince Radzivill. He conveyed her to Rome, where she had been educated and kept in seclusion under the care of a watchful governess. Alexei Orloff succeeded in ferreting out her concealment, and by the most devoted attention and deceitful representations, won the affections of the princess, and obtained her consent to a marriage. The ceremony was performed by villains in the disguise of priests. The innocent and confiding Tarakanov, believing him to be her veritable husband, accompanied him to Pisa, where a sumptuous palace was prepared for her reception. He was constantly at her side, in order to prevent anyone from instilling suspicion into her mind. She accepted his attentions as proof of his affection, and returned it with a fond tenderness that with her youth and beauty would have swerved any heart but his from its cruel purpose. Several days passed in festivities, when the princess asked to see the Russian fleet, that was soon to convey away the count. He was delighted to gratify her, and accordingly she was escorted to a boat, prepared with magnificent awnings to receive her, and accompanied by a suite of ladies and several Russian officers, put off from the shore in the midst of enthusiastic shouts and lively strains of music. Arrived at one of the principal ships, a splendid chair was lowered that she might, without inconvenience, be conveyed on board. 
amused with the novelty she stepped gaily on deck but was immediately seized and handcuffed tears and entreaties were unavailing in vain she supplicated at the feet of her betrayer she was torn away and carried a prisoner down into the hold and the following day conveyed to russia catherine gave secret orders to confine her in the fortress of petersburg and it was afterwards surmised that she was drowned in her dungeons by the rising of the waters of the river that rolled at the foot of the tower walls but her fate remained one of the whispered mysteries of the russian court in seventeen seventy one an event occurred which took the russians by surprise and cast an odium upon catherine's administration that nothing could efface the inhabitants of a province lying on the volga north of astrakhan were driven to desperation by the cruelty and injustice of the governor placed over them they were a peaceful hospitable people originally from chinese tartary and until within a few years had preserved their independence their religion and customs continued unchanged they roamed about the steppes with their usual aversion to permanent dwellings and also from the necessity of furnishing herbage for their hordes of cattle much oppression from the emissaries of the empress and an unheard-of indignity offered to a venerable old man greatly beloved by his tribe so incensed them that they resolved to abandon the russian dominions and return to their ancient possessions at the foot of the mountains of tibet a report was also circulated among them that a revered kalmuk priest who died three years before had sent them a message in the name of their gods to take possession of their ancient territories they obeyed and in a well-ordered march went secretly and silently on their perilous journey an immense troop with their wives children and servants hordes of cattle goods of every description tents and household utensils so noiseless had been their departure that no intimation of it whatever reached petersburg till they had gained two days march catherine immediately sent troops to arrest the fugitives but they searched in vain through the bleak deserts till suffering from thirst and hunger in these unwatered barren and depopulated regions they were obliged to abandon the unavailing pursuit the chinese emperor received and protected his children and when the exasperated empress demanded him to deliver up her runaway subjects he scornfully refused to comply and daringly commented on her tyranny this catherine never could forgive she was used to conciliatory language from all the nations of europe and this bold defiance and the dictatorial tone he used on several occasions inspired her with a hatred that would not permit china to be favorably mentioned in her presence upon her application for a renewal of the treaty regarding commerce between the two nations he provokingly replied to her envoys let your mistress learn to keep old treaties and then it will be time enough to apply for new ones catherine could only dissemble her mortification and anger she had not the means to punish him for his audacity whatever were her inclinations the war with turkey her policy in regard to poland and the equipment of extensive fleets had exhausted her treasury peace however was declared in seventeen seventy four which ceded to catherine several provinces and gave her vessels the free navigation of the black sea and the archipelago this opened an immense source of commerce and wealth to her empire marshal romansoff her greatest general received the glory of the triumphs on the borders of turkey and alexey orloff was showered with honors for his victories in the archipelago though the credit given the latter was entirely due to the skill of the english admirals elphinstone grieg and dugdale while all these events were progressing catherine was employed at home in improving and enriching her cities and public works canals connecting the several rivers in and near petersburg were embanked with granite sumptuous bridges were thrown across them magnificent palaces were built and public offices sprang up without number while close beside them were squalid hovels 
with the most wretched occupants, and in front ran streets filled with mire and dirt. Catherine, in her palace, was the same intriguing, deceitful woman she had been in the beginning of her reign. Profligate, fitful, and tyrannical, she changed her favorites as readily as her mask, lavishing the most costly gifts upon them at one moment, and the next moment sending them into exile. She seemed to retain an affection for Gregory Orloff. She created him a prince, but Count Panin, her minister and governor of the Grand Duke Paul Petrovich, constantly employed his influence against the complete ascendancy of Orloff. Count Panin occupied the most important posts in the empire and continued to retain them until his death. His prosperity was probably owing more to Catherine's reliance upon his integrity than any brilliant talents she may have imagined him to possess. The admission of a new favorite, Potemkin, who gained complete rule over Catherine, drove both Panin and Orloff to despair. Count Panin absented himself from court, and, it is said, died from chagrin and grief at the loss of his influence. Gregory Orloff died in the same year, 1783, at Moscow, in a state of frightful insanity. The loss of a young and beautiful wife, whom he regarded with the tenderest love, occasioned a melancholy that was deeply aggravated by the loss of the Empress' favor. His last days were spent in the ravings of delirium. He imagined that the ghost of Peter the Third was continually pursuing him with avenging darts. Thus Catherine was relieved from the presence of two men who had assisted in elevating her to the throne, and whose dangerous possession of her secrets gave them a fearful hold over her that she was glad to shake off. Paul Petrovich was Penin's most sincere mourner. He really loved his preceptor, and with the greater strength, because his affections were driven from every object upon which he would have centered them by his tyrannical mother. She kept him under continual surveillance, and concealed him from the public eye as completely as possible, fearful of the affection entertained for him by the people, and dreading a revolution which might place him upon his rightful throne. Although arrived at manhood, he was never allowed to enter the army, or even to visit a fleet. His travels were limited, his movements closely watched and strictly reported, and Catherine always provided him with an escort of her own choosing. She condescended to select him a wife, but took good care to find one who would be too simple to engage in intrigues. He was married to a daughter of the Landgrave of Hesse-Darmstadt, as was the custom, she adopted the Greek religion and received the name of Natalia Alexierna. The empress had reason afterwards to suspect her of engaging in political plots, and her death, which occurred a year or two after she became Grand Duchess, cast another dark imputation upon Catherine. She was scarcely cold in her grave before the empress selected a new spouse for her son. A niece of the King of Prussia became the consort of the Grand Duke, under the name of Maria Feodorovna, and with him ascended the throne twenty years afterwards. As the kings and princes of various nations had successively visited the court of Petersburg, Catherine thought she could no longer deny a return of these distinctions in permitting the Grand Duke and his bride to visit some of the courts of Europe. She confided them to the care of one of her sworn creatures, and had dispatches daily brought her by a courier, giving a minute account of everything that transpired. While at Paris, the people were more struck with Paul's excessive ugliness than anything else. One day at the Tuileries, Louis the Sixteenth asked him if he had any person in his suite who was particularly attached to him. Paul replied, with a significance which was understood by the courtiers. If my mother thought that I had but a dog belonging to me that loved me, tomorrow it would be flung into the Seine with a stone around its neck. He was just feeling the bitterness of having a friend exiled to Siberia for life for the offense of writing to him on account of the transactions at Petersburg during his absence. It was truly a magnanimous trait in Catherine, 
that she permitted her son to exist at all. Orloff and Penin were entirely forgotten in the brilliant reign of the favorite who had supplanted them. Potemkin was a most extraordinary man, and it was his caprices, his intense imagination, that was forever devising some unheard-of scheme, and his audacity that secured the ascendancy he obtained over Catherine as her favorite, her confidant, and her minister. The most opposite qualities were united in him. At one moment he was generous, at another avaricious, active yet indolent, timid and bold, condescending and haughty, politic and indiscreet, unread yet able to astonish a scholar, an artist, artisan, or divine in conversation, promising everything but rarely performing, always chasing after some gigantic plan which he spurned in disgust when attained. Altogether he was a freak of nature, and embodied all the good and bad qualities of man, without reason or conscience to guide him. At one moment he announced his intention of becoming king of Poland, and at the next threatened to turn monk. One day he would call all the principal officers to his presence and talk of war. The next begin a series of magnificent entertainments without the least cause. He would throw all the cabinets of Europe in a ferment by his purpose of partitioning some empire and laugh at them at his leisure while indolently reclining among a company of ladies. Distinguished officers attended him in the capacity of servants, and he would not hesitate to dispatch one of them more than a thousand miles for a certain kind of soup that could only be made at Petersburg. Think of an officer riding thirteen hundred miles at the speed of life and death to bear a tureen of soup to his master. It was these imperious whims, his energetic will, and defiance of every obstruction to what he took it in his head to accomplish, that secured Catherine's favor. She trusted her armies to his generalship, but her historian significantly suggests, it is not to be inferred from thence that all went on well, but all went on, and the empress desired nothing more. It was in compliance with his persuasions that Catherine was induced to visit Crimea and the other provinces that had been ceded to Russia in the treaty with the Turkish emperor. In the beginning of 1787, she left Petersburg in grand state, accompanied by all the ladies of her suite, her favorite aide-de-camp, Momonov, the French and Austrian ambassadors, all enveloped in costly furs and seated in spacious sledges, by which they were conveyed with lightning rapidity over the ice and snow. Immense fires, kindled along the roads, created artificial day. At every post was an ample relay of fresh horses, and when requiring repose, they stopped at palaces built for the occasion, which equaled those at Petersburg in splendor. Here the Empress held entertainments and feasted her flatterers, while, without, poor peasants were assembled to gaze in silent wonder upon the magic structure, shivering and pinched in the icy air, the white frost covering their shaggy heads and unshaven beards. Joseph the Second of Austria joined the stately cavalcade. At Kaniev, Stanislaus Augustus, King of Poland, and distinguished Polish nobles swelled the royal train. Catherine had not met her old lover for twenty-three years, and for once her imperturbable countenance betrayed agitation. Poniatowski, however, retained his composure, and did homage to the empress for the crown she had bestowed upon him, with as little emotion as if they had been strangers. This royal cortege sailed down the Dnieper in a fleet of fifty galleys. Potemkin had spared no expense, and no device by which to astonish and impress the beholders with the state of the countries through which they passed. He dressed up shepherds and shepherdesses to attend choice flocks along the banks of the river. Palaces and whole villages were erected to give life to the scenery. Peasants were handsomely attired, troops were newly equipped, Tartars were clothed and disciplined, 
wildernesses were converted into blooming gardens. Everything that human ingenuity could invent had been gathered here to make the sterile deserts and the wide tracts that had been laid waste in the rapacious wars assume the appearance of populous, thriving provinces. The people, furnished with holiday dresses and engaged with music and dancing, were made to appear gay, happy, and contented, while those very regions were desolate and groaning with famine and oppression. It was an apt illustration of her whole reign, a dazzling display, which she flattered herself would blind posterity to her hideous defects, empty and heartless, like everything that emanated from her or her minions. Six months were occupied in this unexampled tour, which resulted in nothing but a renewal of war with the Turks. Hostilities commenced near the close of the same year, 1787, and were encouraged by Prince Potemkin, who, though he seemed to have every possible desire granted, lacked one thing more to give him the happiness he was always in pursuit of, yet never found. He had never received the Order of St. George. This could not be obtained till he had commanded an army and gained a victory. Thousands of human beings were thrown into the scale with a ribbon and star. Potemkin must be gratified with the possession of the toy. End of section 34《セクション35 of the Heroines of History》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H.《The Heroines of History》by John S. Jenkins《セクション35 Catherine of Russia》Part 4 An army of one hundred and fifty thousand men, under the command of the celebrated generals Romanzov, Repnin, and Suvorov, commenced hostilities against the Ottoman Empire, and during two years passed from city to city, reducing them to ashes and inhumanly massacring the inhabitants of whatever age or sex. The fierce Potemkin spared nothing; the lives of his troops were of no account. He simply gave orders from his sumptuous tents, and if everything was not gained that he commanded, he was ready to press his iron heel upon the necks of his own soldiers. Catherine, equally insensible to the rapine, bloodshed, and horrors of war, gave balls and tournaments at her capital, distributed costly gifts among the conquerors, and gave thanks in the churches for their bloody victories. In 1790. Potemkin sat with his armies before Ismail. Seven months passed, at the end of which the besieged still firmly and bravely held out. Potemkin, impatient at the long resistance, ordered it to be taken in three days. Suvorov obeyed, and addressing his men with the brutal words, "My brothers, no quarter. Provisions are dear." He began the assault. The Russians were twice repulsed. Which added to their ferocity when they afterwards succeeded in scaling the ramparts and gained possession of the city. All the inhabitants were slain till blood ran in torrents through the streets. Suvorov immediately wrote to the empress with only these words: "The haughty Ismail is at your feet." Potemkin hastened to Petersburg to gain a reward for victories. He no more had gained than those for which Alexey Orlov had been enriched. Catherine, however, rewarded him with the coveted ribbon and star, and bestowed upon him a magnificent palace and a coat laced with diamonds. All he desired was now attained, but instead of the happiness he expected to attain, he found himself the most miserable of men. Suvorov and the accompanying generals proudly laid their laurels at the feet of the empress, who smiled upon them and bestowed estates and glittering jewels on the heroes, as if they were not all bathed in the blood of oppressed victims. This war had cost the lives of more than six hundred thousand men, the destruction of many cities, and the exhaustion of the Russian treasury, 
while nothing permanent had been gained by either nation. A treaty was soon concluded, but Potemkin did not live to see it accomplished. In the midst of his pleasures and his vices, he was suddenly seized with dangerous illness, and with his usual waywardness, refused the advice of physicians and set out upon a journey. While traveling between Yassi and Nikolsev, he was too ill to proceed, and being taken out of his carriage, was laid upon the grass under a tree, where he quickly expired. Not far from the spot rested the remains of the good Howard. As if, says Dr. Clark, the hand of destiny had directed two persons, in whom were exemplified the extremes of virtue and vice, to one common spot, in order that the contrast might remain a lesson for mankind. In 1792, Catherine declared war against Poland, to which she assigned various petty pretexts, while in reality it was the result of her own long-meditated division of that country. Her new favorites and ministers gladly acquiesced in a measure that promised them a large share in the rich spoils of the unhappy Poles. Frederick of Prussia, acting in concert with the Empress, dispatched an army to unite with the Russian legions, and together they overran the plains of Poland. At Warsaw, the Diet had received the declaration of war with stern calmness, succeeded by a burst of enthusiasm, excited by a patriotic determination to free themselves from the Russian yoke, defend their homes, and save their nation from oblivion. An army was hastily summoned, and placed under the command of Joseph Poniatowski, a man ill-fitted for such a responsible post. Nothing but disasters accompanied his efforts. The Russians were everywhere triumphant. The defenders of Poland were dispersed, their estates confiscated, and their families reduced to penury and servitude. While Poland thus lay bleeding and panting at the feet of the conquerors, Kosciuszko, whose name is dear to the lovers of liberty, sprang up from the despairing hosts, girded on the warrior's armor, and with the glorious resolve of rescuing his countrymen and his nation from the haughty victors, gathered about him the few bold spirits who dared to offer themselves as a shield to Poland. Peasants, whom he caused to be freed from servitude, augmented his little army. He was chosen their general. Inspired with the patriotic fire of the brave leader, the enthusiastic army swept all before them. Had their king and his partisans united with their efforts, Poland might still have had a place among nations. But the dissensions that, since the accession of Stanislaus Augustus, had rendered united action impossible, occasioned the final triumph of Russia and Prussia. Catherine had sent fresh troops, and Frederick stationed himself at the head of his own forces during the last engagement. The Poles were overpowered, the army cut to pieces, and the brave Kosciuszko fell wounded and senseless in the thickest of the battle. He was carried a prisoner to Petersburg, confined in a dungeon till the death of Catherine, and then brought forth by Paul and loaded with honors. The emperor offered him employment in the Russian service, which he declined. It is said that Paul presented him with his own sword in admiration for the noble Pole, but Kosciuszko replied, I no longer need a sword, since I no longer have a country. His soul glowed with the love of liberty. Melancholy and oppressed at the sight of Poland in chains, he sought the shores of young America, and generously devoted his noble and exalted powers to her cause. He was too pure a jewel for a Russian setting. Leaving his revered name associated with the loved Washington and Lafayette in the struggle for American liberty, he repaired to Switzerland, where he died in 1817. The Poles, just awakened to his inestimable worth, conveyed his remains to his native land, and almost divine honors were paid to his memory. To return to the events of 1794, Catherine displaced Stanislaus Augustus, who had not been adroit enough to secure the confidence of either party. She sent him to Grodno, 
condemned to live obscurely on a pension granted by her, and created Prince Repnin governor of the provinces that fell to her share in the infamous division of Poland. The following year, the empress added another rich province to her empire. Courland, by her intricate and unscrupulous stratagems, was secured without having recourse to arms, and those who resisted her usurpations were immediately deprived of their estates and sent to Siberia. The remainder were frightened into submission. The death of Frederick of Prussia deprived her of an assistant in her plots, and gave her an enemy in his successor. She threatened him with war. At the same time, she turned her covetous eyes upon Persia, designing its scepter for Alexander, one of her grandsons. For Constantine, another of Paul's sons, she intended to extend her conquests in Turkey and set him upon the Ottoman throne. Sweden, she determined, should fall to Alexandrina, her favorite and beautiful granddaughter. This princess is described as just fifteen, tall, well-formed, with noble and regular features, a profusion of fine hair, and eyes that beamed with intelligence and sensibility. In person, mind, and manners, Alexandrina was one of the most lovely and accomplished princesses in Europe. Catherine set her heart upon making her Queen of Sweden. To accomplish it, she succeeded in prevailing upon Gustavus Adolphus, the young king of Sweden, to visit her court. He repaired to Petersburg, accompanied by the regent, his ministers, and a brilliant suite, an arrival that occasioned a gorgeous display on the part of Catherine. Gustavus Adolphus was nearly eighteen, of elegant stature, agreeable face, free and graceful manners that were calculated to captivate a free heart. At their presentation, Gustavus and Alexandrina were equally won by the unexpected beauty and grace of the other. The charms of the Russian belle overcame his affection for the princess of Mecklenburg, to whom he was affianced. The engagement was easily broken off, and the fascinating king was soon the accepted suitor of the happy Alexandrina. Articles of marriage were drawn up, the day for the betrothment appointed, and splendid preparations for its celebration occupied all the court. The day arrived, and Catherine, with her officers and attendants, occupied the presence chamber in a style that equaled, if not outvied, oriental magnificence. The Swedish suite, in brilliant court dresses, waited upon their king, and the brilliant circle was completed by the manly presence of the royal groom and the lovely bride, bewitchingly veiled in a mist of costly lace. The Chancellor Markov commenced reading the contract, when, to the surprise of the imperial family, Gustavus interrupted him, and observed that the laws of Sweden required that the princess should change her religion, without which agreement he could not sign the contract. The Empress remonstrated, flattered, almost entreated, but the young king was immovable. Not willing to sacrifice her dignity to farther efforts, she coldly arose, and with unaltered countenance, majestically moved out of the apartment, followed by the pale bride and all her attendants. Nothing more was said upon the matter. The following day, the Swedish king and his suite quitted Petersburg. Alexandrina, who was the keenest sufferer, had been led to her apartments when she fainted away, and afterwards gave up to a melancholy that was not diverted by her marriage with the Archduke of Austria. She fell into a decline, and died at the age of nineteen. The mortification and disappointment of Catherine had as fatal and a more sudden effect, because of her struggle to suppress her anger and chagrin, in the presence of curious spectators. Her temper was too imperious to endure graciously such a slight. Whether it was the occasion of her death or not, she was soon after seized with a fit of apoplexy that terminated her life the ninth of November, 1796. At the height of her guilty grandeur, in the midst of premeditated injustice, 
her hand raised with threatened violence against unoffending nations, this wicked empress was summoned into eternity without a moment's warning. A happy death, said her subjects. Happy, perhaps, because her soul had made its exit as completely veiled as she had struggled to keep it during her life. The Grand Duke was immediately proclaimed emperor under the title of Paul I. His first duty was to direct the imposing ceremonials of the empress' interment. He directed the remains of his father, Peter III, to be disinterred and brought to Petersburg from the church of the monastery of St. Alexander Nevsky, where they had quietly reposed for more than thirty years. His coffin was placed beside that of the empress, and his crown, which the unfortunate monarch had never worn, was brought from Moscow and placed above him. Over both lay a kind of true love knot, with the inscription, Divided in life, united in death. Paul, probably from motives of revenge, ordered Alexey Orlov, who resided at Moscow, and Baratinsky, his assistant in the murder of the deceased emperor, to stand one on each side of the corpse of Peter as chief mourners. In the state chamber of the palace, draped with sable hangings, lighted with tapers and filled with courtiers in gloomiest black, these two appointed mourners were obliged to station themselves beside their mouldered victim. Alexey Orlov was too strongly nerved to be overcome by this mode of vengeance, but Baratinsky, more sensitive, sank under the doleful task, and it was only by repeatedly applying stimulants that he could be made to keep his station during the three long hours of ceremonials. Count Orlov afterwards received permission to travel without asking it, which is the Russian form of dismissing or disgracing a favorite, who returns to court at the peril of breathing the icy air of Siberia. Catherine II reigned thirty-four years, years full of glory and shame to Russia. Few of her works remained permanently, and much of the good she accomplished was soon overturned under the short and cruel administration of Paul. She was neither loved nor hated by the Russians. So accustomed are they to tyranny that they submissively and meekly yield to whatever their sovereign chooses to enforce. Notwithstanding Catherine's severity and imperious airs, she was not a tyrant in her own palace, but free, easy, and gay. She is described as preserving her grace and majesty to the last period of her life. She was of moderate stature, but well proportioned, and as she carried her head very high, she appeared rather tall. She had an open brow, an aquiline nose, an agreeable mouth, and her chin, though long, was not misshapen. Her hair was auburn, her eyebrows black and rather thick, and her blue eyes had a gentleness which was often affected, but oftener still betrayed pride. Her physiognomy was not deficient in expression, but that expression never discovered what was passing in the soul of Catherine or rather it served her the better to disguise it. She wore the Russian costume, that being the most becoming to her. Green was the color most in vogue with the Russians, and she usually adopted it. Her hair, slightly powdered, flowed upon her shoulders and was surmounted by a small cap covered with diamonds, which gave a coquettish finish to her costume. With a different husband and a more enlightened people, it is hard to say what her fame and fate would have been. As it was, a brazen face and ready dagger were all that she ever needed, and for her use of these alone is she to be credited in seizing and maintaining her great power. She deserves praise for encouraging the literature of her own country and for tolerating all religions. In these respects she was nobly unlike many of her compeers but her private life was disgraced by a licentiousness that she hardly attempted to conceal, and she expended enough energy in empty and ludicrous affectations of enterprise to have made her realm prosperous and glorious in reality instead of occasional appearance. End of section 35 
Section 36 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in August 2010. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 36 Marie Antoinette. Part 1 my hair is gray but not with years for it grew white in a single night as men's have grown from sudden fears byron the first french revolution like the superlative vices it both sprang from and gave birth to was a monster of frightful mien but it cannot be said of it as of vice that seen too oft familiar with its face we first endure then pity then embrace the revolting theme as one congenial to any sympathies of our nature there is such a thing as human nature and such a thing as french nature said a great writer and nothing but a french temperament that still delights in blue fire and bloody bone fiction can often relish such a dish of horrors as the reign of terror at least it must be a jaded parisian sensualism that needs such an incentive to mental appetite the craving for the horrible that like the inclination to fix a fascinated gaze on the face of the dead or to approach and leap from a precipice is a strange attribute of mind finds this portion of earth's history too nauseating to be many times perused the ingredients collected by the witches of macbeth for a charm of powerful trouble of which the most palatable were edda's fork and blind warm sting lizard's leg and owlet's wing are mere child's confectionery in the comparison the tortures of the hindu and of the american savage are tender mercies when contrasted with the red fool fury of the seine and besides the disgusting and stupefying nature of the details they are too familiar to every one in this reading age to make a repicturing of them pardonable no subject has been so often rehearsed and it is necessarily and sufficiently brought into view in the accounts of other heroines of the period so that the events accompanying marie antoinette's agonies may be now dismissed with a glance into her cup all the blackest drops of those dreadful years seem to have been pressed so protracted intense and every way sharpened were her sufferings and so indescribable was the monster revolution that slowly crushed her in its coils that no language can represent the reality except it be pollock's unequalled painting of the undying worm a passage of poetry well worth examining in this connection one i remarked attentively but how shall i describe what naught resembles else my eyes hath seen of worm or serpent kind it something looked but monstrous with a thousand snaky heads eyed each with double oars of glaring wrath and with as many tails that twisted out in horrid revolution tipped with stings and all its mouths that wide and darkly gaped and breathed most poisonous breath had each a sting forked and long and venomous and sharp and in its writhings infinite it grasped malignantly what seemed a heart swollen vast and quivering with torture most intense and still the heart with anguish throbbing high made effort to escape but could not for however it turned and oft it vainly turned these complicated foldings held it fast and still the monstrous beast with sting of head or tail transpierced it bleeding evermore such was marie antoinette's high throbbing heart and such was the mob of paris an unimaginable dragon headed by mad tribunals no connected sketch of the life of this unfortunate queen is intended a few scenes in that life of wonderful vicissitudes will be given 
the influences that surrounded her early years may be gathered from the biography of maria theresa her imperial mother who gave birth to this daughter in the palace at vienna november second seventeen fifty five the day was also memorable for the great earthquake at lisbon which like the terrible thunderstorm that followed marie antoinette's marriage was regarded by her as an evil omen and certainly was a fit emblem of the earthquake and storm of political revolution which buried the splendors and joys of her reign in ruin misery and death fair-haired beautiful and joyous marie grew up in the peace and freedom of her early home she was surrounded by brothers and sisters of remarkable loveliness and promise who were enough company for her in all the occupations or sports of childhood and youth the imperial nursery was their kingdom where they ruled even their governesses and preceptors and were safe from all intrusion their handsome and gay father the emperor francis of austria visited them only to mingle in their gaieties and receive their noisy familiar caresses him they loved and deeply mourned his death as of one who was numbered in their happy band he died when marie his favorite daughter was ten years old and before he set out on the journey from which he never returned alive he ordered his coachman to wait until she was called and he had again embraced her affectionately the young princes and princesses regarded their masculine and heroic mother with little feeling except that of distant awe she was too much occupied with her wars and affairs of state to think much of her family but once a week did she visit them with much the same business spirit that she reviewed her troops or inspected her public asylums in the same way that one glances at a morning paper or that she inquired the foreign news of her minister she questioned her family physician each morning in regard to the health of her children and she only deigned to see them when a sickness was reported or when she occasionally gathered them at her dinner-table in order to impress some ambassador with the idea that she herself superintended their education the teachers of marie antoinette were more solicitous to win her favor from interested motives than to advance her in knowledge as feigned proofs of her proficiency they exhibited to the empress the exercises in composition which they had first written in pencil for marie to trace afterwards in ink or sketches of drawing which she had never touched with her own hand and they taught her latin sentences which she did not understand but calmly recited to visitors at court on occasions of presentation as if she were able to converse in that language metastasio her italian instructor was alone faithful to his charge he was so agreeable and assiduous that she could speak and write the soft musical language of dante and tasso with fluent elegance she at length gained much facility in french conversation but through all her life she was forced to lament her deficiency in every solid acquirement after her engagement to the dauphin of france two french actors of superficial character were employed to perfect her in elocution and singing and when these were dismissed as incompetent the abbe de vermont was sent from paris to be her tutor he seems to have accomplished little else than the encouraging of her naturally unrestrained frolicsome and capricious disposition and the instilling into her mind a lasting and fun-loving contempt of the ceremonious french court to which she was destined after her arrival there no effort of hers was sufficient to subdue her uncontrollable vivacity the teachings of the abbe and the fashionable freedom of manners she had learned at vienna nor could she then find time or patience notwithstanding her earnest attempts to master the elements of history philosophy the english language or even her native german whereof she knew little the italian being the court speech of the austrian capital but what was lost in preparation for after life was gained in the careless and unchecked happiness of youth which was almost the only unclouded sunshine of a life that gradually darkened to the deepest horrors unconscious of their subsequent splendid or wretched fate 
she and her brothers and sisters pouted their full austrian lips in mock vexation or tossed their golden ringlets in mimic bravery laughed chattered and romped at their will through the apartments that were their little realm or sported among the trees fountains and lakes of the gardens of schönbrunn fifteen years of life bloomed in the cheek and sparkled in the eyes of marie when she bade a formal adieu to her dignified mother and a sad farewell to her comrades and youthful scenes her grief was relieved only by anticipations of the magnificence that awaited her as bride to the heir apparent of the french throne at the borders of her adopted land an embassy awaited to receive her and to conduct her to the bridegroom who was to meet her at compiegne quote, a superb pavilion unquote, writes madame campan quote, had been prepared upon the frontiers near Kell. It consisted of a vast saloon connected with two apartments, one of which was assigned to the lords and ladies of the court of Vienna, and the other to the suite of the Dauphiness, composed of the Countess de Noailles, her lady of honor, the Duchess de Cosse, her tirewoman, four ladies of the bedchamber, the Count de Sol Taverne, the first gentleman usher, the Count de Tessé, first equerry the bishop of chartres chief almoner the officers of the bodyguards and the pages when the dauphiness had been entirely undressed even to her body linen and stockings in order that she might retain nothing belonging to a foreign court an etiquette always observed on such an occasion the doors were opened the young princess came forward looking round for the countess de noailles then rushing into her arms she implored her with tears in her eyes and with a heartfelt sincerity to direct her to advise her and to be in every respect her guide and support it was impossible to refrain from admiring her aerial deportment her smile was sufficient to win the heart and in this enchanting being in whom the splendour of french gaiety shone forth an indescribable but august serenity perhaps also the somewhat proud position of her head and shoulders betrayed the daughter of the caesars End quote. passing thus through the central pavilion to the smaller tent occupied by her new friends she was arrayed in the costliest robes that france could command with a dazzling escort of nobility and soldiery with music and the ringing of village bells with illuminations by night and processions of flower-strewing maidens by day the bride was hastened to the presence of the royal court which had come to compiegne to meet her and to accompany her to versailles there the wedding took place on the sixteenth of may seventeen seventy the utmost ingenuity of the most luxurious people in their most luxurious age was exhausted in the pomp and pleasures of the occasion the beauty and deportment of marie antoinette added greatly to the enthusiasm of the scene an eye-witness declares that quote, the dauphiness then fifteen years of age beaming with freshness appeared to all eyes more than beautiful her walk partook at once of the noble character of the princesses of her house and of the graces of the french her eyes were mild, her smile lovely. Louis the fifteenth, the reigning monarch, was enchanted with the young Dauphiness. All his conversation was about her graces, her vivacity, and the aptness of her repartees. She was yet more successful with the royal family, when they beheld her shorn of the splendor of the diamonds with which she had been adorned during the earliest days of her marriage. When clothed in a light dress of taffety, she was compared to the Venus di Medicis and the Atalanta of the Mali Gardens. Poets sang her charms, painters attempted to copy her features. An ingenious idea of one of the latter was rewarded by Louis the Fifteenth. The painter's fancy led him to place the portrait of Marie Antoinette in the heart of a full-blown rose. End quote she was not indeed regular in feature but had enough loveliness to justify such superlative praise from her contemporaries her figure was tall and graceful 
her movements had the ease and majesty of her mother when she excited the hungarians to arms her neck was proud and swan-like her hair a light auburn soft and lustrous her forehead high with finely arched brows and these with eyes of luminous blue full-blown lips and good teeth not to mention the brilliant expression which is the true charm of a countenance more than compensated for such defects as too prominent a nose and cheekbones her lively wit and impulsiveness was her crowning attraction though it occasioned her much trouble through the misrepresentation of enemies and her unavoidable infringements of uncongenial etiquette her husband was her opposite in everything but kindness and sincerity he was grandson to louis the fifteenth the voluptuous king who then held an oppressive sceptre plain in person he was awkward diffident coldly unimpassioned in temperament and devoted to retirement and books though afterwards a loving husband and tender father he was at first and for years totally insensible to the glowing charms of his wife never showing her a single mark of special affection nor acting towards her in any respect as a husband she bore this treatment with outward composure but inward grief and indignation it was this unaccountable absence of love on his part and her despair at the odium that would fall upon her if she never gave an heir to the crown that led her uneducated as she was to a frivolous life of amusement and extravagance which was greatly exaggerated by the scandalous reports of her foes and it was all this together with a national hatred towards austria fomented by fractions of the nobility that led to the wreaking of popular vengeance on an innocent king and queen for the wrongs of centuries eight years of nominally married life passed before marie antoinette became a mother and gave herself to serious cares during this long period she was equally forced and disposed to banish her private misery by every expedient of recreation four years after her marriage her husband and herself had succeeded to the throne he being twenty-four years of age and she twenty when the news of the death of louis the fifteenth was brought to them they were overwhelmed with the sudden responsibility that had fallen on them and kneeling cried o oh god guide us protect us we are too young to govern but marie now a queen had still no resource but in the dissipations of royalty for her the palace of st cloud was provided at an expense of a million dollars and a yearly income of eighty thousand dollars was appropriated to her use she had every temptation to live a butterfly life amidst all the sweets that were profusely offered to her taste and although she established several hospitals and made some provision for the poor in the vicinity of the gorgeous palace and grounds at versailles yet she yielded to the enticements of fashionable folly willing thus to drown her threefold mortification at her ignorance the indifference of the king and the calumnies of her adversaries her mind was natively vigorous and gifted but was suffered to run to waste besides st cloud a small palace called the little trianon within the bounds of versailles was given to her it was of roman architecture exquisitely fitted up and situated among sequestered gardens in the adornment of which all the strange genius of the times had been displayed hither marie often fled from the balls operas festivities and tedious punctilio of the court to enjoy intervals of quiet and liberty arrayed in a loose white robe and straw hat and with a switch in her hand she tripped lightly over the fresh greensward and among a little band of friends acted the amateur farmer's wife or dairy-maid the exterior of a thatched building was made to represent a barn while the interior was a brilliant ballroom for select private parties the fashions at this period manifested the spirit of the land and the age in which marie's fortune was cast 
at the commencement of her reign the hair full of powder and pomatum was erected to a height that almost doubled the apparent stature of the ladies caricatures were published representing hairdressers as ascending to these towers of hair by means of ladders hooped dresses were worn distended like balloons but the story of paul and virginia in which the simple dress of the heroine is described so captivated all hearts that a great revolution in dress was effected plain robes of white muslin and straw hats succeeded Afterwards, as the revolution advanced, the Grecian and Roman costumes were exactly copied in honor of the ancient republics. This, however, was after the queen's imprisonment, when she was reduced to the one dress which she happened to wear at the time of her capture. As an instance of the fetes given by the queen, and the manner in which every deed of hers was misrepresented, may be quoted a description of a scene at the Petit Trianon on the occasion of a visit from her brother, the Emperor Joseph of Austria. Quote, the arch with which the English garden was lighted, not illuminated, produced a charming effect. Earth and lamps concealed by painted green boards threw a light upon the beds of shrubs and flowers, and brought out their several tints in the most varied and pleasing manner several hundred burning faggots in the moat behind the temple of love kept up a blaze of light which rendered the spot the most brilliant in the garden after all the evening's entertainment was indebted to the good taste of the artists yet it was much talked of the uninvited courtiers were dissatisfied and the people who never forgive any fetes but those they share in contributed greatly to the envious exaggerations which were circulated as to the cost of this little affair which was so ludicrously absurd as to state that the faggots burnt in the moat required the destruction of a whole forest the queen being informed of these reports was determined to know exactly how much wood had been consumed and she found that fifteen hundred faggots had sufficed to keep up the fire until four o'clock in the morning End quote. But neither in this case nor in any other did any contradiction of ill natured stories serve to disabuse the public mind. The king took no part in the diversions of his consort, and this gave colour to the gross charges circulated against her. He was a man of good features, yet with a melancholy look. His walk was a plodding one, his hair and dress disorderly however neatly arranged by his attendants, and his voice was harsh and shrill. Marie would gladly have nestled herself in his affection, had he proffered it, notwithstanding his ungainly appearance and stolid manners. He gave himself much to study, was versed in history and English literature, familiar with geography, and fond of drawing and colouring maps. He had also an unaristocratic liking for mechanic arts, such as masonry and lock-making, and would employ himself with a locksmith in his private room, from which he would often come into the queen's presence, with his hands blackened with his work. But he was a man of upright and benevolent intentions and regular habits. Whether the queen were to attend a party or concert, or not, he always retired to sleep at precisely ten o'clock. In all church observances he was very conscientious, as also in his endeavours to reform abuses of government. And, after a few years, he gradually warmed towards his wife, so that he became at length an exemplary, tender husband and father. He was worthy of a better fate than that which awaited him. End of section 36《セクション37オフ・ザ・ヘロインズ・オフ・ヒストリー》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avaí in August 2010.《ザ・ヘロインズ・オフ・ヒストリー》by John S. Jenkins. セクション37 Marie Antoinette, Part 2
such were the king and queen of france on whom fell the iniquities of a long line of sovereigns they became the parents of four children two of whom died in infancy leaving maria theresa and louis charles two bright and beautiful children the first of whom was eleven years old and the last eight when the tempest of the revolution burst upon the royal family this event was chiefly due to ages of wrong to the influence of the american revolution and to the plotting factions of french nobles and statesmen who inflamed the populace and brought destruction on themselves as well as their good king but there were many incidents in the queen's life which perverted by busy scandal hastened the fearful denouement the chief of these was the famous affair of the diamond necklace marie was fond of jewellery louis XV had given her a necklace of pearls each of which was as large as a filbert and all remarkably alike and the crown jewels she used of course she had also bracelets that cost forty thousand dollars bachmer the crown jeweller had gratified her with earrings composed of pear-shaped diamonds and worth seventy thousand dollars he now determined to outdo himself he travelled over europe bought up the rarest diamonds and made a necklace in which he expended a fortune of three hundred and twenty thousand dollars this he offered to the queen but to his astonishment her taste had become more simple and her sense of economy was too strong for the temptation by no means could he induce her to purchase his chef d'oeuvre in which all his hopes were at stake meanwhile the countess lamotte a relative yet enemy of the royal family and a dissolute woman forged a promissory note in the queen's name for the amount of the necklace and palmed off the deception on cardinal de rohan who thus procured the jewels for the countess she disposed of them in some way and began to live in a style of great extravagance the sovereigns believed the cardinal to be an accomplice in the fraud he and the countess were tried he was acquitted and doubtless to show an indignity to her royal blood she was sentenced by the tribunal to be whipped branded and imprisoned for life afterwards she perished tragically in london but it was industriously reported that the queen was privy to the whole plot against the jeweller and the dark suspicion exasperated many against marie antoinette besides this from her first entrance into france innumerable tales were spread to her prejudice from the hour of her marriage madame du barry the transcendently fascinating courtesan of louis the fifteenth jealous of the influence of the fair young austrian did all in her power to injure her the old formal dowagers in their hoop dresses and black caps who waited on the dauphiness were shocked at her youthful improprieties and became her implacable enemies their spite being specially increased by the irrepressible smiles of marie when on state occasions her friend a roguish young marchioness made sport of the solemn ladies by playing pranks behind their backs the austrian's girlish mirthfulness and nonconformity to the absurd etiquette of the court was improved to the utmost by all lovers of form or haters of austrian supremacy after she assumed the crown she abolished the custom of admitting the people to see the royal family dine a moving crowd having always been permitted to enter the palace and gaze at their sovereigns at table from behind the railing as if it were a show of feeding wild animals the denial of this privilege was a grudge against the queen her want of education likewise exposed her to the animadversions of the intellectual society of paris and this was heightened by her natural choice of not the best informed ladies for her favourites her villa of little trianon was falsely said to have been named by her little vienna while it was reported that she hated france and sighed for her native land she once brought home a peasant child who had been run over by her carriage this child was actually declared to be an illegitimate son of her own whom she had introduced into the palace by such an expedient 
At another time, her royal chariot broke down on the way to the opera, obliging her to take a hackney coach. This was maliciously construed into an apology for some knightly assignation. So also, at a levee, she expressed admiration for a heron's plume, worn by the unprincipled Duke de Lausune. He gallantly presented it to her, and she, not to offend him, once appeared with it in public, enough to feed the greedy appetite of impure rumour for a long while. At the gardens of Marly, with a company of ladies and gentlemen, she took a ride at night to the hills to see the sunrise, and this adventure was pronounced a covered plan of licentiousness. After an unusual fall of snow, she got up a sleigh ride in the streets of Paris with rich equipage to the surprise of all the people, who accused her of a design to introduce Austrian customs. In private theatricals she performed as an actress, and in private parties she gleefully engaged in such simple sports as blind man's buff, to the general indignation of all sticklers for dignity. In short, there was no end of the stories set afloat by cunning persons, and every incident was converted into caricature, a defamatory picture, or a song to be sung by the street beggars. She was even insulted often to her face when she imprudently assumed a mask and mingled with promenaders on the avenues. After a reign of nineteen years, the slowly gathering storm that long had darkened over the heads of Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette broke in the thundering tread, the lightning violence and torrent rush of the mobs of 1789. Tattered, haggard, and drunken crowds emerging from the dens of Paris raged through the streets, armed with pikes, clubs, and every instrument that could be converted into a weapon of attack. The king insisted on gentle measures, and, when his troops were driven from the city, he collected his army around him at Versailles. The capital was abandoned to the infuriated people, who levelled the Bastille to the ground, and sacked every house they chose to invade. It is in vain to follow the course of events, and attempt to give the scenes of the revolution in detail. The eye need be fastened now upon the queen alone, in all the awful trials through which she passed to the scaffold. A few brief paragraphs only are required to set forth her heroic portrait on the dark and confused background of that reign of terror. From the first, the determination of her mother was kindled within her, she vainly urged the king to take decided steps to force down the rebellion. When he was absent on his dangerous and fruitless visit to the National Assembly at Paris, she prepared to follow him to the last extremity. On his return, at a banquet of the military officers, she, together with him, excited as wild enthusiasm as did her mother among the Hungarians at Pressburg. And when the monster mob rushed from the city, dragged its mighty bulk along the road to Versailles, to coil its slimy and bristling convolutions around the palace itself, and shake its thousands of hissing tongues in the very sanctuary of royalty, she, urged to fly with her children, would not desert her lord, but said, quote, Nothing shall induce me in such an extremity to be separated from my husband. I know that they seek my life but I am the daughter of Maria Theresa, and I have not learned to fear death. End quote. It was the evening of a dismal rainy day, when the delirious and countless multitude reached Versailles to hold its hideous orgies all night in the gardens and cottages. Assured of protection by Lafayette, commander of the guard, the queen, when it was nearly daylight the next day, endeavoured to get an hour's repose but she had hardly closed her eyes before the swarming ruffians broke into the palace and thundered at the door of her chamber. She had barely escaped to the apartments of the king when they shivered the door of her own and plunged their pikes and knives into her empty bed. The next day her courage rose to sublimity. Beholding her trusty soldiers butchered in the courtyard of the palace, she undoubtedly presented herself at the windows, while bullets were flying around her, 
and she refused the protection of a friend who threw himself before her. She declared that the king could not afford to lose so faithful a subject as he. The crowd called for her to show herself in the balcony. She came forward with her children, thinking to move their sympathy. They at once roared forth the cry, Away with the children! Without an instant's hesitation or a change of color in her face, she sent away the children and stood alone in the balcony, lifting her eyes to God, with clasped hands and resigned to fall the next moment as a ransom for her family. A dead silence struck the mad concourse. They were overwhelmed at her sublime self-sacrifice, and suddenly from every throat went up the shout, Live the Queen! Live the Queen! With a purposeless frenzy, the poor, misguided, famished, and intoxicated mob demanded that the king should return with them to the city. The queen would not be parted from him, and beyond all description was the ride of theirs to Paris, borne along as they were for seven hours by a flood of desperate creatures who loaded them with abuse, endangered their lives by frequent shots, and shocked them by the bloody heads of the slaughtered guard, carried on pikes, and thrust before the windows of their carriage. Thirty thousand madmen, armed with every possible weapon, surrounded the cortege, and women, crazed with poverty, crime, and rum, were seated on the cannon that were rolled along, and sang ribald songs in ridicule of the queen. The feelings of a mother were too strong in her for any dismay on her own account, she held her boy on her knee and tried to soothe his terrors. For two years the sovereigns were little more than prisoners in the palaces of the Tuileries and St. Cloud. The National Guard surrounded them, day and night, ostensibly to protect, but really to hold them captive, and constantly were they threatened with assassination. Marie Antoinette in vain entreated her husband to use active measures to assert his authority, or else to fly to the frontiers. He possessed a calm and indomitable courage in endurance, but had none for action, and he believed that repeated concessions to the demands of the people would at last satisfy them. And so she devoted herself to the instruction of her children, or employed herself with embroidery, maintaining a serene and cheerful fortitude during all those months of alarm. Many plans for their secret escape were formed by their friends. These plots were either divulged and the instigators beheaded, or, if nearly successful, were defeated by the inaction of Louis. At length the case became too desperate for even his passive nature. He and his wife were falsely accused of exciting the rally of the Allied powers, who were now collecting an army that threatened to march upon Paris and suppress the revolution with fire and sword. The royal family were openly denounced in the National Assembly as traitors to their country. The scheme of flight was matured after long and anxious deliberation. The royal family retired as usual on the night of the 20th of June, 1791, at 11 o'clock. No sooner were they in their rooms than they disguised themselves, and departing by the rear doors of the palace and taking separate routes through the obscurest streets of Paris, they sought the rendezvous appointed for them to take the coaches prepared. The queen, leading her daughter and accompanied by one of her bodyguard, arrived soon at the place agreed upon, but had to wait a long time in extreme anxiety for the king, who had lost his way. In silent and agonizing apprehension they met, entered their carriages, and were rapidly driven, with relays of horses, all that night and the next day, to Varennes, one hundred and eighty miles from Paris. Before reaching that town they had been recognized, and the news of their approach sent in advance. The circumstances cannot be rehearsed. A crowd collected. The king declared himself and appealed to the people, but vainly. They had arrived there in the evening. All night the queen remained in the mayor's house. It was the night of her intensest agony, and, in the morning, her hair, which before was a beautiful brown, 
was found to have turned white in consequence of her indescribable misery. The return to Paris, the next day and night after their arrest, was a repetition of the terrible journey to Versailles, only now it was eighteen times the distance, and their distress was heightened by utter exhaustion and hopelessness. Riotous crowds thronged the road, cursing and jeering the captives, or attempting to fall upon them like greedy wolves, and old men who ventured a look or gesture of respect towards their king were massacred before his eyes, without mercy. Amidst suffocating multitudes, dust and heat, and fainting with thirst and terror at more daring menaces, they entered the city. As the doors of the palace closed upon them, a universal cry of rage rent the air and was prolonged to their ears like reverberating thunder. Guards kept their eyes upon the queen every moment, day and night, to the outrage of her modesty and to the disgrace of humanity. The king for days was struck dumb with despair, and at last Marie cast herself with her children before him, saying, quote, We may all perish, but let us at least perish like sovereigns, and not wait to be strangled unresistingly upon the very floor of our apartments. End quote. And Madame Elizabeth, sister of the king, the other heroine of these scenes, and the most saintly woman, assisted in cheering the unfortunate monarch. And bravely did he arouse himself and face the brutal mob that broke into the palace prison the next day to revenge themselves for his refusal to authorize a persecution of the priest. They came with banners, one of which was a doll hung up by the neck, and beneath it the words, To the gibbet with the Austrian! They wrenched down the doors and rioted through the splendid apartments, destroying everything in their way, and pressed upon the king and queen, who were only saved by maintaining extraordinary composure and uttering some popular expressions. Some sentiment of the sacredness of royal persons seemed to have remained, and held back the frantic concourse like a magic spell. For hours the family were exposed to the rush and gaze of the populace, until the president of the assembly succeeded in dispersing them. Further attempts to poison or assassinate the queen were made, and many insults endured by her. It is in vain to enumerate them. It is adding the same colors to the terrific picture. The mob, in August 1792, demanded that the king should be dethroned, and again attacked the Tuileries, at which they pointed their loaded cannon. An officer urged the family to take refuge in the National Assembly. Marie resisted the proposal, and seizing the officer's pistol, placed them in the hands of Louis and said, quote, Now, sire, is the time to show yourself, and if we must perish, let us perish with glory. End quote but, subdued at the sight of her children, she consented to go. Fearful was their passage through the bloodthirsty crowd, while their friends were butchered, and long were the hours of suspense as they sat in a box behind the seat of the present of the assembly. But they never trembled nor quailed. The queen gazed steadfastly and indignantly, like the very statue of outraged majesty, at the excited assembly. The king was dethroned, and, with his family, was imprisoned in the monastery of the Feuillants. Afterwards, they were incarcerated in a gloomy fortress called the Temple. The reign of terror was at its height, and nothing but the strength of their dungeon saved them from the foaming desire of the city to add their royal blood to the streams of human gore that deluged the streets. Months passed, their few comforts were gradually withdrawn, one by one they were separated, the king was executed, her son was taken from the queen, and so abused in his confinement that he afterwards became insane and died, and on the 14th of October 1793, four months after her husband's death, Marie Antoinette fell a victim to the busy and dread guillotine. When they tore her son from her, she resisted the cruelty with furious desperation. 
and when they took her from her daughter, she accidentally struck her own forehead against the door, and to the question whether she was hurt, she said with the preternatural calmness of an utterly broken heart, quote, Oh no, nothing now can further hurt me. End quote. In the damp, dark, loathsome underground dungeon of the Conciergerie, the place of the doomed, the daughter of Maria Theresa, the admired and gay queen of St. Cloud and Versailles, awaited her fate. She had stood up before the vociferous and exulting spectators at the tribunal, and heard her sentence without the quivering of a nerve, and without stooping to offer a word of defence, though the most groundless charges were uttered against her. And now she knelt in her cell, prayed, and then slept as tranquilly as if she were reposing on the satin damask of her petit trianon, after a stroll among flowers and fountains. Two hours of slumber passed. She was awakened, and dressed in the only fine garments that she had preserved amidst her soiled array. She wore a white loose robe, pure as her innocence, with a cap and black ribbon on her head. The day was cold and misty. At eleven o'clock her hands were bound. She was placed in a rough cart, and jolted along through the crowd that cried, Down with the Austrian! One glance at that scene of her pleasures and woes, the Tuileries, and she ascended the scaffold, knelt, and said, quote, Lord, enlighten and soften the hearts of my executioners. Adieu forever, my children. I go to join your father. End quote. Her children, in their distant dungeons, heard not the words, but we may trust that they were heard in heaven. The glittering yet blood-stained blade fell, the executioner lifted her head by the prematurely white hair, and the air echoed to the cry, Vive la République! In her grave, where now stands the church of the Madeleine, were buried thirty-eight years of as joyous youth, splendid pleasures, and awful tortures as ever fell to the lot of a mortal. Hers was a wild, beautiful, and noble nature, gentle yet tameless, ensnared from first to last in an unparalleled series of events, and slowly tortured to life's close by miseries which a superhuman ingenuity could not have more terribly devised than did her enemies. End of section 37section thirty eight of the heroines of history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by matthew reese the heroines of history by john s jenkins madame roland part one madame roland the mind is its own place Milton. Great events are the pedestals that bear aloft noble and beautiful characters, which might else lie low in obscurity. Nay, they are the chisel strokes which give bold prominence to characters that might otherwise have been unskillfully shaped, or destined to grace only a hidden niche. The revolutions that have repeatedly convulsed France must necessarily have furnished numerous subjects for history. Though there are many whose career was longer and more brilliant, there are few, if any, who came forth from the lower ranks of life, and secured by their talent such influence over intelligent minds as was gained by Madame Roland. Gifted with a vivid imagination, balanced by strong good sense, quick perceptions, and clear reasoning powers, and inspired by an ambition to emulate the old Roman heroines in the achievement of some great and virtuous deed, it is not surprising that she should have soared above the humble sphere in which her girlhood was placed, even had not her father's bitter denunciations against the all-powerful aristocracy, or the spirit which pervaded the lower classes before the outburst of the revolution, given shape and direction to her aspirations. Jean Manon Roland was born in 1754, in an humble home on the Quai de Euphreve, Paris. 
Her father, called Gratien Philippon, was an engraver, and daily superintended the thrifty shop with its busy workmen, which was the source of his limited fortune. By industry, economy, and the assistance of a prudent wife, he had secured comfortable apartments above the shop, where they lived as happily as his restless, fretful disposition would allow. At the time of Manon's birth, he had grown discontented with his lot in life. Hatred burned in his heart toward the pampered nobility who rolled in wealth, while he and his fellow laborers were made to yield an unjust portion of their hard earnings to support the luxury of arrogant superiors. Madame Philippon had no sympathy with the feverish discontent of her more ambitious husband. Of a cheerful, placid temperament, she was satisfied to remain in the position in which God had placed her, and with the faith and fortitude of a Christian, performed in unquestioning readiness whatever she found for her hands to do. Thus to a virtuous, pious mother, and an infidel father, was given a young spirit ready for the moulding hand of good or evil. Had Manon been one of several children, she might have been left more to her mother's guidance and instruction. But the only surviving child of eight, lively and precocious, pretty and winning, her father took her into his arms and heart, made her the constant companion of his leisure hours, and as she grew older carried or led her through the streets of Paris, listening with delight to her childish comments on the passers-by. Proud of the bright little Manon, he was maddened with resentment and envy at the sight of gilded coaches in which lolled richly dressed ladies, and children muffled in expensive garments fastened with jewels, any one of which would have given a coveted education to the poor artisan's daughter. Philippon gave vent to his anger in vociferous words which Manon did not comprehend, though they left a vague idea of an injured father and a dislike to dashing chariots and finely dressed people as the cause of his distress. The reflective mind of the little philosopher soon grasped and studied out the lessons her father gave. Before she reached the age when children are most occupied with pastimes, her head was full of the arrogance of royalty and nobility, and of schemes to fraternize and obtain equality among mankind. With no playmates, no pure air, green fields, forests, and gay songsters to impart the freedom and abandonment of childhood, with no diversion except daily walks in a crowded city with her father, who always took these occasions to teach her the wrongs of the oppressed poor, and too young to be of assistance to her mother at home, her busy mind found occupation, delight, and rest from her father's nervous suggestions in stealing away to her quiet little chamber and forgetting all the world in the perusal of her library, though this was so limited that she could number the books upon her fingers any day. Plutarch's Lives was her especial delight, a book she read and reread with an avidity that stored nearly the whole of it in her memory. Her soul was awake to all that was beautiful or sublime, whether manifested in the works of nature, art, or the deeds of mankind. These pursuits did not interfere with her usefulness in the household. She was cheerfully obedient to her mother's commands, and uncomplainingly laid down a pet book when her assistance was required in domestic duties. Thus she became skilled in culinary arts, of which she said in her after life, I can prepare my own dinner with as much address as Philippomen cut wood, and congratulated herself that her judicious mother had prepared her for the vicissitudes that marked her maturer years. Madame Philippon's high tone of piety, together with her gentle instructions, soon won Manon's confidence. She readily perceived the superiority of a religion that cultivated peace, fortitude, and uprightness in its possessor, in strong contrast with the overbearing impatience and fretful repinings which her father's principles infused into his daily life. She chose the former, and for months religion was predominant in her pensive meditations, till her active mind was wrought up to an unendurable state of excitement. The cloister presented itself to her ardent imagination as the only method of attaining the saintly purity to which she aspired, and as a place of holiness and retirement most suitable for preparation for her first Christian communion. One evening she threw herself in tears at her mother's feet, beseeching her to send her to a convent. Madame Philippon was deeply affected at the request. She did not hesitate to gratify a zeal, equally commended by the father, who desired to give Manon such an education as she could only obtain in a convent. After some difficulty in making a choice of the numerous religious houses, the convent of the Sisterhood of the Congregation in Paris was decided upon as being conducted with less strictness and fewer of the extravagances of Catholic worship than most of the nunneries. Manon was accompanied thither by her good mother, 
the thought of the long parting from her beloved mother brought torrents of tears and when the moment of separation arrived the sensitive but courageous child was overcome with grief in the memoirs that she penned while confined in prison she says of the separation while pressing my dear mother in my arms at the moment of parting with her for the first time in my life i thought my heart would have broken but i was acting in obedience to the voice of god and passed the threshold of the cloister offering up to him with tears the great sacrifice i was capable of making this was on the seventh of may seventeen sixty five when i was eleven years and two months old in the gloom of a prison in the midst of those political commotions which ravage my country and sweep away all that is dear to me how shall i recall to my mind and how describe that period of rapture and tranquillity what lively colors can express the soft emotions of a young heart endued with tenderness and sensibility greedy of happiness beginning to be alive to the feelings of nature and perceiving the deity alone the first night i spent at the convent was a night of agitation i was no longer under the paternal roof i was at a distance from that kind mother who was doubtless thinking of me with affectionate emotion a dim light suffused itself through the room in which i had been put to bed with four children of my own age i stole softly from my couch and drew near the window the light of the moon enabling me to distinguish the garden which it overlooked the deepest silence prevailed and i listened to it if i may use the expression with a sort of respect lofty trees cast their gigantic shadows along the ground and promised a secure asylum to peaceful meditation i lifted up my eyes to the heavens they were unclouded and serene i imagined i felt the presence of the deity smiling on my sacrifice and already offering me a reward in the consolatory peace of a celestial abode tears of delight flowed gently down my cheeks i repeated my vows with holy ecstasy and went to bed again to take the slumber of god's chosen children here in the society of young girls of various ages manon remained for a year her womanly conduct and intellectual acquirements very soon gained her the favor and affection of the whole sisterhood and the association of the young ladies placed under their tuition she never mingled in the sports of younger companions nor the recreations of older ones much preferring to steal away by herself in some remote corner of the garden with her books or pacing the avenues to enjoy in quiet rapture the sight of blooming flowers quivering leaves or trailing branches of the shade trees and the fleecy clouds flitting over the blue space above her narrowly bounded by the high convent walls every other moment was busily employed with her books romances legends lives of the saints biography travels history political philosophy poetry nothing escaped the grasp of her active mind the nuns to whose care she was committed were proud of her progress her music and drawing masters were equally profuse in the praises of a pupil who never allowed an obstacle to check her rapid advance caressed loved and commended without measure she had good sense enough not to be spoiled she was the especial favorite of an antiquated sister of seventy years whose diminutive figure preciseness of manner and affectation of sanctity which nevertheless concealed a warmed heart made an indelible impression on the lively imagination of her thoughtful pupil she led her away to her own dimly lighted cell and there chatted for hours with the young listener who received the old nun's lessons or tales with an avidity redoubled by the solitude of the cell her influence assisted to sharpen manon's already too active emotions and imparted such a degree of intensity to her religious fervor that when the season for communion arrived the child was so overcome that she could not support herself and was carried to the altar by the nuns everything within the convent contributed to nourish and increase the unhealthy excitement of manon's sensitive nature the event of a young girl taking the white veil occurred some months after her entrance into the convent the sight of the church and altar decorated with flowers and enriched with silken draperies the brilliant lights the gaily dressed crowd that assembled to witness the ceremony above all the entombed bride with her white veil rolling volumes of dark hair the crown of roses the pale beautiful downcast face excited the sympathy of the affectionate Manon. And when the bridal dress was exchanged for one of somber hue, her head dismantled of its crowning beauty, and her form extended with folding hands beneath a black pall, the excited child, imagining herself in the place of the victim, could no longer repress her emotions, and burst into an uncontrollable paroxysm of tears. 
such scenes the daily sights and sounds of vesper bells the hooded monks and shrouded nuns in the taper-lighted chapel the gloomy burials at night by torchlight were all fitted to oppress the child's spirit with awe and fill her with yearnings for secluded holiness and death instead of healthy active exertion in behalf of mankind it was an excessive and mistaken religious zeal which she threw off with its imposing and beguiling rites for the other extreme of philosophy and infidelity when arrived at womanhood there was but one among the inmates of the convent whom manon singled out as her friend and confidant one for whom she always maintained an unchanged attachment the usual quiet routine of convent life was broken one day by the arrival of two young ladies an event that excited the curiosity of the young girls shut out from the world who are they what are they like were questions that sped unanswered from lip to lip of a group in the garden bent upon a scrutiny of the two young ladies led thither by the superior one was eighteen finely formed of proud but easy carriage with a face that had strong claims to beauty when not disfigured by an expression of discontent and fretfulness she had previously completed her convent education but was returned by her mother in order to put in check her ungovernable temper and to accompany her younger more amiable and timid sister the latter fourteen with a modest air and sweet countenance bathed in tears attracted the sympathy and love of the impressible manon the moment their eyes met from the day of sophia's arrival the two were inseparable sophia was henceforth the receptacle of all the dreams the aspirations and the philosophical musings of the mature child wearied and overburdened with the pent-up thoughts and emotions daily crowding into her mind and heart this was not a transient schoolgirl friendship it was one sustained in an unfailing correspondence after their separation madame roland owed as much of the facility and clearness of expression visible in her writings to the frequent letters she early exchanged with her friend as to the habitual practice of taking notes from the books she perused and interlining them with her own thoughts and opinions when the year of her stay at the convent had expired her mother placed her under the care of her grandmother philippon a graceful good-humoured woman of sixty-five years still possessing agreeable manners and an occasional mirthfulness that made her a favorite with the young but her prominent characteristic was the precision with which she enforced and observed decorum the little courtesies and elegances of manner were of the highest importance in her judgment her unpretending pleasant home was on the banks of the seine commanding a lively view of the winding river and a wide landscape beyond this was a charming retreat where manon could indulge her meditative studious habits to her heart's content every morning she attended mass with her great aunt angelica a worthy maiden asthmatic and devout as virtuous as an angel and as simple as a child and entirely devoted to her elder sister with whom she lived a third sister madame besnard came frequently to visit them always keeping up an air of ceremony and formality that greatly exceeded even madame philippon manon was most frequently the theme of their conversation madame besnard insisting with a shrug of the shoulders that the child would be spoiled while the good angelica meek quiet and pale busy with her spectacles and knitting assured the two precise old ladies that manon had good sense enough to take care of herself and continued to pet her as before madame philippon was so delighted and proud of her granddaughter's accomplishments that she was induced to display her talent and prettiness before a wealthy lady of whose children she had formerly been governess accordingly manon was decked in holiday dress and the greatest preparation and care bestowed upon her appearance arriving at the mansion they were greeted by the servants with the greatest respect and as they passed on the maids attracted by the long dark ringlets and blooming cheeks of the young visitor ventured to compliment her manon's pride rose at the familiarity and without replying she followed her ceremonious grandmother to the elegant apartments of madame bosmarel the lady received them in a cold condescending tone of voice without rising and continued the embroidery upon which she was engaged she addressed her dignified visitor with the flippant title of mademoiselle and openly remarked upon madame's blooming face the indignant girl's countenance was suffused with blushes and her heart swelled with scorn and resentment that her venerated grandmother should be regarded with so little respect and that she herself conscious of superior worth and aspiring to the nobleness of a roman maiden should be looked down upon by this arrogant lady and treated as an equal by her servants Manon was glad when the interview terminated, and retreated with her pulse throbbing, and her face crimsoned with mortified pride and anger. Again under their own humble roof, she returned to her studies, 
her head teeming with speculations upon the inequality of rank that awakened from their long sleep the prejudices of her childhood at the expiration of a year manon returned to the parental roof her music and dancing masters were recalled and she resumed her studies with more assiduity than ever every book within her reach was carefully perused Locke, pascal Berlimac, montesquieu voltaire were familiar authors an occasional poem or a romance relieved her severer studies the long winter evening she spent beside her mother with her needlework or read aloud to which however she had a decided aversion as it prevented the close inquiry and study she indulged when poring over the pages by herself she had the use of a library belonging to the abbe leger a warm-hearted old man with little else to recommend him but with whom gratien philippon and his family spent their sabbath evenings the abbe's household was superintended by a distant relative mademoiselle danache she was a source of infinite amusement to the discerning manon advanced in years yet preserving a youthful style of dress tall thin and sallow with a shrill voice forever recounting her pedigree of which she was intolerably proud possessing no talent but for a stingy economy and scolding she was destined to become one of manon's attaches and as inseparable as her own shadow for a year and a half the abbe leger terminating his own life left his poor relative without a home madame philippon had compassion for her solitary condition and offered her an asylum till the suit she had instituted for the recovery of an uncle's property was decided during this time manon was her secretary she wrote letters and petitions for her and often accompanied her when she went to intercede with influential persons mademoiselle danache was extremely illiterate and ill-bred she therefore depended upon manon's ready tact on all occasions but when they went together on these errands the young philosopher was filled with disgust and contempt on seeing the obsequious attentions her whimsical ignorant friend received the moment the ready names of her long line of titled ancestry dropped from her nimble tongue with as good effect as if they had been pearls falling from the lips of beauty while she the one of true nobility stood unnoticed and slighted feeling her superiority and revolving in her busy mind the absurd and unjust institutions of society end of section 38 recording by matthew reese davenport iowa section 39 of the heroines of history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Matthew Rees The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins Madame Roland, Part 2 At fifteen, Manon was graceful and pleasing. Her face was attractive from its varying expression, frank, lively, and tender, often lofty and serious. The irregularity of her features was atoned for by her clear, fresh complexion, and the brilliancy of her hazel eyes. Modest and reserved, an inferior person would scarcely have suspected her strong talents, but when she came in contact with cultivated minds, she was transformed from a timid blushing maiden to a brilliant, self-possessed woman, with a soul that beamed through every feature, giving animation and indisputable beauty to a face that otherwise would have been plain. Thinking to amuse her, Madame Philippon decided upon a trip to Versailles accompanied by Mademoiselle Danache and an uncle, an amiable young clergyman as an escort. They occupied apartments in the palace, which happened to be vacated by one of the Dauphiness women, and amused themselves with being spectators of the royal public and private dinners, and witnessing some of the splendors of palace life. Mademoiselle Danache, by her forward airs and noisy thrusting of her pedigree in the face of every one who opposed her passage, drew attention upon the little party wherever they went, much to Manon's mortification. She looked thoughtfully upon the gaily dressed crowds about her, despised the fawning courtiers, and gazed with indignation upon the grand fetes, the brilliant equipages, and the luxuriant apartments of the palace, contrasting them with the squalid homes and the pale emaciated crowds that went forth in daily labor, and from whom was wrenched half their scanty pittance to support this splendor. Neither could her high spirit brook the notice of menials and the slights of court sycophants, whom she felt to be immeasurably beneath her. Instead of being amused with the daily show, she wandered away to the gardens to forget her disgust, 
in admiration of the flowers and the statues that graced them. Yet even there was tormented with thoughts of depotism and oppression, and sighed that she had not been born a Grecian maiden. Her mother, observing Manon's abstraction, asked how she enjoyed the visit. "'I shall be glad when it is ended,' was her characteristic reply, "'else in a few more days I shall so detest all the persons I see that I shall not know what to do with my hatred.' "'Why, what harm have these persons done you?' said Madame Philippon. "'They make me feel injustice and look upon absurdity,' replied the young sage. She was happy to be buried again in the retirement of her own home. Sophia Canet, her friend of the convent, having arrived at Paris with her brother, drew Manon more into society, and enabled her to meet people of rank, whose ignorance and supercilious airs she often had occasion to despise, and also gave her friends among authors and people of distinguished talent. She had attained an age and attractiveness that could not escape attention, and thenceforth Manon had numberless suitors who, according to the customs of France, were first obliged to apply to her parents, an embarrassing ceremony that was most frequently performed by letter-writing. In consequence, suitors were often dismissed by her father, whom she had never seen. She was satisfied to judge of them by the tone of the application, and concurred in the dismission of one tradesman after another, often writing the replies herself, which were carefully copied and sent by her father. When a wealthy jeweler appeared, Philippon was caught by the glitter of his occupation, and his promising prospects of accumulating a large fortune. He urged upon Manon the expediency of accepting this suitor, but she was dissatisfied with his attainments, and assured her parents she could only be happy with one whom she could look upon as her equal or superior. This refusal occasioned the beginning of the estrangement between herself and father, which was never reconciled. Upon the appearance of a young physician, her parents thought the aspiring Manon would not hesitate to accept one of a profession that involved some degree of learning. Her mother, whose declining health made her anxious to see her daughter happily provided with a home, concerted with the young doctor to win Manon's affections. A first interview was carefully arranged. Madame Philippon conducted her daughter, as if unpremeditated, to the house of a friend, where the enamoured suitor happened in by chance, of course. The profuse compliments of the inexperienced physician and the sly hints and meaning smiles of the ladies who accompanied him soon betrayed the whole plan to the penetrating Manon, and caused her to look with infinite contempt upon the silly artifices of her admirer. She consented, however, to her mother's urgent entreaties to receive his visits and decide more leisurely, but a farther acquaintance betrayed his superficial acquirements, and the girl, whose intellect was to be won instead of her heart, gave him as decided a refusal as those who had gone before. In vain her father raged and stormed, and even the tender sad pleadings of her invalid mother could not change her determination. "'Do not reject a husband,' said her mother, "'who, it is true, does not possess the refinement you desire, but who will love you and with whom you can be happy.' "'As happy as you have been?' exclaimed Manon in her excitement, referring to the utter disunion of spirit between her father and mother." Madame Philippon's face was pale with painful emotion, and she never urged the subject again. Not long after, Manon returned hastily from a visit, filled with presentiments of evil, and found her mother suddenly ill, and unable to speak. A priest was summoned to perform the last rites, and Manon, sobbing violently, stood by the deathbed holding a taper. Her mother smiled upon her, and smoothed her cheek affectionately, till, overcome with the intensity of her grief, she fell senseless to the floor. The light was extinguished, and when she again recovered, her mother was no more. The violence of her unchecked sorrow occasioned an illness from which her recovery was long doubtful. An excursion and soothing visit to her Aunt Angelica somewhat restored her cheerfulness, but her home was no longer what it had been. Her father was rapidly pursuing a career of dissipation, to which his infidel principles gave loose reins, his business neglected his little fortune rapidly vanishing, ensnaring in the toils of one not endeared by sacred ties, and whom he installed the quiet household. All contributed to repel his daughter's affection. She endeavored to forget her grief and her melancholy in her retired chamber, where nearly all her time was passed, absorbed in books and writing manuscripts which never met any eyes but her own. While thus solitary and desponding, a letter from her early friend Sophia announced a visitor of whom she had often heard. Roland de la Platière belonged to an opulent family of Amiens, and held the important office of inspector of manufactures. 
During his leisure he had written several treatises on political economy that had gained him some celebrity in the world. He was fond of study and was something of a philosopher. In his frequent visits to the house of Monsieur Canet, he had seen Manon's portrait, and often listened to Sophia's eulogies upon her accomplished friend, and had read her letters. His interest was excited in the enthusiastic and talented girl, and he entreated a letter of introduction that he might be enabled to see her during his occasional trips to Paris. He accordingly presented himself at the first opportunity. Manon was prepared to judge of him by the sketch justly drawn by Sophia. "'You will receive this letter,' wrote her friend, "'by the hand of the philosopher of whom I have so often written you. Monsieur Roland is an enlightened man, of antique manners, without reproach, except for his passion for the ancients, his contempt for the moderns, and his too high estimation of himself. Manon found herself in the presence of one who she describes as tall, slender, and well-formed, but negligent in his carriage, and with that stiffness which is often contracted by study. Yet his manners were simple and easy, and without possessing the fashionable graces, he combined the politeness of a well-bred man with the gravity of a philosopher. He was thin, with a complexion much tanned, his broad intellectual brow covered with but a few hairs added to the imposing attractiveness of regular features. When listening, his countenance expressed deep thoughtfulness, and often sadness, but once interested and animated in conversation, his face was lighted with lively and winning smiles. His voice was masculine, his language monotonous and harsh, but the sentiments he expressed so perfectly accorded with Manon's views that she felt herself attracted by a sympathy as new as it was delightful. Though his severe and practical mind admitted none of the beautiful dreams of the visionary world that added so much to Manon's happiness, there was yet that sameness of high ambition to be the benefactor of the human race, a conscious superiority over those whose rank gave them higher places, and a contempt for the frivolous pursuits of life, that perfectly harmonized their minds, though the heart of neither was touched. Manon regarded him as a superior being, an oracle to whom she was willing to submit her judgment, while he, flattered by the succumbing of her brilliant mind to his, regarded her with placid and paternal admiration. Upon M. Roland's departure from Paris, he left with his new friend voluminous manuscripts, containing a journal of recent travels in Germany, with sage reflections that rendered them doubly interesting to Manon. In their perusal, she became initiated in his thoughts and feelings to a far greater extent than conversation could ever have afforded her. Eighteen months elapsed before they met again. In the meantime, Roland travelled through Italy, Switzerland, Sicily, and Malta, writing copious notes and forwarding them at regular intervals to Manon who studied them with an avidity and interest that prepared her to hail his return with joy and veneration nearly allied to worship. Yet there was not a spark of love growing in her bosom. It was only her intellect that singled him out from the rest of the world. Several years passed in friendly correspondence, or interviews, during which they discussed political reforms, philosophy and science, and various literary projects, with a frankness, confidence, and pleasure that, before they were aware of it, each became necessary to the other's happiness. M. Roland, at length, declared his attachment. Manon frankly acknowledged that she esteemed him more highly than any one she ever met. Yet her circumstances were so humble. Her father's heirs would be a source of disgrace and mortification, and the well-known pride of the Roland family, who might feel dishonored by the alliance, were reasons for which her proud spirit shrank from a union otherwise unobjectionable. M. Roland would not yield to these representations and finally elicited her consent. From that moment the reliance, trust, and affection she had not known since her mother's death again nestled in her heart, and she was happy. M. Roland returned to Amiens, and then addressed a letter to her father to obtain his consent to their marriage. M. Philippon replied in an insulting tone, and bluntly refused him. Manon, surprised and grieved, immediately wrote to her revered friend, and besought him to think no more of the affair, and not to expose himself to farther affronts by new solicitations. At the same time, she assured her father she would marry no one else, secured a small remnant of her mother's fortune, and retired to the same convent where a year of her childhood had passed. In a narrow little room, close under the roof where the snow lay piled up, or the rain pattered dismally, without a companion, obliged to live with the strictest frugality, with no friendly voice to dispel the settled silence. Here Manon lived, enjoying a peaceful, quiet happiness in the midst of literary labors that no mere seeker of pleasure ever found in the delirious whirl of gaiety or in luxurious idleness. 
the comfortless surroundings of uncurtained windows bare floor dim light and scanty fire could not depress her spirit but rather lent new and stronger wings to an imagination that continually roamed to the ends of the earth or far back into bygone ages and brought therefrom abundant lessons to revolve disciplined by the particular circumstances of her life and accustomed to live within herself she was least alone when alone she daily prepared her own frugal food never went out except on the occasion of a weekly visit to her father's house to mend his linen and to have a care for his interests and received no visitors beside one of the sisters in the convent who was limited to an hour in the evening who would have dreamed in passing the quiet convent that by the light shining dimly from the high window under the eaves sat a solitary maiden unconsciously pruning her intellect for a bold patriotic appeal that was to shake the throne of france unknowingly preparing herself to sway the deliberations of statesmen and destined to tread in stately and conscious worth the halls of a palace she lost no time in useless repinings but applied herself vigorously and diligently to the cultivation of such talents as god had committed to her without questioning the future dark and gloomy enough to her lonely eyes it was unfortunate that she had no guide to lead her out of the mazes in which she had lost her way after rejecting the catholic creed as hollow and heartless with the outward forms but not the essence of spirituality yet she dared reveal her doubts to no one and still preserved outward conformity to her mother's belief here m roland again visited her at the expiration of five or six months he presented himself at the convent one day and beheld manon's pale face behind the grating which with the sweet sound of her voice revived the affection that had nearly died out when he ceased to think of her as his intended bride touched by her lonely condition and her faithfulness to him he urgently renewed his suit manon hesitated she no longer cherished the romantic love with which she regarded him at their last parting and her pride and vanity were wounded that he had endured a refusal he knew to be against her inclination with such unlover-like apathy farther consideration however suggested the compliment his deliberate decision paid her and the sacrifice of family considerations his renewed offer implied manon no longer deliberated she resolutely placed her hand in his and though more intellect than heart went with it m roland was satisfied and happy their marriage occurred in seventeen eighty manon still youthful at twenty-five was at length wedded to an austere self-confident overbearing man twenty years her senior the first year was spent in paris entirely occupied in the preparation of a work on the arts in which madame roland untiringly assisted her husband her only recreation was attending a course of lectures on natural history and botany she secluded herself from her friends not from her own choice but because her imperious husband demanded it he wished to absorb her attention and affection entirely in himself the succeeding four years were passed at amiens occupied as before in literary pursuits to which madame roland lent her own pen with a brilliancy of style that gave an additional reputation to roland's works the birth of a daughter divided her cares and pursuits but she had become so indispensable to her husband that for the sake of her grateful presence he was quite ready to submit to the mischievous play of little fingers among his books and papers the sunny face of eudora peeping out from her long flaxen ringlets now and then laughingly thrust between her father's face and his endless manuscripts did much towards softening his habitual sternness madame roland too centred in this sweet child the affections that were but rudely and selfishly cherished by her exacting husband it was in the course of this stay at amiens that m roland applied for letters patent of nobility wishing to resume the title of his ancestry now that his wealth was sufficient to support such rank his wife was not unwilling to bear the gracious title of lady roland in spite of her previous contempt of titled nobility and meditations upon the inequality of mankind it was a temptation neither of them would have rejected had their application been successful in seventeen eighty five monsieur roland removed to the city of lyon the family occupied a winter residence in town but passed the summers upon a fine paternal estate a few miles from lyon la platiere was a rural retreat lying in the valley of the Somme, at the foot of the mountains of beaujolais it was a wild romantic region intersected with deep gorges and watered by impetuous torrents that leapt and foamed down the mountain sides then rushing noisily through the fertile valley swelled the wide rolling Somme to overflowing fruitful vineyards grew purple in the warm sheltered valley and the smooth green meadows were dotted with flocks of white sheep guarded by shepherds in the midst of these meadows and vineyards stretched the la platiere farm 
with its sleek cattle, its dovecotes, fish ponds, gardens, and groups of willows with their long sweeping boughs and tall prim poplars shading the solid square stone house and its numberless outhouses. The mansion, spacious and airy, had nothing to recommend it in the way of ornamental architecture. A plain front, the roof projecting and nearly flat, regular windows, and a plain portico at the entrance, told more of unpretending comfort than taste or display. Madame Roland, accustomed only to a life among brick and mortar, regarded La Platière with enthusiastic admiration. She could scarcely find words to express her joy on finding herself possessed of such a secluded, charming retreat as she had often pictured in her dreams. But every cup has its drop of gall. Monsieur Roland's mother and brother still occupied the estate. One, proud, tyrannical, and possessing the enviable characteristics of a shrew, the other, gruff, coarse, and surly, kept discord perpetually awake. The mother's turbulent spirit was soon hushed in the unregretted sleep of death, an event that decided the Roland family to occupy their estate throughout the year. Five years of undisturbed happiness succeeded. Madame Roland's time was divided between the systematic regulation of domestic duties, the education of their only and idolized child, Eudora, and the reception of much company attracted by the scientific celebrity of Monsieur Roland. Beside all these time-consuming demands, she secured two hours during the day to pass in her husband's study, assisting him in his literary pursuits, with her ready and popular pen that gained him many an eulogium. Happy in lending her talents to secure his renown rather than her own, and capable of an entire devotion to his comfort and happiness, more from a sense of duty and veneration than the promptings of love, she passed those five years in an uninterrupted tranquillity that seemed a rest to her tired spirit a preparation, a gathering of strength for the tempestuous life that followed. End of section 39. Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa. Section 40 of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Rees. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Madame Roland, Part Three. In 1790, the low but fearful rumblings of the political storm that had long been gathering over France boomed through the cities, along the valleys, echoed through the mountain hamlets, and sounded in the ears of those hidden in distant and obscure retreats. Monsieur Roland and his wife aroused at the welcome tones of the first murmurings of liberty, hastened to Lyon, where the contest had arisen with powerful excitement. Madame Roland's saloons were thrown open, and the most prominent of the revolutionary party gathered there to discuss the principles to be adopted. Madame Roland engaged in their councils, guided their decisions by eloquent and burning words that fell from her lips with irresistible fascination. Her ardor stimulated their zeal. Her impassioned appeals fired them with new and daring efforts to shake off the oppressive yoke of kingly aristocracy. Thus conspicuously arrayed against the royalists, M. Roland's name was upon every lip, with praises on one side and bitter denunciations on the other, a hostility that nerved his wife with a stronger enthusiasm, and absorbed all the powers of her indefatigable mind in the one idea and aim of universal freedom. Louis the Sixteenth, irresolute and yielding, attempted to conciliate the stormy populace and to avert the accumulating vengeance of years from his devoted head. But the iniquities of his predecessors and the surrounding nobility were destined to be visited on this monarch, too weak, too undiscerning, to arrest the furious passions he blindly tampered with. To appease the multitude, he convened the National Assembly. This body consisted of the nobility, the higher clergy, and representatives from all parts of the nation. M. Roland, the favorite and leading man of the revolutionary party in the city of Lyon, was elected their representative by a large majority. On the 20th of February, 1791, he repaired to Paris with his wife, who a few years before sat a homeless, obscure maiden in a desolate garret, but now brilliant, wealthy, and influential was the worshipped heroine of the Republican Party. She daily attended the sittings of the assembly and listened with intense interest to the exciting debates. The refined and courtly bearing, the polished and cultivated language of the royalists, struck her favorably, in contrast with the coarse plebeian manners and illiterate speech of the Democrats. 
but though her tastes would have inclined her to the former, the latter involved her principles, and contrast only served to increase her ardent wish for the education and refinement of the lower classes. Before the close of the first sitting of the assembly, the nobility were vanquished, and the royal family were compelled to abandon their palaces at Versailles and remain in Paris. The contest assumed a new phase being sustained between the Girondists and Jacobins, one party intent upon the preservation of the throne, limited in its power by a free constitution, the other fiercely bent upon the overthrow of the altar, the throne, the distinctions of nobility, and every barrier that prevented the entire equality of all classes. M. Roland and his wife zealously supported the former. The leading and most intelligent of the Girondists assembled four evenings in the week, at the home of M. Roland, attracted by his integrity and calm, deliberate wisdom, as well as by the more fascinating conversational powers of his brilliant wife, to whose opinions they paid the most sincere and flattering deference. Among those who frequented her saloons was a young lawyer of repulsive appearance, stupid and awkward, possessed of an obstinate temper, utterly devoid of sensitiveness, caring as little for applause as the hisses of contempt with which his long, dry speeches were invariably received in the assembly. Madame Roland alone discovered genius in the sullen, moody young man. She saw the energy, the rock-like fixedness of purpose, the hatred of luxury and aristocracy that would make him a favorite with the multitude, and feeling him to be a dangerous enemy, yet not a friend to be trusted, she welcomed him to her circle more from policy than choice. He listened entranced to the eloquent voice and clear reasoning of the intrepid Madame Roland, and bowed in awe to her high-souled principles, yet was ready to aim a deadly blow at them, and at her who gave them utterance, when ambition or interest suggested. This was Robespierre. Abbott says of his admiration of that accomplished woman, he studied Madame Roland with even more of stoical apathy than another man would study a book which he admires. The next day he would give utterance in the assembly, not only to the sentiments, but even to the very words and phrases which he had carefully garnered from the exuberant diction of his eloquent instructress. Occasionally every eye would be riveted upon him, and every ear attentive, as he gave utterance to some lofty sentiment in impassioned language which had been heard before in sweeter tones from more persuasive lips. On one occasion, in the early part of his career, having laid himself under the displeasure of the multitude, and exposed to accusation from the assembly, Madame Roland found him a place of security, and pled for him with an influential member of the assembly, till his defense was promised. Robespierre escaped, to become the assassin of his benefactors. In September 1791, the assembly was dissolved, and Monsieur Roland and his wife retired from Paris. The two or three months of seclusion that succeeded, rather inspired them for new efforts than made them forget the perils of France. A new assembly convened in November, and though the previous members could not be re-elected, Monsieur and Madame Roland determined to return to Paris and share the danger and excitement daily increasing in the metropolis. The most influential and learned men from all parts of the nation gathered there to watch the shaping of events that every moment assumed a more threatening aspect. Clubs were formed to discuss the momentous questions of the times, and every evening various private saloons were the scenes of exciting and intensely interesting debate. The position and influence of the Rolands is thus described. M. Roland was grave, taciturn, oracular. He had no brilliance of talent to excite envy. He displayed no ostentation in dress or equipage or manners to provoke the desire in others to humble him. His reputation for stoical virtue gave a wide sweep to his influence. His very silence invested him with a mysterious wisdom. Consequently, no one feared him as a rival, and he was frequently thrust forward as the unobjectionable head of a party by all who hoped, through him, to promote their own interests. He was what we call in America an available candidate. Madame Roland, on the contrary, was animated and brilliant. Her genius was universally admired. Her bold suggestions, her shrewd counsel, her lively repartee, her capability of cutting sarcasm, rarely exercised, her deep and impassioned benevolence, her unvarying cheerfulness, the sincerity and enthusiasm of her philanthropy, and the unrivaled brilliance of her conversational powers, made her the center of a system around which the brightest intellects were revolving. Verginon, Petion, Brissot, and others whose names were then comparatively unknown, but whose fame has since resounded through the civilized world, loved to do her homage. 
with such elements of popularity it is not surprising that they were elevated to a position in which the prisoner king was obliged to place them to appease the stormy populace murders were nightly committed the terrified nobles were hastily escaping with their families confusion and death reigned everywhere there was no expedient left the monarch but to accede to the demands of the people dismiss his ministry and replace it by republican candidates m roland was immediately selected by the girondists as minister of the interior a post scarcely inferior to the crown itself and especially elevated at this moment when only the shadow of authority remained with the king m roland and his wife immediately occupied the palace which had been the recipient of neckar but a short time before and furnished by him with regal splendor at last the scornful manon was the mistress of one of those magnificent palaces was elevated to an equality with kings and princes and rolled through the thoroughfares of paris in one of the very gilded coaches that had excited her childish contempt madame roland however was in a position that rightly belonged to her and which she filled with unaffected grace and dignity she found full scope for her abundant talents so assiduously cultivated in her youth an opportunity for the magnanimous exercise of her forgiving and generous temper on one occasion after leaving her elegant dining hall where she had entertained the greatest men in france she found in the saloon an old man who with profound respect begged an interview with the minister of the interior she discovered in him a haughty aristocrat who many years before had humiliated her proud spirit by leaving her on the occasion of a visit to dine with the menials she exulted in her own thoughts at the reversed position in which they now stood but generously restrained any manifestation of her triumph from all the splendid apartments of the palace madame roland selected a small retired room furnished as a library and where she spent nearly all her time here gathered the influential members of the assembly discussing the momentous affairs of state occasionally turning to consult her while she sat at a little distance at a small work table occupied with her needle or pen here she wrote the proclamations the state papers and the letters which were presented to the king and assembly in m roland's name securing to him the enthusiastic admiration alone due to herself the jacobin party were every day increasing in strength and ready to pour from the cellars and haunts of vice with which paris was thronged numberless advocates of their ferocious measures the king had already been insulted in his palace by the mob the royalists had fled to coblentz and were preparing to march with the prussian army to reinstate the french monarch a movement which filled both the girondists and jacobins with alarm louis irresolute and vacillating took no decided measures he endeavored to conciliate all parties and thus gain the confidence and support of none at this crisis madame roland in behalf of the girondists and in the name of the minister addressed a bold and eloquent letter to the king demanded him to proclaim war against the emigrants and take instant measures to prevent their mediated attack in union with the prussians upon paris by thus cooperating with the girondists his crown might be saved though his power would be limited while if he opposed them his downfall and horrible anarchy must ensue the letter written with glowing and impassioned eloquence was given by m roland to the king on the eleventh of june seventeen ninety two its proposed decree was too unpalatable to the monarch the truth which it contained too plain for the royal ear he commented upon it by peremptorily dismissing m roland from office here am i dismissed from office exclaimed the deposed minister to his wife on entering her library present your letter to the assembly that the nation may see for what counsel you have been dismissed replied the intrepid madame roland the letter was presented it received unbounded applause from the assembly and was ordered to be printed and scattered throughout every department in france it was a firebrand thrown among combustibles the rapturous applause of millions followed the hero to the obscure retreat which madame roland selected in a retired street of the metropolis but here they were sought out and their apartments thronged with the admiring adherence of both parties the girondists now no longer willing to support the king openly proposed the establishment of a republic danger hourly increased the populace incensed at the removal of m roland attacked the tuileries insulted the monarch and the royal family and in every possible way vented their rage and hatred louis was obliged to consent to the reinstatement of the republican minister and again m roland and his wife occupied the magnificent palace from which they had suddenly been expelled 
the arrest and imprisonment of louis the sixteenth soon after caused m roland to send in his resignation to the assembly since the office he held was virtually annulled he could now have escaped with his wife from the frightful scenes daily enacting in the streets of paris but her courageous spirit would not recoil from danger or death so long as a hope remained of rescuing france from threatened anarchy the rapid approach of the prussian army terrified all parties the jacobins having obtained the ascendancy of power in paris and determined to save themselves from the vengeance of the advancing army ordered every man in paris capable of bearing arms to prepare to advance to the frontiers and repulse the emigrant royalists and their allies in order to ensure this decree and to rid themselves of all who were secretly ready to fall upon them when encouraged by the near approach of the army the gates of paris were closed and at night every house in the metropolis was entered by parties of jacobins its apartments and most secret recesses searched victims dragged forth from every possible place of concealment and horribly murdered every one who gave the slightest suspicion of favoring the royalists were instantly put to death the innocent and guilty perished together homes were deluged with the blood of helpless and innocent victims fathers perished with their helpless children beautiful women were dragged to the guillotine the prisons were crowded with trembling victims who were one after another beheaded in the courtyards till the pavements ran with blood fiends thirsting for the heart's blood of both friend and foe prowled through the streets sheathing their daggers in human flesh at every step this frightful massacre continued till every royalist had fallen and now the frenzied jacobins fixed their bloody fangs upon the girondists a fierce struggle for supremacy in the convention ensued it was more than a political reaching after power more than patriotic fervor that inspired the eloquent addresses at the tribune it was a struggle for life one party or the other must lay their heads beneath the axe the jacobins attempted to strike a deadly blow at the girondists by bringing an accusation against their inspiring genius madame roland a spy was employed to ingratiate himself in her confidence and by perverting her expressions obtain her accusation and bring her to the scaffold she quickly penetrated his designs and scornfully repulsed his friendship he however charged her with carrying on a secret correspondence with exiled royalists and she was summoned before the tribunal a vast assemblage awaited the entrance of the woman whose fame had sounded throughout europe and whose influence had so strongly wielded the assembly every one was anxious and curious to behold the wonderful being who retaining a feminine seclusion yet breathed through manly lips a thrilling patriotism worthy of a roman orator at the instant she appeared a respectful silence pervaded the assemblage old man and young friend and enemy even robespierre and marat watched with undisguised admiration the majestic bearing yet womanly loveliness and modesty with which this noble woman advanced and stood before the bar her replies to the president were full of dignity and frankness uttered in sweet clear tones that fell with a magical effect upon the listeners every answer exposed more clearly the villainy and falsehood of her accuser and when she tremulously began her own defense gathering courage as she spoke till the eloquence and fervor of her exalted spirit was showered in words of fire upon the assembly there was not an eye but was riveted upon her not an ear but strove to catch every syllable that fell from her lips they sat silent and entranced and when her voice ceased shouts of approval rose on every side she was acquitted both by friend and foe and even the heartless bloodhound whose life she had saved and who was soon to drag her to the scaffold could not withhold a smile of approval and admiration as she glided triumphantly from among them four or five months of turmoil of hatred of frightful anarchy heightened the unbridled and murderous passions of the populace the jacobins governed the assembly the mob govern the jacobins the deliberations of the convention were guided by the thousands of assassins who with upheld daggers crowded the lobbies and surrounded the building in hoarse tumult the death of louis the sixteenth was demanded and in the midst of an exciting scene every girondist was obliged to ascend the tribune and pronounce death upon the king or feel the cold steel sliding quickly into his own heart this submission did not cool the unquenchable hatred of the mob conspiracies were repeatedly formed to assassinate the girondists at one moment almost beneath the gleaming weapons in the convention at another roused only in time to bar their doors against creeping demons waiting the stroke of a certain hour to plunge the deadly knife in their bosoms 
Madame Roland, exposed to the execrations of the populace because of her well-known position among the Girondists, was entreated to seek safety. Some devoted friends brought her the dress of a peasant girl, urging her to assume the disguise and fly with her daughter that her husband might follow her unencumbered. But she spurned to save herself thus. Throwing the dress from her, she exclaimed, I am ashamed to resort to any such expedient. I will neither disguise myself nor make any attempt at secret escape. My enemies may find me always in my place. If I am assassinated, it shall be in my own home. I owe my country an example of firmness, and I will give it. At M. Roland's resignation, they had again retired to an obscure dwelling in the Rue de la Harpe. Here, in a solitary room, they still received the agitated supporters of the Republic, in vain attempting to devise measures to stem the overwhelming tide deluging France, and gradually circling into a dizzy whirlpool that was finally to engulf both the assassin and the victim. Each day the circles grew narrower and swifter, and the Girondists, unable to escape from a vortex bearing them on to certain death, could only fortify themselves to meet it heroically. End of section 40 Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Section 41 of The Heroines of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Rees. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Madame Roland, Part 4. On the morning of the 31st of May, 1793, a driving, rolling mist darkened the streets of Paris. Crowds of demoniac men, howling women, and reckless, bloodthirsty boys blocked up the thoroughfares adding their shouts and imprecations to the dismal tolling of bells, booming cannons, and the melancholy sound of the tocsin. The rush and the roar rolled ominously through the convulsed city. Ila suprema dies! It is our last day! exclaimed one of the illustrious Girondists. And he said it with truth. Madame Roland and her husband remained in their solitary room, listening in sickening suspense to the sounds borne even to their distant retreat, not daring to venture into the streets where their appearance would be the sure signal of death. Friends brought them tidings of events during that dreadful day. The clouds that had hung gloomily over the city since morning gathered in an early twilight. Monsieur Roland sat gloomy, unnerved, and despairing, while his courageous wife, whom danger never intimidated, spoke cheerfully and hopefully even in these hours of terror. But her words were suddenly checked by the sound of brutal voices and stumbling, heavy footsteps ascending the dark stairway. In another moment, six armed men noisily burst into the apartment, and, advancing toward M. Roland, showed him a warrant for his arrest in the name of the convention. "'I do not recognize the authority of your warrant, and shall not voluntarily follow you,' said he to the officer." The leader replied that he had no orders to exercise violence, and should return his answer to the council, leaving a guard to secure his person. Far from being overcome with womanly fears, at this near approach of their enemies, Madame Roland was strengthened with fresh heroism. She immediately sat down and rapidly penned a glowing letter to the convention, ordered a coach, left a friend with her husband, and drove speedily to the Tuileries, where the assembly was engaged in riotous debate. A dense and murmuring crowd filled the gardens and the courts, rendering access almost impossible. Undaunted, she forced her way through, approached the sentinels who guarded the doors, and asked admission. It was refused. An instant's thought suggested a deception. Assuming the tone of the Jacobins, she assured them that she had important notes for the President that would admit of no delay in times when traitors threatened the restoration of a monarchy. The sentinel immediately permitted her to pass. Another sentinel was stationed at the door of an inner passage. "'I wish to see one of the messengers of the house,' said she. "'Wait till one comes out,' was the surly reply. Fifteen minutes passed that seemed hours to the impatient, anxious wife. At length she descried a messenger to whom she gave the letter, and it was immediately delivered to the President. A long hour passed, yet Madame Roland still stood at the entrance 
watching with painful interest every face that came from among the excited assembly, hoping for tidings of her husband's release in reply to her appeal. But no message came, and at length, unable longer to endure suspense, she sent for one of the principal Girondists, and besought him to gain her admission to the bar, that she might speak in defense of her husband and her friends. The convention has lost all power. Your words can do no good. Violence, noise, and confusion fill the house, replied Vergenot. Madame Roland abandoned the hope, and leaving her letter to speak the words she would eloquently have uttered, promised herself to return in two hours, and hastily sought her home again, to assure herself of her husband's safety. Upon entering her apartments, M. Roland and the guards were nowhere to be seen. Alarmed, she inquired and searched, till she found M. Roland had escaped the vigilance of his keepers, and was concealed in the house of a friend. Finding him at last, and inspiring him with new courage as her own revived, she again parted from him and returned to the Tuileries, though the midnight bell had tolled. The streets were brilliantly illuminated, but silent and deserted. The palace and the assembly rooms were vacant. A quiet and gloomy mystery rested upon the place that a few hours before had been crowded with a mass of human beings swaying to and fro with the passions of demons grasping for new victims. Foreboding some new and horrible calamity, she turned from the palace, blazing with lights, and traversed the streets till the shouts and uproar of the maddened voices of a countless multitude reached her ear. A nearer approach revealed the twenty-two Girondists of the assembly, guarded and driven before the mob, with threatened violence towards the dungeons of the conciergerie. Enough. Madame Roland knew at a glance her own fate and the doom of all she loved. A moment's delay at the Louvre to consult with a friend some means for her husband's escape, and she sped back to her own home, penned a hasty letter to Monsieur Roland, then sat quietly to scan the day's events and see the extent of her own danger. Bold, heroic, and energetic, she had preserved her cheerfulness and hope to this moment, but the remembrance of her fugitive husband, and a glance at her sleeping child resting innocently and securely upon her mother's pillow, brought with a sharp pang the thought of leaving the idolized Eudora an orphan. Her courage was gone. She threw herself beside the sweet sleeper, threw back the bright ringlets that clustered round the child's rosy face, kissed it with clinging love, and wept such tears as she had never shed before. Exhausted with grief and fatigue, she fell into a deep slumber, with her child closely clasped in her arms. It was a mother's last dear embrace. Just as the dawn of a cheerless, cloudy morning stole through the curtain windows, the rush and tramp of many feet, the clattering of steel weapons and clubs, and the hoarse howlings of a debauched multitude, aroused Madame Roland in time to meet at the door the rough leaders who immediately announced her arrest. No tears, not a word of supplication escaped her lips. She calmly pressed a farewell kiss upon the lips of her child, committed her to a friend, spoke cheerfully to the weeping servants, and followed the officers with a heroic and defiant dignity that elicited their respect and protection. To secure her from the insults of the mob, one of the officers kindly proposed to close the windows of the carriage. No, she replied. Oppressed innocence should not assume the attitude of crime and shame. I do not fear the looks of honest men, and I brave those of my enemies. She calmly and pityingly gazed upon the passionate and distorted countenances of the crowd that pressed about the carriage with threatening words and gestures. They fell back, awed at her fearless bearing, and let her pass unmolested. The iron doors, bolts, and bars of the Abbaye prison closed upon Madame Roland. A bare, comfortless room, dimly lighted by a high, narrow, grated window through which the damp, chilly air crept, was given her in lieu of her own home. Nothing broke the cheerless aspect of this gloomy cell. A straw pallet lay in one corner close to the cold, moldy walls, but without uttering a word of complaint, the undaunted prisoner laid herself down upon the humble couch and fell into a deep, dreamless slumber. But a few days passed before the jailer and his kind-hearted wife were fascinated with the cheerful cordiality, the winning, gentle manners, and heroic endurance of the new prisoner. They willingly aided her in giving the cell an air of taste and comfort. At first a little table appeared, and another day the jailer's wife came in smiling and full of mystery with something concealed under her wide apron. Suddenly the table was decorated and brightened with a neat white spread, 
and the good little woman hastened away, pleased and proud, with Madame Roland's rewarding expressions of surprise and pleasure. Then came books. Writing materials quickly followed, and lastly, fresh, beautiful flowers bloomed in the grated window of her cell. Four months passed away, and the beginning of the fifth found Madame Roland cheerful and contented, strong and resolute, as when she graced the elegant saloons of a palace home. Satisfied and happy that her husband had escaped, at rest in regard to her child, safely asylumed with a friend, and hoping for the near approach of the nation's tranquillity and her consequent release, she lost not a moment in repinings or useless tears. Occupied with her books, or sketching the scenery of La Platière, and other places distinct and dear in remembrance, or writing her memoirs, she scarcely lived at all in the damp, dark cell. Her busy imagination was continually on the wing, and when recalled to her loneliness and imprisonment, by the entrance of the keeper with her coarse fare, she felt no gloom, shed no tears, but kindly greeted him and partook of the untempting food, spread upon a rusty stove to preserve the little table unsoiled, with as much liveliness and grace as if she presided at the splendid dining-table of the minister of the interior. She might have possessed herself of some luxuries, but choosing rather to relieve her fellow sufferers, she distributed her money among them to obtain necessary comforts. One day two commissioners entered her cell to extort from her, if possible, the secret of her husband's retreat, since all Paris and its environs had been diligently searched for the fugitive minister. She scorned to dissimulate, and told them plainly she knew the place of his concealment, but nothing on earth could induce her to betray him. She spurned them from her. From first to last Madame Roland's defiant heroism cost her liberty and life. Her contemptuous treatment of these Jacobin inquisitors determined her fate. She was too illustrious, too eloquent, too fearless a woman to be suffered to live. But it was necessary to convict her on a new charge in order to bring her to the scaffold. The following day an officer entered and announced to Madame Roland that her liberty was restored. Scarcely believing her senses, she emerged from her prison, joyfully breathed the free air again, and accustomed her eyes to the blinding light of day, scarcely less bewildering than the exultation of being free, of clasping her child to her heart and claiming her own home. Ordering a carriage to drive quickly to the Rue de la Harpe, it was not long before she alighted at her own door, her face beaming with the expected happiness of hearing again the voice of Eudora. She eagerly bounded up the steps and opened the door. Her foot was upon the threshold, when two men darted from places of concealment, seized and rudely thrust her back into the carriage, with the assurance that the assembly had issued a new warrant for her arrest. They bore her to the prison of St. Pelagie, and conducted her to a loathsome dungeon already crowded with the most abandoned women and desperate villains, whose repulsive aspect made her shudder and shrink from the vile contact. Her courage no longer supported her. The disappointment had been too cruel. She sat down amidst the miserable wretches of the dungeon, and wept and sobbed with uncontrollable sorrow. But here, as in the other prison, she gained the sympathy of her keepers, who soon ventured to remove her to a narrow cell by herself. As before, her room gradually assumed an unexpected degree of comfort. Books, music, drawing, and writing were made available by the kindness of Madame Beauchot, the wife of the jailer. Flowers and vines twisted among and hid the ugly iron bars across the high window, and a small table and comfortable bed completed all her wants. Once more she gathered calmness and happiness from her employments. She could utter with triumph what Marie Antoinette exclaimed in despair. What a resource amid the calamities of life is a highly cultivated mind. On the same day when the Girondists were executed, October 31st, 1793, Madame Roland was led to the dungeons of the Conciergerie. This frightful prison lay beneath the Palace of Justice. A wide flight of stone steps led down to the subterraneous passages that wound and twisted and intersected each other like caged serpents, and terminated in cells, cold, dark, and silent as the grave. The atmosphere was humid and noxious. Moisture oozed from the walls, and the damp, slippery floors made the bewildered captive recoil from a footing that suggested a path among sliding lizards and creeping scorpions. Through these dark labyrinths the heroic Girondists and the hapless queen had passed forth to a repulsive bloody death. Ladies distinguished for beauty and talent, young girls fair and innocent, noble men and their aged fathers, bowed and trembling under the snowy crown of years, 
had gone forth daily to appease the mad multitude thirsting for human blood. Still agonizing groans resounded through the gloomy corridors, or sometimes echoed to a wailing death song from the breaking heart of some despairing prisoner. Rarely the voice of prayer went up from these cells, except rested from some frantic victim. Those were days of infidelity. God had withdrawn his presence from the atheistical nation. From one of those cells came a sweet voice that uttered eloquent and inspiring words in clear, ringing tones, thrilling every listener and kindling a new heroism from the ashes of despair. Those lips did not beguile fellow captives to exhausting, enervating tears, but aroused all the patriotic fire, the exalted courage, and the stoicism of which they were capable. They caught the unshrinking lofty tone of the bold-spirited orator, and when she paced the narrow courts, gathered round her with a love and devotion they might have paid to an angel. Fascinating and graceful, even in prison robes, stately and commanding, yet womanly and gentle, the sturdiest bowed before her, and the weakest leaned upon the strength her impassioned soul could impart. But one day she smilingly glided past them, attired in flowing white drapery, and her dark hair falling in wavy abundance to her girdled waist. She hastened cheerfully along the winding passages, passed through the massive entrances, and soon stood in the hall of the Palace of Justice, before an excited and tumultuous throng. In vain her voice richly and eloquently rose above the confused murmurings boldly speaking her own defense. Not in crouching supplication, not in fear of death, not in appeals to the humanity and sympathy of the assembly, but in daring defiance of their imputing a single crime to her or to those illustrious men who had gone before her to the scaffold. She sealed her own doom while proudly asserting her innocence. She was condemned to die. Fully prepared for this sentence, she received it with unchanging countenance, and returned to her cell as cheerfully as she had emerged from it, intimating her fate to the prisoners as she passed them by silently drawing a finger across her white throat. That night an old harp that had long lain untouched in the solitary cell resounded with slow, mournful tones, accompanied by a full, melodious voice, sadly sweeping a wild requiem through the long galleries that had been silent to every sound but human groans or shouts of exultation or despair. The shuddering captives recognized the farewell. The following morning, the gloomy opening of a November day, a long line of carts, crowded with victims for the guillotine, issued from the yard of the conciergerie. In the last was the white-robed heroine of the dungeons, still calm and self-possessed, still bearing up the drooping spirits of those who stood beside her. An old man with whitened locks, weak and trembling, leaned upon her sustaining arm. Her own face was brilliant and blooming, freshened and tinged with the cool morning air. The near approach of a sudden and horrible death was no intimidation to her heroic spirit. Nearer and nearer the rough vehicle approached the scaffold, as those in advance were emptied. Higher and more ghastly grew the heaps of the slain. Faster and fuller rolled the crimson tide. At last came the cart with the old man and the beautiful, fearless woman. She was still brave and undaunted, he shrinking and pale with terror. "'Go first, said she, "'that you may not witness my death.' but the brutal executioner commanded her to ascend first. "'You will not refuse a woman's last request,' she replied mildly, and with one of her winning smiles. The murder-inured man was one like everyone else upon whom that fascinating smile fell. The old man with the whitened locks bowed his head first beneath the axe. Then came the noble woman with firm, unfaltering step. She knelt. An instant of awful stillness was succeeded by the terrible sound of the sliding axe, and the beautiful head, enveloped in its dark veil of flowing ringlets, fell from the block. The noble, heroic, exalted spirit of Madame Roland had gone to the eternity she had so often and so darkly questioned. Her soul was, in an instant, ushered to the presence of an unacknowledged God, before whose tribunal human philosophy and stoicism and lofty endurance must vanish into nothingness. End of section 41. Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa. End of the Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins.